at a particular point in time. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Jale. Thank you very much, Chair. Good morning. I think I, uh, Honorable Danchi covered me, but I don't see also... Can you speak uh, to the mic? Sorry, Chair. I don't see the report here on this, the report of uh, those uh, people that I've mentioned, the security manager, the story of the security or the affidavit of that security, and, and also the manager, operational manager. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Ngola. Oh, that's Chair. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Chair. That's fine. I, I get the explanation. But what uh, is uh, quite problematic is that uh, I don't understand why is everything being prepared. I mean, getting retrieving a name of an inmate, inmate that was moved from cell 35, what, what are you preparing there? Getting a list of subcontractors, what are you preparing? It's a simple a matter of retrieving the information you already have. Why do you need 40, 48 hours for? To do what? You want to doctor these documents? What do you want it for? I mean, Chair, I don't understand why do we need this long period to retrieve any information they have. They confirmed under oath here that they have this information in their records. So they need 48 hours to do what? I'm told, uh, yeah, it's a return chair. Name of an inmate move out of the, uh, uh, from cell 35. Uh, requested information being prepared. You are preparing a name. No, chair, we can't, we can't operate like that. This is a delay tactic that must not be allowed by the committee. Honorable Chair, may I respond, please? Yes. This is, this is not a delay tactic, Chair. We left, we left this committee meeting last night at 6 o'clock. The majority of the information requested, in fact, almost all the information requested, is in the administrative department of the Mangong Correctional Center. Those staff members work office hours. We did last night try and reach those staff members to start compiling the documents. We are now one hour into the next working day. So it, it's not a matter of delaying. It's a matter of not being able to reach administrative staff after leaving this committee at 6 o'clock this morning and resuming again this morning at, at, at 9 o'clock. I did this morning speak to the team and I've asked them to accelerate as best they can in retrieving these documents and forwarding them to us and trickle them through as and when they become available. Um, I'm not sure why 48 hours was put here because the intention is to trickle them through as and when we find them uh, as the administrative staff return to, to the centre. And I suggest the following members before we uh, I note hands that we will start with Jigs during that period or during that time just make sure that you populate uh, this uh, document as, as requested um, after Jigs it will be SAPS then we will call you I think by that time you would have been able to do some work thank you Chair uh, yes, yes, Chair. Just mm -hmm. that 48 hours is not uh, acceptable. We want those documents now. So I want to agree with that approach. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Honorable Peyton, while your hand was up. Thank you, Honorable Chair. I'm happy with your arrangement. It's fine. Okay, you're covered. Okay. Um, as we, I think you may be excused for now. Um, and make sure that you, one of you, makes the necessary contact with your office, and this information is populated as required as requested. Noted. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Honourable Thank you, Honourable Chair. If you can just remember that I asked last week already for all the um, a list of all the employees at the Mango and Correctional Centre all the employees, and all the programs that they offer, all of them. Um, that also I haven't received, and I asked for that a week ago, so. Yes, so there will be no reason why you would not have concluded, in fact, supply that information. Um, 
you had requested that uh, you be subpoenaed after Easter and this after Easter. So that information was supposed to have been uh, supplied to us by now. Um, so let one of your operations person uh, be in contact uh, with the with the relevant office and make sure that we receive that information. Thank you, Chair. Uh, th thank you. You are excused for now. Chair, can I just be clear? You're excusing one of our members to deal with this matter. Yes. Thank you. But you are also excused from <coughs> this, from the witness seat. Yeah, Chair. I do, Chair, sorry. I don't know why they went back to sit there. Unless it's an indication we must continue with them. Because they sat here. We had finished with them. If you are inviting us back, I'm happy to conclude, to continue with them. No, wow, I, I think they like the seat. No, I no. guess it's very nice. You can uh, sit here, sir. I guess it's very nice that even the minister's uh, <laughs> staff was aspiring to be witnesses. So I think it's very nice there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, can we now invite Jigs as they are preparing to take the the nice seat? Um, or are you going to speak from there? Okay. No, that's fine. Uh, over to you. Welcome, Judge Cameron. You may proceed. The hand. I apologize, Chair. I, I forgot to mention uh, Honorable Horn is coming. He's just again struggling with a flat battery, so he'll be here. So, so are, are you making an application in advance of expropriating his time? I'm um, stating an intention. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Chair, Honorable Chair. Good morning, Honorable Members. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I'd like to start by saying that none of us uh, in any positions of power or influence in South Africa have uh, the remotest reason to self-congratulate or feel satisfied. But I do want to say that yesterday it was quite a privilege to see this committee in action and to see uh, how its preparation and its cross-examination skills and its doggedness managed to open up the way. We haven't got to the bottom of this yet, Mr. Chair, but yesterday was a, a revelatory an informative day. Thank you very much. If I may say a second thing uh, in, in uh, opening, Mr. Chair, which is irrelevant to the JICS presentation, it's that uh, there are heroes in this story, and two of them are in the SAPS. The first is a constable, Le Hoa. Uh, it's a name that matters to me because when I was in Bloemfontein, my nickname amongst my black colleagues was Le Hoa. So, Constable Lahore was in the Naval Hill uh, police station when he noticed that Dr. Nandipa Magurmana had persistently been coming to claim corpses and he put a stop. That triggered her urgent application. She didn't bring it in Bloemfontein where the death occurred. She didn't bring it in Bloemfontein where the refusal occurred, where the locus was. She brought it to the North Gauteng High Court. Uh, with a skallum streak, and a brigadier uh, in charge of legal services in Bloemfontein got an SMS on an afternoon in Bloemfontein, and she said, what's this about? And she intervened. She urgently contacted the, uh, the, the state attorney in Pretoria, got a notice of opposition put in, and that answering affidavit, which was lodged in August, opened up uh, matters for, for Jicks as well. That brigadier is present today. She's uh, Brigadier Ramorena Tswai. And I'd like to congratulate both those members of the SAPS. In the stand so that we can see them. Where's the constable? Where's the constable? Why didn't they bring him? The constable. They brought the Next brigadier, time. but not yeah. the constable. How yeah. winner. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
So, Mr. Chair, uh, the committee has already established that uh, sub substantial and the informative uh, uh, aspects of this affair, uh, despite the lamentably vague, evasive, and uh, uh, responsibility shy answers that it got. I also want to say that some of the answers, as this committee has also established, weren't fully accurate. Uh, our lead investigator is Mr. Oroleng Takadu, who's sitting behind me. Uh, he was assisted by our on-the-ground Bloemfontein investigator, Ms. Deneo Mokumi, uh, and they established that it wasn't just twice that uh, Mr. Bester sought to be moved from his cell to Broadway. It was three times. On the 15th of August 2019, the 15th of April 22, and the 30th of April 2022. So these details are important, and uh, this committee, in proceeding with its work, will establish more and more uh, the accuracy of what happened. JIX itself, Mr. Chair, has a, a limited role to play in cases such as this. Uh, its statutory duty is to inspect, to report, to report on conditions and treatment, to report on corrupt or dishonest practices, to address complaints, and then to investigate death, segregation, the use of force, and the use of mechanical restraints. We have no power to investigate escapes or to require them to be reported to us. We have limited resources. Our recommendations are not binding. All of this, Mr. Chair, and here I'm, I'm, I'm fighting a chance to, to make a, 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 an advanced plea to the committee. We've got a JIX bill that's been worked on in association with DCS for the last three or four years, before I came to JIX, led by our CEO on my right here, Mr. Mr. Misser, and we hope to be bringing that bill to this committee, which will give Vic, JIX the autonomy and the powers that it needs. Mr. Chair, for now we have no operational managerial or policy-making authority, and of course that is why we collaborate with and receive the cooperation of DCS, SAPS and other players. We have provided the committee with details not only of our own investigation and the extensive timeline. We've got our summary timeline up and we're very happy for uh, our CEO, for Mr. Takadu, to take the committee through the timeline if it seeks that. From our side, we repeatedly stress the urgency and seriousness of this matter. We shared information, offered assistance. We insisted that the matter be treated with as an escape, and we prompted other parties on the status of their investigations, and we stressed, as this committee yesterday did, the public interest, the urgent public interest in this matter. But, Mr. Chair, may I, I'm, I'm drawing to the close of my presentation, uh, I would like to make uh, 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 an observation about hindsight. Uh, we now know much more about what, what happened 50, 49, 50 uh, weeks ago. But uh, it, it's, it wasn't clear, even as the facts started to come before us, even when we got that post-mortem report, it seemed beyond credulity that uh, there was a, 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 a faked scene and an escape. And uh, I'm told that there was uh, one email to an executive official in June from a person operating under a pseudonym. It's a two-line email mentioning that there was uh, an escape and a fake scene. At that point, the executive officer of the state had no reason, I believe, to, to, to take that uh, seriously. Even the heroic editor and the two journalists of Ground Up, Mr. Nathan Geffen, and Mr. Daniel Stan, Ms. Marisha Damon. Uh, I hope that one of your members, Mr. Chair, will ask these two journalists also to stand. I don't want to be presumptuous myself, but I don't know if you will, Mr. Chair. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm making a point that even the investigative journalists, after the publication of 15th March, had grave doubts. They said, is this all a setup? Have we been grossly misled? Is this a fantasy tale? And I remind the committee, Mr. Chair, that, for example, we still haven't got to the bottom of how the Bushiris, the notorious Bushiris, escaped from our country. Was it on the Malawi presidential jet 
A lot of indications point there, but many people regard it as beyond credence. So we have to be careful uh, about uh, uh, hindsight and speculation. What we have to stick to is investigations, evidence, witness tennis, uh, testimony, and media exposés. And that's where the committee's work yesterday was so uh, conspicuously constructive. So that, uh, that brings me to the end, uh, subject to your requ uh, requesting us to, to go through the timeline. I do want to quote Mr. Jainchi yesterday to say that uh, what happened on that, uh, the, the, the night and morning of the 2nd, 3rd of May last year wasn't a rare phenomenon. It wasn't a, a rare incident. It was the culmination of a, peer, of a process of degradation and rottenness, the word Mr. Jainti himself used. There is dysfunction at Mangaung. It's a beautiful facility uh, uh, created with a huge amount of money, which will now revert as, as, as a... As a uh, 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 a constructed institution to the state, but we get witness blower reports. There's a witness blower whose relocation we secured uh, recently uh, with the help of the National Commissioner and the Deputy Minister uh, to, to Grunpunt from Mangaung, a, uh, uh, a whistleblower who told us that uh, the warders are carrying on a trade not just in, 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 Mango, in, in Dacha, which occurs in almost every facility, but in hard drugs like tuk uh, inside the prison. I would not have believed that easily uh, before this happened, but now almost anything is possible about what happened. And therefore, Ms. Breitenbach's request for a full list of people on duty that night, a full list of, uh, of, of all the employees. And then finally, uh, we also asked uh, G4S months ago, whether they had done the, the lifestyle order that Ms. Breitenbach also raised yesterday, that's also essential. With that, I thank you and your members. We are happy to take any questions, and I have our full team here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judge Cameron. Uh, there's a hand, Honorable Engelbert. No, I think there's still going to be a presentation on the timelines. <laughs> Only if required. Uh, the, the presentation has been before the committee for eight days, but if the committee seeks it, we can. Just uh, talk to it. Just walk us through uh, briefly. Thank you, Honourable Chair. Good morning. Uh, good morning to all the committee members, honourable members, and all those that are present. <clears throat> so uh, we've put together a timeline that gives you what a uh, minister would call a blow-by-blow -blow, uh, shot of what occurred uh, from the very first day. Now, if one looks at this timeline from the 3rd of May, G4S actually reported this unnatural death uh, to what we would call the controller. Uh, that is the first point of the death of Tabu Bester that was brought to the attention of authorities. Uh, the next day that comes up is the 4th of May where the post-mortem was conducted on this body, uh, allegedly to be that of Tabu Bester, mm -hmm. and which was then obviously taken into the hands of the South African police services to conduct the necessary. We as Jigs, on the 5th of May, was thereafter brought in on the scene and we then de decided to mandate this unnatural death investigation. We commenced our entire investigation into this matter on the 5th of May, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members. Um, moving on to the timeline, one looks at the 19th of May, and I'm using the chronological uh, sequence of events, you would find it in your packs. Dr. Nandipa approached the Pretoria High Court, as Judge has already alluded, uh, to claim this body. And obviously, we've already dealt with this in judges' introductories. Um, Swan's statements was taken uh, from the investigating officer, uh, recording the suspicious events of that uh, events that occurred on that evening in that cell. Specifically, uh, these statements were provided to Judge Deniso and Judge uh, Van Rijn, who was also tasked by the JP to intervene in this matter on behalf of the Judicial Inspectorate. 
We move forward in our timelines, and here we take you to the 8th of August, where our investigators, uh, Daniel, uh, actually meets with the DCS investiga investigation team. Uh, they agree to all collaborate, to share all information on hand, and to commence what we would call a joint investigation into this, what we would call unnatural death that had occurred at this stage in this specific cell, the famous cell 35. On the 11th of August, as we move along, you would find that this, uh, based on the report, a preliminary report that was brought out by our investigator, uh, we prepared an office note. Uh, an office note is an internal communication within uh, the Judicial Inspector for Correctional Services informing the inspecting judge uh, of various matters. And in this instant, that the record shows that this body found in the cell does not appear to be that of inmate Bester. And here you can see it. It's already on the 11th of August. This information is known. On the 15th of August, we bring in another senior investigator from our national office in Pretoria to capacitate the team in Bloemfontein, uh, that is uh, Mr. Odeleng Takadu, who is seated directly behind me, uh, to also capacitate uh, the investigation team and give support. They meet also with uh, SAPS, DCS, G4S management, and also try to interview uh, G4S staff and officials uh, and inmates during the course of the uh, investigation. What was striking at this point in time, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members and guests present, is that the video footage was missing. The crucial evidence of what we uh, had already deliberated on yesterday was missing at this point in time. Uh, you'd notice in our quarter one report, uh, we have shared this, uh, we've already touched on the Stabu Weste investigation, it's there. Uh, we didn't elaborate too much on it, but we've registered it that this matter is already being investigated by the Judicial Inspectorate. There you find Judge Deniso uh, and also Judge uh, Van Rijn uh, dealing with this matter as, uh, as tasked by J.P. Musi, and that was from the 12th of October thereon. On the 18th of October, and I'm giving you again what we would call blow-by-blow blow, uh, series, Jiggs meets with the South African Police Services at Jiggs' request. SAPS confirms that the inquest has been closed and that the case of murder has been opened. Here you have it again, 18th October. This has now been converted from what we would call an inquest matter and now converted into what we would call a murder. SAPS has reasons to believe that the dead person that had might been smuggled into the cell uh, is a fabricated uh, suicide and it is actually um, a escape. So Jiggs meets the DCS investigative team at uh, Jiggs' request. Uh, DCS does not hand over the report at this stage. Uh, they were uh, what we would call still busy uh, gathering the information to conclude what we would call their investigation in this, in this matter. On the 19th of October, and you can see days moving, at Jiggs' request, Jiggs meets with G4S Mangawung to arrange the sharing of documents. And here, the sharing of documents is all documents that was on hand, interviews, inmates, officials, and obtaining statements, interviews, and conducting also that interviews that took place between the 19th and the 21st of October, whilst the investigation team was on site at the MCC uh, uh, during the course of this investigation. IJ then writes to Minister on the 26th of October, informing him of this, what we would call, alleged death of Besta, and requesting the interventions of the untoward behavior of some of these officials that uh, have um, brought about this unbecoming situation. Um, collusions of G4S employees and others, uh, fire that was staged in that single cell, and we brought all this to the attention of our Honorable Minister on that day. I may pause. In my own personal capacity, I met the head of center in November, early November, round about the fort, and I've also, when I was presenting the annual report in the province, indicated to him of this situation 
And I've also alluded to him that the results of the postmortem, the DNA results, does not match to that of Tabu Besta. It was brought to the attention of the head of center during the early November 2022. I will go on with the blows. On the 4th of November, IJ meets with DCS Regional Commissioner in Free State, and he warns her of the gravity of the urgency of this matter, and that he also requests um, the uh, assistance with regards to the finalization of the, what we would call, investigation report. The RC uh, declines this request based on uh, the, uh, that she has no uh, dealings with uh, Mango Wung Center at this point in time. It is a national intervention and that MCC reports directly to the National Commissioner and that uh, the IJ should uh, communicate directly with the NC. A preliminary report of G4S investigation report was received with footage that was incomplete. And when I use the word incomplete, I think you're already well aware that in some places those cameras were actually switched off. And we have those evidence yesterday already presented to the Honorable Committee. On the 30th of November, once again, you would recall, we've covered this in our quarter three report, where you would find, in fact, quarter two report, where you'd find the report was sent to the minister, deputy minister, also once again uh, reporting the unnatural death uh, of the alleged death of uh, Tabu Bester. This was also extensively shared within the uh, correctional services environment. Um, we then took a decision, Honorable Chair and members, to uh, write to uh, Lieutenant General uh, of uh, Sibia of the, the Hawks and to request his uh, intervention in this matter and also cooperation. And uh, he obliged. We met him. Uh, we met him uh, on the 18th of January, 2023, where he had come personally to our offices, met the judge, and also provided his support uh, from a national level together with the uh, uh, support from the ministers of police, uh, together with the provincial, uh, SAP's deputy provincial commissioner, uh, he has assured us that he would give us the necessary support and capacity to bring this matter to book. On the 19th of January, RC Moodley advised Jiggs that any requests, as I've mentioned already, uh, should be directed to the national commissioner and that IJ then writes to the national commissioner requesting the internal investigation report of DCS. Day by day, 20th January goes 4th. G4S, Mr. Smith responds, responds to Jig's um, um, request for information, but indicates that G4S report is also not yet finalized and that they are also still completing their reports um, and that that will be provided to Jig's uh, before we meet on the 2nd of February as already uh, 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 testified or noted, noted yesterday to you together with all the relevant uh, video footages. On the 25th of January, Jiggs responds to Mr. Smith requesting the G4S furnishes Jiggs with its updated report to prepare for the meeting to be held on the 2nd of February, uh, and also to note the critical missing footage uh, that is requested by Jiggs at this point in time. Jiggs requested an urgent update on the recovery of the missing footage. The IJ invites SAPS Deputy Provincial Commissioner for the Free State, Major General Modisi, to meet with Jiggs in early February, and that meeting was also actioned, and you'd find it unfolding in the timeline. On the 2nd of February, as already presented to you yesterday, we did meet uh, Mr. Renzo Smith uh, and, con and also emphasized our concerns uh, surrounding the whole debacle about the alleged death of Mr. Uh, Tawu Besta. On the 6th of February, IJ text our National Commissioner requesting attendance of R.C. Mudli at a planned meeting with D.C. and N.C. Text, uh, text back to say that the matter is still under consideration by, uh, by the contract and uh, contract management and DCS is still awaiting what we would call the DCS final investigation report. RC Moodley and her team uh, will not be of any assistance if she does come because the report at that stage of DCS was not finalized. We move to the 7th of February. At Jig's request, Jig's meets with the Free State SAPs 
At G4S Mangurung, management to discuss the progress and Jigs stress the urgency of the investigation. Jigs, during this meeting, learns of SAP's efforts to recover the body in Bester's cell and Dr. Magudumana's attempts to secure a court order to bury this body, and that entire discussion unfolded during the course of that deliberations and engagements. On the 9th of February, the IJ writes again to the National Commissioner informing him of Jiggs and Sapp's conclusions that the body was not that of Besta and that the scene was extensively faked and that the inmate Besta may have escaped from Angoon. Jiggs asked A, when DCS expects to conclude its investigation, B, steps taken to prevent the reoccurrence of such uh, instances, C, steps taken to apprehend Bester. Jiggs also inquired whether DC has formally reported an escape, and if not, when it is proposing to do so. 9th of March, 2023. During the quarterly meeting with the National Commissioner, we meet him on a quarterly basis, on a bilateral, on Jiggs activities and DCS. Jiggs reiterated its request for the DCS internal investigation report and the suspicion that inmate Besta is alive and is well and most importantly dangerous. The NC informed Jiggs that he has received a draft report at this stage from DCS contract management and is awaiting a final report will focus on the contractual implications of uh, MCC or G4S. 16th March 2023, Jiggs resend a letter of the 26th of October, which was sent to Minister Lamola, once again bringing all the contents of this matter to the attention of our Honourable Minister. Jiggs also writes, IJ also writes to Minister uh, DM uh, Holomisa, requesting his personal uh, attention to this matter uh, surrounding the alleged death of Bester. IJ writes to G4S once again, Mr. Smith requesting updates. Has progress been made on the proposed lifestyle audits, which was also addressed extensively yesterday on G4S officials? Have events led to any apprehendable changes in the policies, managements, and operational conducts at Mangaung? Has G4S own reports being amended or updated? Have renewed or further investigations or disciplinary proceedings being undertaken or contemplated? 25th of March, NC Tabochele undertakes to provide Jigs with the DCS internal <coughs> investigation report. 27th of March, IJ follows up with NC on the DCS investigation report. 30th of March, DCS internal investigation report is handed personally to me. On the 31st of March, after receiving DCS report, Jigs finalizes its own investigation and once completed, this August committee will be informed of the outcome of Jig's investigation. I just want to cover a few aspects before I stop, Honorable Chair. The one is the issue of segregation and whether it was reported to Jig's. Um, I can openly inform you that the segregation as of 30th of April was not conveyed to Jig's at all. And any segregation in terms of the act should be brought to the attention of the inspecting judge forthwith, and in this instant, this request was not brought to the attention of Jigs. I thank you, Honorable Chair. I thank you, Honorable Members. Uh, thank you very much uh, to Jigs. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, yesterday, I started this side. Tomo today, I must start that side, going this side. That is fairness. Uh, I want to report to Jigs that I am being intimidated by this member. <laughs> Honorable Engelberg. Uh, it's Honorable Engelberg. Honorable Glennis Bredenbach, Honorable Horn, Honorable Masego Tele, Honorable Janji, uh, Honorable Ramulubeng, 
Honorable Yako, Honorable Nola, Honorable uh, uh, Chair. Chair, order. Honorable uh, yeah, I Can call I ask order. you to undertake next round to start so. here, Chair, because each time I end up being right at the end. And yes, next time I'll start, start that side. Okay. <laughs> then you will be the last, yes. But Chair, do you use I call order, Chair, I, and I, I request your indulgence on this one. Because la yesterday you forgot me. And today, I at least would like to be in the top three, at least. <laughs> I'm just requesting to be in the top three, at least. Indulge me on this one. No, and please not. don't kindly allow uh, Honorable Janji to intimidate you. <laughs> no, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Yako. Honorable Engelbert. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chi. Um, and... Uh, I must, uh, before I ask questions, just say that I'm, Honorable Swart, can you switch off your mic? I found that the, the JICS report was uh, very well put together and uh, I could get a lot of information, um, for a very short report with a lot of information. There's just a few clarity-seeking questions um, I wish to pose. Um, in your timeline, um, the inspecting judge writes to the minister on the 26th of October, 2022, where he is informed uh, of the best escape. Um, was, was this information also shared with DCS at that point in time? Thank I you. Can, I, can, I, can, I can do all the questions and then you can answer. Please, please. Okay. Uh, Honourable Member, are you, are you going to proceed or would you like an no, answer? No, no, please, yeah. answer. Uh, I think it was shared at that point. Uh, you, we can confirm. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Mm. And may I just say, uh, Honourable uh, Member, Mr. Engelbrecht, that the Minister and I also in October did have a, a telephone conversation which I raised the JICS bill with him. And at that point I also gave him an oral briefing. Uh, so, uh, yeah, thank you. Then um, it is indicated in your report that the regional commissioner then declined to discuss the matter with you. Um, so, th but according to my information, the DCS controllers at the facility reports to the regional commissioner. Isn't that so? So. Uh, sorry, uh, Judge. Uh, I think in your court you would have said uh, uh, you can't just note uh, for the purposes of record. <laughs> Confirming that the regional controllers, yes. uh, the, the on-site controllers report to the regional commissioner. Okay. Uh, thank you uh, for that. Then um, in your quarter three report that you sent to the ministry and to the national commissioner, that uh, records the best investigation. We know now that the minister was, was made aware of the fact that the body removed from C-35 was not Bester, uh, thus indicating an escape and not a suicide. Um, the commissioner was informed about this. Um, in your opinion, or, or was the commissioner, the, 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 uh, let me rephrase, the, the committee was not informed of the suspicions about the Bester escape or death at that time, um, was the National Commissioner and the Regional Commissioner aware of that at that point? They were aware of our suspicions, but may I say again, uh, the, the, I think there were two difficulties. The one was the sense of absolute incredulity. Uh, the Minister also, uh, he reminded me this morning, at, at the time, uh, we, we, were, we were struck with disbelief, despite the facts in, uh, first, the post-mortem report, and secondly, in the DNA tests, which, which were available to us, which indicated uh, conclusively, as we now look back, so uh, we, 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 uh, they were aware, uh, and uh, yeah, the, the answer is, is positive on that. May, may, I, may I also say that I think uh, the problem was that there were intersecting investigations. They were grinding slowly. 
in hindsight, those investigations should have been done with dispatch, with alacrity, and that's what we were trying to encourage. But at the same time, I think the incredulity uh, attending this, everyone was guarding their own flanks. It was hard to, be, to, to believe what had happened. Uh, I think that was, 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 was a drag on all the investigations. And again, uh, uh, it, it might be an easy target, as, as Ms. Breitenbach said yesterday to the Integriton people, one doesn't want to choose, in, but I think at the core of the foot dragging was G4S. Uh, when, when we saw uh, Mr. Renzo Smith in his office in Centurion in February or late January, uh, they'd done nothing. They, 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 they thought that they could get away with dismissing two or three of the, of the, of, of, of the lower personnel, uh, the, 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 the medium level management personnel, so I think that the, the, the absence of alacrity with those who took on-site responsibility for the disgraceful events of that night, I think that impeded everyone else. Because we were all uh, Lat Lamikis Lat coming after G4S. Thank you. Then um, on the 16th of, day of January, um, the regional commissioner was requested by yourselves for a copy of the DCS report. Um, so she took three days to respond, um, saying that, well, please refer this uh, request to the National Commissioner, uh, which you received then on the 19th of January. So after the 19th, was there any interaction between yourselves and DCS on the Bester matter? Or was the lack of interaction the motivation for your communication that happened on the 6th of February? Yes, and, and uh, that is so, uh, Honourable Member, Mr. Grunewald, and also for our meeting with uh, General Labia of the Hawks, who, as the CEO said, came to see us at JIX with his team. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's not as though we were in daily contact with DCS about this. We, we, we prodded them and signaled from time to time. And then we were exploring all possible avenues to get this out into the open. Well, then 18 days later on the 6th of February, another request was made by yourselves to the National Commissioner, as you were informed by the Regional Commissioner. Um, in this uh, communication, you again requested assistance from the Regional Commissioner. Is this correct? Absolutely correct. In the report, it is indicated that the uh, um, Regional Commissioner and a team will not be of assistance. Uh, was that your own conclusion or was that communicated to you by the National Commissioner? It was in a letter from the National Commissioner uh, who said, <laughs> lay off on, on the regional commissioner because she and her team won't be of assistance. We were trying to probe w what's happening and where and why is it not happening. So uh, we, we were casting around for the, 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 the levers that had not yet been pulled and should have been pulled. Three days later, on the 9th, you, you communicated again with DCS. You posed three questions, which is in the report. Did you receive any answers to those questions? And if you did, uh, when did you receive it? And what was these answers? We, we only received the answers when uh, DCS furnished its report to us in the week before our first appearance here last week. And the answers are in, in that report. So we now jump a month into the future to the 9th of March this, this year. Uh, were there any other interactions with DCS? Here you again warn of best of being alive and well and dangerous. Um, why was this warning made on the 9th of March again? So, uh, the, 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 I think this committee yesterday expressed the sense of peril and outrage, which is appropriate to this matter, and, and we, we weren't seeing evidence of it. I'm not saying that the Commissioner 
or uh, either the, the National Commissioner of Police or the National Commissioner of, of Corrections or any of the executive officials in government. I'm not saying they didn't feel that urgency, but it wasn't being evidenced to us. So it was, it was an attempt to to, to, to put a fire into the, into the responses. Thank you. Um, why was the 26th October letter to the minister resent to the minister? As a formality, uh, because we wanted a, an, an on-record response. Uh, uh, I know that the minister was concerned but we wanted him uh, and the Deputy Minister to activate the, uh, the officials uh, over whom they had executive authority to get things going. At, at that point, the, the public had been alerted. Uh, if I've got my timeline right, sir, uh, the, the, the ground-up report which signaled the full catastrophe, the full disgrace, the full fiasco was 15th of March. And uh, I can't remember the date of what you are asking me about, if you can just help me with that. 23rd March. 23rd, so it was after that. Yes. Yes, it, it was to, to bring the, the executive and public officials in charge uh, of, of, of corrections and those responsible for what happened to the sense of urgency that the public wanted at that point. Then we get to the Deputy Minister. Why was the Deputy, Deputy Minister requested to give personal attention to the matter? Was it because you thought at the time that neither the Minister nor, nor the Department applied their minds or about the seriousness of this uh, incident or didn't give the matter the required and expected attention, uh, in your opinion? We knew they were applying their minds, we knew that they regarded the matter as serious, but we thought that the wheels were grinding too slowly. Now, uh, the, the Minister has two deputies. He has Mr. John Jeffrey on the constitutional side and he has Nkosi uh, Patakila Olamisa on the corrections side. And we wanted to bring him in formally as well. Uh, we, we might say that the Deputy Minister has been of assistance to us in the past with internal matters. For example, in, in a, a critical matter of health care, he convened a meeting which enabled a rollout of a public-private partnership, American-funded, of crucial anti-TB and anti-HIV drugs. So we knew that he could assist us in various ways, and we wanted to, 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 to put a, a formal notification on his desk as well. And I think that he welcomed that. I don't have any reason to believe that he didn't welcome that. No, well, on the timeline, it's quite evident because two days later you received the report um, after you uh, requested the deputy minister to intervene. Uh, Correct. Then I just want to know, um, in all the meetings that you had with G4S throughout this um, sorry episode, at what stage did you tell them that the body they recovered from that was recovered from C-35 was in fact not the body of Bester. I know the original, they, they say that officially they were informed, um, but I want to know the first time that they were told in a meeting. They knew long, long beforehand, as your question implies, uh, Honorable Mr. Engelbrecht, long, long before but we're closing their eyes to it. Uh, we have our lead, our head of investigations, Mr. Leonard D'Souza, sitting just behind me. I can't uh, uh, tr uh, accurately tell you now when we first formally in informed them. Mr. Renzo Smith, who is the head of operations for G4S in not just Africa, but in the Middle East, he expressed surprise when we met him very early in February or, or early, uh, uh, late in January. Surprise about everything we told him. And uh, we were surprised at his surprise. It, it seemed to us completely inappropriate. Can I, may I just ask uh, our, our, our head of investigations, please, sir, Mr. Chair? Uh, I'm told that we formally informed uh, G4S about the body, about the, uh, the, the post-mortem report, about the DNA in early November. Thank you. Um, then just in summary, uh, just to make sure that I've got everything uh, 
Correct. The regional commissioner did not want to cooperate, correct. It seemed to me to be a hierarchical thing. When I raised it in November with her, it was at the end of a, a long and important meeting about operational issues uh, under her control, because she's not just of the Free State, she's of, of the Northern Cape. Uh, the regional commission is here. Uh, I thought she went white. And it was evident that the matter of grave distress to her, uh, and she, she clammed up. She said, uh, I, I have to consult with the National Commission. I don't think she was unwilling to deal with it. Maybe she didn't know how to deal with it. Maybe it was a hierarchical thing. Uh, so I, I can't give you more than that. And I, I, I thought that she seemed... Uh, shocked and dismayed by the way in which I brought up the, the Tabo Vesta matter at that early November meeting, where I said to her, this is going to be a catastrophe for the administration of justice. It's a point that's not yet been made uh, for the whole administration of justice, sir, that uh, if, if, if a glorious felon, criminal, can get out of one of the three most secure facilities in the country, what does it say about all of us, judges, parliamentarians, uh, correctional officials, police, justice administration? It, it's, a, it's a lamentable commentary on what all of us are doing, and, and that's what I, what I try to convey. Then um, the next point is uh, the minister did not act in the way that it would have been ex expected. Uh, despite being informed on the 26th of October 2022. Is that co correct assumption? I wouldn't agree with that. Uh, uh, the, the, the minister expressed concern. Uh, he made a joke with me this morning. He, he, he said this, this morning that when I first mentioned it to him orally, he thought that I'd smoked something. <laughs> and, and that's a, a, a legitimate response at that point. So I think he was entrusting the operational response to it, to his hands-on officials. Uh, we wanted him to make more fire beneath their posteriors, uh, and, and I don't know whether he did that or not. He will be able to say. Um, then lastly, uh, the National Commissioner complied with requests only after you, as a last resort, requested assistance from the Deputy Minister's office. Is that correct? I think it was a long and cumbersome process to get that report together. You've seen it's, it's a 41-page, very detailed, extremely informative report. Uh, whether it was bureaucracy or other issues, I don't know. But you can ask the National Commissioner. I, I do believe that uh, the Deputy Minister intervened to hasten its conclusion. But you did not receive updates as this document was compiled? Not that I can recall. And then lastly, and I think you already sort of answered this, uh, but to your, in your opinion, do you think this, uh, the handling of this situation by uh, the department is undermining the criminal justice system in South Africa? I, I won't be as, as grand as that, sir, but I will say that the, the handling fell short. I think that everyone, including us at Jix, I mean, we had that post-mortem report in August. Uh, uh, the, uh, your honorable members could be saying to us, why didn't you blow the whistle then? So I feel, I feel complicit in the uh, insufficient response, and I certainly point a finger also at, at uh, the executive officials and at uh, the department, certainly also at, at G4S, in insufficiently, alertly, ac accurately, and energizedly responding to this. I think uh, all of that was lacking. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Chair, I have no further questions. No, thank you very much. Um, in the interest of transparency, I am bound to say you have saved 15 minutes, but on the other hand, I know that there are people who are experts in expropriating other people's time. Um, 
but he has to save 15 minutes so that everybody knows. Honorable Glennis Breitenbach. Thank you, Chair. Can I get you a saucer of milk before I start? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, Justice Cameron, let me start with the most um, obvious question. Uh, and, and let me agree with, with Mr. Engelbrecht that the report is helpful. It's uh, detailed. Uh, and and um, bearing in mind what's happened here, a, a job well done. But then also bear in mind the bar's not high. Um, and of course the most obvious question is if you knew when you had the post-mortem report, why did you not draw attention to this matter? Why, why did you on your own admission uh, request that the matter not be made public? You agreed with the police. The police requested it and you agreed with it. Uh, why, why would that be? The same reasons, uh, Honourable Member Ms. Breitenbach. Uh, incredulity, slow-moving levers, uh, and wish to assist, wish not to uh, intrude on delicate processes. When we met the SAPS, we met the seven top people involved uh, in, in early February in Bloemfontein uh, on the ground at the ad on the advice of General Libya. He said, go to the Free State and, and see the, the on-the-ground SAPS members first. They were on top of it, uh, uh, Honourable Member. The, uh, all of them were on top of it. I met Brigadier Tsvai, who was, uh, if she'd not put in that notice of opposition to Dr. Magadumana's Pretoria High Court application, this would have had a very different history. So even at that stage, the police said to us, we've got two more witnesses to interview. And we need to interview them in Mangong. So we don't want anything uh, to, to be publicized at this point. And we defer to that. Uh, up, to, up to that point, uh, the, 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 the media had available uh, documents which were publicly accessible, like the affidavits, like the report of, of uh, Judge uh, Nokatula Danisa from the Free State High Court. Uh, so it was only after they had, after we knew that they had interviewed the last two witnesses that uh, it, it seemed appropriate to go further. Uh, Can I just say, uh, Madam, that, that, that I don't have a, a satisfactory answer to your question. I was part of the same process of, of, of slow levers, of disbelief, and of caution. I, I understand fully the disbelief, uh, because it still induces a sense of disbelief, even knowing what we now know. Uh, a sense of disbelief that somebody in that position could orchestrate uh, such an elaborate scheme that he could have sufficient time, money, and access to information uh, to grease sufficient palms in a, high, in a maximum security prison to do this uh, does beg a belief. Um, but what, what, what I find even more astonishing is the fact that uh, G4S has one job to do. They're in charge of a maximum security prison. Their job is to keep people there, incarcerated there, not out, not running around the streets, not living the life of Riley. Sorry, Honorable Pretenbach, there is noise there and it's affecting us. Are you too? And that's Thank their you. only job. And when something goes wrong, they, they're obliged to report it to DCS and then the, the wheel should be set in motion to do something about it. Somebody has escaped, they need to be found, they need to be rearrested, they need to be brought back to prison immediately. More particularly a serial murderer and rapist. Uh, so, so yes, it does beg a belief, but, but I agree with you. Um, and, and forgive me, but you're an experienced litigator. You, you, you know, um, Litigation is not for sissies. Uh, you were a serious litigator before you became a judge, before you became a justice of the Constitutional Court, and you carry a huge amount of authority. Uh, the, the respect that you engender in myself and others is enormous. Uh, so you have a lot of clout, uh, and you didn't use it here, and 
I wonder why. I'm going to evade that question for one point just to underscore the first point you made. The 2018 video is publicly available. It shows an identifiable incarcerated person incarcerated at Mangaung. The metadata on it could have been examined. That video has been available for months. It was released by Ground Up months ago. And yesterday we were told that we, we, were, we were given evasive answers about the video. So that underscores not only was he able to do such extensive presentations, he was able from prison or on hospital leave to, to, to hook up to a sufficiently uh, a connected uh, system to appear on video to, to, uh, at the Santon Convention Center. All of it beggars belief. Madam Honorable Ms. Breitenbach, you, you're asking me a, a, an existential question. Why, why, why didn't I blow it when I saw the death certificate in, 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 in the course of August? I, I can tell you existentially, well, who, who knows whether the doctor was in someone's pay on, on the other side? It, it, it sounds absurd, but everything that occurred here is absurd. The things that, that, uh, that uh, Mr. Makhoti Tobukhale's predecessor did uh, seem absurd. Why did he go there on, on, on the last day of, of, of his tenure and then find that the controller was moved? So you're asking me a, a question. I, I, I acted uh, to alert the public uh, from late September. The, the people I alerted acted with care and caution and immense responsibility and skepticism and then started uh, uh, alerting the, uh, uh, the public um, and they've rightly been honored here, uh, Ground Up, and the, the, the reason why Ground Up's reportage has made so much uh, in, uh, impact here and abroad is because of its care and because of its, its scrupulousness. So, I, uh, Ground Up did what I could possibly have done on, on a national stage, but I think it was appropriate for them as journalists in their role, for me not to convene a press conference and, and waive a, uh, a, a, a post-mortem report. But I, 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 as again, may I say, uh, Madam, you are asking me questions that I cannot fully satisfactory answer. I, I understand, and I wasn't suggesting for one moment that you should hold a press conference waiving a death certificate. Um, I understand fully that that type of behavior is inconsistent with who you are. Uh, but you have, you do have a lot of personal clout. And uh, I'm wondering why you didn't use it to smack the Minister of Justice, the Minister of Police, and the Commissioner of DCS into line. Uh, because I think you possibly have sufficient clout to have done that. Although I also concede that you possibly don't think so. Um. Uh, this, I hope this doesn't sound like a smart answer, Madam, but I, that, that is the, the role of this committee. And I'm very glad that this committee has been performing it in such an exemplary way. Okay, fair enough. Let's, let's move on. Um, you've explained why you thought it should be kept uh, confidential initially, but that was in August. And the police wanted to complete their investigation, and they had one or two people to interview. But these people, as you say, were in Mangaung. They weren't going anywhere for, uh, forgive the pun, but they were a captive audience. Um, all they had to do was go and take the statements. So what took so long? And why did you give them that much leeway? I, I started informing uh, trusted people in the media who, who have already been identified in the course of September. When Judge Nogatula Daniso visited on the 12th of October, she sent me a personal message uh, which, which recorded for the first time. She was there because of a, a whistleblower, Mr. Kahani, from, from uh, inside Mangaung. Uh, she was there on the bidding of the, of the judge president. She was writing to me in my official capacity as, uh, as inspecting judge. I didn't ask her permission, 
But I did check with her. I have no reason to believe that she isn't happy with what I did. And I shared her, her uh, it was a five-point report uh, with Ground Up, which then set the two journalists who, who have been here uh, on, onto the matter. So uh, in, in retrospect, uh, I'm, 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 I've, I concede that I don't have a, a good enough answer, but I've given a partial answer. Thank you. Um, now, you mentioned twice in the report that you submitted uh, quarterly reports to the Portfolio Committee, sent the report to the Minister, the Deputy Minister, and the National Commissioner. But in those reports, you draw no particular attention to this matter. In fact, you're almost at pains to make it fade into the background. And so I, for one, uh, having gone through that report, certainly it didn't jump out at me. And it was uh, dealt with along with all the other escapes. Uh, and there was nothing in the report to suggest that there was anything uh, sensational or untoward or requiring attention. Uh, while you well knew that there was. Um, so the fact that the committee wasn't aware of this uh, earlier is, is partially due to the fact that uh, there was no attention drawn specifically to this matter. It's listed amongst a whole lot of escapes, uh, uh, you know, a, a suicide in a cell. Um, and it doesn't stand out from the other, so there are other suicides in other cells. Um, and so let me, let me say that, that I'm a little disappointed that the committee wasn't, that the committee's attention wasn't drawn to this matter earlier, uh, because if it had been, um, we could perhaps have dealt with it sooner, more, more quickly, and maybe, uh, you know, Mr. Bester wouldn't have left the country. He'd already escaped. There's nothing to do about that. Um, but then we, you know, it, we may have deprived uh, Tanzania of being the heroes in this arrest, and we, we could have, you know, been the heroes ourselves, the, the South African police. But... Uh, so I'm a little disappointed that the attention of the committee wasn't drawn to this matter specifically. Um, and I assume that well, you can tell me why you didn't. I, I accept responsibility for that. The, the, the annual report and the quarterly reports are my responsibility. I sign off on them. And that was my decision. And uh, I think that you uh, are correct to chastise me and Jix as a whole for not doing it earlier. Uh, in retrospect, the, the, the hindsight thing, I, I would handle it differently. I don't know quite, I, I didn't mean to demean your line of questioning by saying I wasn't going to waver. I didn't mean that, but there were things, as your questioning rightly implied, that I could have done effectually and appropriately and in a dignified way. And uh, I, from Judge Daniso's report of the 12th of October, uh, I thought that we were... Uh, in an appropriate and ethical way, uh, bring the matter to to the public's attention and also to this committee. But I take responsibility for for uh, the fact that we should also have much earlier uh, drawn it to the committee's attention, officially and formally. Thank you. Um, the fact that that you did. Um, give the information to ground up, and the fact that they did such a, a stunning job with it uh, certainly is to, to your credit and theirs. Um, you mentioned that uh, at your meeting with uh, DCS in October, uh, DCS was um, reporting that they were having difficulty obtaining information from G4S, and you yourself had difficulty. Um, could you just describe your view? What, what was G4S's approach to this matter? Why were you having this difficulty? I would think that uh, a company running a maximum security prison under contract to DCS uh, would find themselves in a, a, for want of a better way of describing it, a subservient position to DCS and therefore uh, be willing to, to supply whatever information. I mean, the, the, the 
disaster happened on their watch. You'd think they would do everything they could possibly to, to mitigate the damage, and yet here they are being obtuse and recalcitrant. Why, why do you think that is? Uh, Honourable Member, I think the ideas were, the, the reasons were effectively canvassed yesterday, very effectively. I, I think it was evasion of responsibility, accountability. I think it was implications. We, we told Mr. Renzo Smith, uh, on the, I think it was the 2nd of February, that this would have an impact on G4S's worldwide operations. This is a massive company with huge investments and, and, and also it's, it's local. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the Mangaung is only part of its, it does guarding as we, as we heard yesterday. So I think there was a defensiveness uh, rooted in self-interest, rooted in a reluctance to take responsibility. Uh, there, there's no doubt, we, I, I think you are, are right to, to, to put us under the cudgel, and I accept that. Uh, um, uh, and rightly, no doubt, the minister, when, 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 when he comes, and, and the national commissioner. Uh, but I do think that the original and founding sin was uh, committed by, first of all, by the operational officials, officials in Mangaung, who must have colluded over years with uh, Tabo Besta and perhaps with Dr. Magurumana, who was visiting him frequently from 2017, as we heard yesterday. And then secondly, beyond the operational officials, the management officials, and thirdly, the executive officials. I think that was the original sin. And while not shrugging off any of the responsibility for not bringing it to the public's or this committee's attention earlier, I think that was the, the, uh, the founding sin. Oh, I would certainly agree with that. Um, when you met with Mr. Smith, and, and I wonder today why Mr. Smith wasn't here yesterday. If he's the regional cluster director for Southern Africa, does he not think that this matter is sufficiently important to require his presence. Uh, so, you know, Mr. Chair, at some point I'm going to ask you that we ask Mr. Smith to uh, grace us with his presence. I may have one or two questions for Mr. Smith. Um, but you keep requesting uh, an updated investigation report from them. You keep insisting that there's missing video footage. And, and you get no joy. Uh, they keep refusing. Did they at any point tell you about the matter that we traversed yesterday with the person entering the control room and then the recording going off? Uh, and, and if they did, when did they tell you? We were not told. We, uh, the, the reason we know about that and the reason ground up reports that there are two figures seen fleeing from the administration block at a few seconds before, after 2.59 and before 0300 on that morning, uh, was because the two people behind me, uh, Mr. Leonard uh, D'Souza and Mr. Odoleng Zakaria Tokadu, spent days going through a wadge of uh, video recordings that were, that were dumped on, on Jix. They found those it's a split second. I don't know if, if, if this committee has seen it. Uh, and I, I've, I've not yet seen, but Mr. D'Souza and Mr. Takadu saw the, 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 uh, the gentleman, Mr. DiPolo, go in uh, and saw him going towards the, 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 uh, the, the, the um, equipment room. Yeah. Well, so that, so the G4S's idea of, of, of cooperating and supplying you with information was to, you know, it's like, it's like uh, we request for further particulars, you know, when you get a 500-page request. It's just an abuse. Dumped a pile of stuff on you and expected you to do their job. As Mr. D'Souza and Mr. Takadu did. Yeah. And uh, we, we, we the, the, I think that your and your colleagues' questioning yesterday of Integriton established that they knew they knew that, that this had happened. It, it was, uh, and, and the cross-examination uh, of, of Mr. Williams established that it was incontrovertible what happened at 1930, before at 1938 the plug was pulled. 
And I'm just underscoring what the committee achieved yesterday. Uh, G4S did nothing. So, so they never ever told you it was up to you to, to do the trawling and the finding, and, and they have a kom si kom sa houding. Honorable Yes, madam. You are left with 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, Mr. Smith's idea of a response to your request for assistance is to let you know that the report has not yet been completed. This is in January 2023. The report has not yet been completed, and it will be provided before the 2nd of February, uh, and that they have already supplied the re re relevant video footage to, to you. That, that's his response. Uh, the relevant video footage, I presume, is the whole pile of stuff that you have to trawl through. Hours um, and hours and hours. Well, to your two officials, then, very well done. Um, so, in, on the 20th of January, 2023, this is what? Seven, eight months after the event. They're still busy compiling a report. Correct. Nine months. Busy compiling a report. Um, did you ever get the report? And what did it look like uh, in comparison to the report we got yesterday? It was bare bones. Uh, and it persisted, if I'm correct, uh, Mr. Missa will, will uh, correct me or, or uh, the, the gentleman on my right will correct me. It persisted in, in the fiction. Uh, that, that it was Bester who died. I, m I might be wrong. Uh, yeah. It persisted in that fiction. Unbelievably, madam. Yes, well, they clung to that version until very recently. And in fact, when we visited the prison last week, their representative very vehemently confirmed to me that it was Bester who died in that cell, uh, despite all the information that was publicly available. So it's a, it's a version that they uh, cling to regardless, almost... Uh, Incomprehensibly. Uh, comprehensibly, madam, for the reasons <laughs> you explored. Yes. So in February, you, you meet with, with Smith and you, con you emphasize that you're concerned that Bester has escaped. And still, they cling to that version. There, there's a serial rapist and murderer on the loose in South Africa has rape survivors trying to recover and live their life and may run into him at any time. And G4S continues to say it was best who died in that cell, and they do little or nothing to remedy the situation. That is accurate, Mr. Chair, <laughs> Honourable Mr. Chair, Honourable Member. But the impression that I gained from, from your report is that there was a lot of reluctance, a lot of reluctance. You've got not very satisfactory cooperation from DCS initially. I don't know if it improved as time went by, uh, but a lot of passing the buck. So I can't deal with this above my pay grade. Uh, everybody not wanting to handle this hot potato. And, and even the police, uh, disappointingly, uh, are still not finished with their investigation. And we're now in, in April 2023. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's astonishing that, that everybody knew that there was a murderer and a rapist on the loose, and nobody did anything with any sense of urgency to rearrest him. Until now, until this, a week ago, this became a topic of, of public outrage. And then all of a sudden, uh, everybody's in action. Again, once the uh, chicken has flown the coop, just like the Guptas. They let them go first, now they're trying haphazardly to extradite them. Uh, best has gone. Lucky Tanzania was awake and caught him. Um, but only a week ago was there any urgency in this matter. Um, I find that astonishing. Uh, and I'd like your view on that. Well, I've, I've, uh, I, I've accepted that I exhibited the same kind of uh, perhaps in, in a, a more, a less culpable or, or, or demonstrable extent, the same kind of, of uh, insufficient 
urgency and outrage and alarm. Uh, uh, um, perhaps in, in, in October, instead of only alerting ground up, uh, uh, we could have called a, a, a media conference uh, to, to express our provisional views. The, the trouble is that our report, our reports are, are carefully produced, uh, and I've no doubt the same is true of, of DCS, uh, and we saw the care with which that 41-page report is produced. So I, I, I concede that everyone should have been smarter, more on the ball, quicker, more alarmed, more outraged, more dismayed, and more urgent. And I include myself in that. Well, that's very generous of you, uh, Justice Cameron, but the fact of the matter is that Rix has uh, a, a niche mandate. You have limitations in which you operate. It's not, you, you're not the South African police. You are not the Department of Correctional Services. Um, so your mandate is somewhat limited. Um, but you're, you're having alerted DCS and, and the Minister of Justice um, about the fact that in all probability, Bester was on the loose. Uh, that's what fills me with incredulity that there was no action there, that there was this sort of armchair approach, given, given the fact that this particular person who's clearly a danger to society and clearly had rape survivors out there trying to live their lives and hoping not to run into him in checkers. And nothing, nothing was done to support those people, to warn them, to protect them. Um, that's absolutely unforgivable. And, and uh, that, that, is, that is my problem here, that there was no urgency there until a week ago when it became sort of unavoidable to do something and then they did it. You say when you told the minister that of the story, he thought he had been smoking something. No, he was as making... A no, sorry, no, as madam. a joke. Yeah, no, as, a, as a joke, I accept. But uh, this morning... Yeah. Uh, okay. No, no, he didn't say it. Uh, it was a serious conversation oh. and he... Sorry for interrupting you, ma'am. No, no problem. Uh, well, you told him in, in, in October, you told him. Yes, madam. And the minister failed to alert this committee as well. Uh, you don't have to answer that. It's a fact, and I'll put it to him. Um, the deputy minister also failed to bring it to the attention of, of this committee. Um, despite several interactions. I, I find that somewhat disappointing. Do you not agree with me that DCS stands in a contractual relationship to G4S and DCS is the senior partner in that relationship? It's the constitutionally responsible partner. Yeah. So when, when G4S says to us they need um, to be summoned because they they have this confidentiality, contractual confidentiality issue that they... The minister is sitting here. The commissioner of correctional services is sitting here. I could release them from that immediately. Um, you know, there's honestly very little need for this production. The, the, may, I, may I answer on their behalf? Because I've scrutinized that as well. The National Commissioner took the view on legal advice from within his executive office that the invitation to G4S constituted Section 111 permission. I agree with that. Uh, I, I, I sat here yesterday, and again, I, I, I make your caveat that one doesn't want to kick a dog when it's down, I'm not referring to G4S's dogs, but the, it, it, it's an easy target now. The, the explanation provided for requiring a summons from this committee was risable. It was laughable. The National Commissioner wrote them a letter saying, you are invited here. That constitutes a, a, a statutory permission under the Correctional Services Act. This whole thing of seeking to uh, do the public a favor by being required to be subpoenaed is bogus. It is un it, 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 it's ridiculous. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, can, you. I just, can I just make one statement, then I'm done. Um, but but it, does, it does reflect uh, their, in, their approach to this entire matter. Of G4S, but yes. I, do, I do 
uh, note that the, that the commissioner took the view that his letter inviting them to come here as instructed by the chairman and, and the secretary of this committee constitutes permission and I think that, that uh, conclusion was warranted. Thank you. Thank you very much. Honorable Hon. Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning from my side, uh, Justice and, and the team. Um, I firstly want to make the statement that, uh, that I believe the reason uh, that it's not without purpose or reason that in our country we ultimately settled on a judicial inspectorate of correctional centers and not a, a, a civilian oversight body. Uh, of course, your ICCVs to to incorporate that aspect, but that the the and while we are still grappling with your true independence, the the whole purpose of of installing a, a judge at the head of this inspectorate is ultimately to tap into that experience, the judgment, the insight, but also the gravitas. Um, and in that sense, um, I would want to without belaboring the point, uh, maybe just pick up with you on the, the whole issue of the, the disbelief and then your experience of a, a slow process of investigation and ask your views on, on what informed this. Um, uh, I think you, you are on record that uh, maybe it was also informed on the one hand uh, by disbelief. Was that the, the only thing you experienced uh, when dealing with from G4S to DCS to the SAPs and the Minister? Thank you, uh, Honourable Member. Uh, I, th I think it was, and, and it was also because, as I've said, the principle uh, operational responsibility, notwithstanding the managerial and oversight responsibility being DCS's, the principal operational responsibility was G4S's. So uh, I'm, 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 I'm casting around in the air now. Uh, if, if DCS said, well, we, we need G4S's accounting for this first, mm -hmm. we, we're not responsible for directly for operationally for the escape. They escaped from a facility for which G4S is lavishly paid per prisoner, uh, as was explored yesterday. So uh, I, I, the, the disbelief was, was part of it, but it wasn't the major disabling factor. Okay, so, so if we then go to the, the um, uh, and I want to pick up with you regarding that primary responsibility of G4S later on, but... There is, of course, also the possibility that the the lack of alacrity, as you you put it, was was also informed by, to an extent, a culture uh, of of hoping and and maybe experiencing that some of your your potential problems, if they ignored long enough, will go away. Is is that true? Absolutely, sir. Um, and then if we get to the, 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 the agreement, I want to say, of which you were part of, to, to keep the investigation confidential. And, and my colleague, Ms. Breitenbach, has, has touched on the consideration of the, the risk that, that the escape, or I see some people say we shouldn't call it an escape, we should call it a, a walkout. Um, uh, the risk that it posed to the general populace, but specifically also women. Um, in hindsight, do you think there was a justification to, to agree by all of the role players to keep this slow, ongoing inve investigation confidential? So... <clears throat> uh I, th I think so, provided that constant prods were being delivered. We, we try to do that, maybe not enough, but there's no doubt, for example, when, when we saw uh, the seven 
senior free state uh, officials in, uh, of, of Saps and Bloemfontein, that they felt that their investigation would be, would be jeopardized uh, by, 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 by further disclosures. They felt that the media coverage given might jeopardize it. So again, uh, I, I, I say, sir, and I'm, I'm only repeating that, that uh, we, we must be humble in bringing hindsight to this. Uh, uh, Yes, obviously that's something we will take up with them as well, but from where I'm sitting, I would think that the, let's say, the short term, keeping it under wraps, could be informed by, by a situation of, A, we, we have a, a, a certain number of, of people, officials, who, who's in our, within our sights, and we want to, to not lose the, site, the element of surprise, or B, we, we've now come to the conclusion that, that Bester is out there, uh, given the fact that uh, the, the doctor was early on identified, I think, or, or as, as, as your note says, on the 11th of August, mm -hmm. implicated, mm -hmm. that, that we don't want to lose the element of surprise when we're going to engage the doctor. But now, mm -hmm. as we sit here, none of that happened. Um, so, so, so the, the, let's say the, 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 the reasoning behind an agreement that we will for now keep this confidential, in a, uh, juxtaposed to the risk for the gen to the general populace out there, none of that ever ultimately materialized. Would you agree? I think that's, that's fair, sir. C can I just give you an example of, of how cumbersomely this works? And this is not an excuse, it, it's, it's, a, it's an attempt to, to enlighten the committee. We didn't know about Dr. Magadumana's urgent application, that the one sneakily brought in the Pretoria High Court. We didn't know about Brigadier, Brigadier Tsui's answering affidavit until we met with the SAPS in Bloemfontein in the first week of February. That was like gold to us. And uh, th it was possible for me, because those were matters of public record available in the Pretoria High Court, to make that available to, to, to media sources uh, uh, after the meeting. But that, that, especially the SAPS answering affidavit opposing the relief that Dr. Magadumana sought, was very valuable to us. So why we weren't given, why we weren't alerted uh, in August that there'd been an urgent application, why we weren't alerted that there'd been a very detailed and careful legal response to Dr. Magadamana, why, why she wasn't arrested uh, for perjury, because her, her, her claims were, were, were demonstrably and verifiably perjurable already in August. Why all of that was not done, I, I can't answer. Okay. Um, so I want to turn to, to uh, and, and obviously rightfully so, as you also indicated, uh, the, the first and primary focus has been on G4S. As the inspecting judge, have you, uh, when you took office or thereafter, uh, taken the trouble to, to sort of analyze and dissect that relationship between DCS and the, the two private companies who are their partners in these private public private partnerships that, that do exist it, it's it's if I may say it it's an extremely opposite question it was one of the first things which concerned me uh, because I had visited uh, Mangong Max when I was in the Supreme Court of Appeal in Bloemfontein uh, as an inspection at that time there was litigation brought by the Center for Applied Legal Studies at WITS in order to get the contract. The minister, I know, was equally concerned about this. What exactly were the terms that the, his predecessors uh, in government in 2002 subjected the public to? We got uh, the, the litigation by Kells eventually got a copy of the, the, the contract with G4S and its associated holding and other companies heavily redacted. It took out all the financial information and other uh, Im important uh, um, items. So it, it's a long answer to your question, sir, but yes, we were concerned, we were interested, 
uh, it, 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 it's been a matter of deep concern to us. And I think perhaps the root cause of the problem was that contract uh, concluded uh, nearly 25 years ago. Okay, and then in terms of let's, let's park the, the financial aspects. I mean, there's lots of arguments out there uh, as it is, whether that's value for money and then seemingly people seem to forget that ultimately a, a very valuable piece of infrastructure will, will be, be, be that of, of the state or the department. But in terms of the, the contractual agreement, uh, would you agree that it does not sketch a situation where uh, DCS is without uh, authority or power ultimately and as a consequence also without responsibility? Correct, sir. And, and that is uh, the, the power that the minister exercised uh, in order to, to, to withdraw uh, management power from, from uh, G4S. Mm. So therefore it, it wouldn't be correct to ultimately say uh, we were dependent on, on G4S primarily to, to investigate and, and while we, we've done an investigation and we've removed controllers uh, because that, that's where our failure lie uh, from a perspective of the responsibility of DCS, it's, it's not as simple as that in terms of the contract, would you agree? It's not as simple as that. Thank you. Okay. Um, and from, from looking at the perspective of your, let's say, your, your core mandate, and, and specifically the use of the word corruption there, would you agree that 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 specific term within the context of a public-private partnership uh, would become very important whenever you deal with an investigation uh, of this of this nature, focusing on an institution where there is this public-private partnership. Exactly right, sir. And to what extent have you, in your investigation, uh, focused on that? Considerably, uh, as, as the committee has heard, we have two on-the-ground uh, independent correctional centre visitors at Mangong, uh, together with their colleagues at Khritfle, which is adjacent. Uh, and as I indicated, there, there's, there's a whistleblower who recently and now I consider credibly uh, has made the most astonishing revelations, uh, allegations that the warders seize the cell phones in cell A and then sell them uh, on that same occasion, uh, make sales in cell B. Uh, things which seem beyond credence but which are no longer beyond credence. So we have been greatly concerned, we have been burdened by this and we rightly embrace it as part of our responsibilities. Okay, so that would hopefully lead to, to further outcomes, but, but in terms of your investigation of this unnatural death as it, took, as it, I think, originated, to what extent did your ICCVs and, and information from within the centre itself assist, if at all? It definitely did assist, and Ms. Danao Matumi, who until we brought in Mr. Oduleng Takadu, she was highly attentive to that. She's our Bloemfontein investigator, and she was attentive to that. And her preliminary report, which put us on warning, as, as uh, Ms. Breitenbach has rightly pointed out, from uh, the course of the month of August, uh, that indicated her conclusions on that score. There must have been massive, uh, it was put yesterday, this is an extraordinarily intricate operation which must have involved far more than only the G4S officials on, on site that night. Uh, we heard yesterday uh, how it involved months of preparation, pl pr probably false, false starts with, with uh, yesterday in, in the examination of in Technitron. Weren't all those uh, switch-offs uh, preparatory? Weren't, weren't, weren't Bester's previous uh, uh, sick calls preparatory uh, to seeing this done? So we were acutely aware that there must have been uh, uh, extensive corruption, both laterally 
and hierarchically. And we, this committee started yesterday getting to the bottom of that. Okay. Um, on your um, timeline, uh, and I just want to understand this properly, uh, in respect of the 18th of October, the statement is, is made that SAPS requests JIX's assistance in securing the expert assistance of the Directorate for Priority Crime Investigations, or the, the Hawks. Could you maybe just explain what happened there? Mr. Chair, I wish that some of the questions weren't being asked. Uh, they, they, it's internal to SAPS. They, there was some doubt uh, about the proficiency and alacrity being brought to bear by the uh, local investigative uh, 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 team by SAPS. That's why when, when, when we met them, the uh, seven people in charge, uh, it was incontestably impressive to see that all of them were on top of the nuances uh, and, and uh, were able to answer the questions that Ms. Motumi especially was putting with Mr. Takadu to them. So it was to do with, with nuances of, of uh, intra-institutional responsibility, trust, and, and conduct. Okay, but from where I'm sitting, I, I'm finding it strange that if you, as a, let's say, a, a, a station-level investigative team, find that you, you, you might need some more specialized assistance from within the structure that you ultimately feel that you, you're dependent on another role player to, to make that happen. I mean... Uh, we do find ourselves in that position that, that, that our good officers or our, our trusted officers are sought in this way by members of the public, by inmates and, and by, by uh, government officials. I, I don't find it uh, extraordinary. Okay. Unless I'm missing the nuance of your question, sir. Yeah, no, the, let me put it in a simple way. If, if I, as the, as the investigating officer, find that you, I'm out of my depth, what prevents me from asking my, my commanding officer that we involve the Hawks? Why should you ask the inspecting judge to make that happen? So I can think of many, many, many reasons. <laughs> and would one of the reasons being that you, you, you uncover that there's, uh, we've talked about corruption, uh, involvement of, of uh, people, not only those officials who work at GFS, but possibly even a, a broader scheme or a bigger scheme of corruption. Would one of the possible reasons being that, that you feel that, that ultimately this is, so to speak, above your pay grade? And did you get that sense? Honorable Hon, you are left with 10 minutes. Thank you, Chair. The chairperson saves me. Uh, uh, 10 minutes. I, I so didn't. No, no, sir. Uh, I, 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 I can't truthfully say I did. But the, one of the difficulties of restoring trust in the whole administration of justice, including the judiciary and the NPA and the police, is that there is evidenced low levels of, of public trust uh, in the police. Uh, it's, it's, often, it's, a, it's a cliche that there are many police officers, and we met them, we have some of them here this morning, uh, who stood up earlier, who are doing a, a competent and courageous job, but there are many who are not. Thanks. Um, let me uh, use that uh, to touch base with you regarding the last aspect, and I, I, I don't want to uh, prod, a, uh, obviously, a, a sore point too much. I think my colleague did, did much to, to solicit from you uh, the fact that quite possibly you should have brought the committee on board earlier. Uh, but, however, I just want to go back to your report of the 30th of November. Uh, I've had a re-look at it because, as you, as you would be aware, I think you were part of a bench that, that chastised Parliament 
heavily about uh, our inefficiencies in, in respect of oversight. Um, now, the way it's, it's been reported, apart from the fact that it's uh, slotted in there with, uh, in between uh, 10 other investigations, it's, uh, it was said that the name of the reporters more than meets the eye, which is um, uh, quite um, apt in the circumstances. But then, and that's now end of November, it says, inmate burned to death in a single cell. Now, by end of November, of course, that would clearly be factually incorrect. Um, was this a conscious decision or just an oversight? Well, you, you're offering me the way out. It certainly was an oversight, and, and it's sort of sogenaamd, inmate. Maybe we should have put it in, in quotation marks. But uh, your, your, your point, it, it's a, it, it's a if, if, you don't, if I don't sound patronized, it's a good point. And, and I, 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 it certainly wasn't conscious <coughs> we're going to stick to, definitely not. But yeah. it's a good point. Thank you. And then the, the last issue is this. Um, and I mean, it's, it's now well documented. And, and um, I, I, I don't want to detract from it that, that in this country, we're heavily dependent on investigative journalism to, to uncover um, improprieties, if I, if I must uh, use a, a, a euphemistic term. Um, but given the fact that, that uh, you're well aware of, uh, and you just now referred to the lack of trust in, in other role players within the administration of justice value chain, Given the fact that there's also a fairly low level of trust in this legislature and its ability to, to exercise effective oversight, uh, do you think it was fair to the legislature for you to, to rather involve investigative journalists than the, the legislature as a first point of, of let's say, escalation with, within within the system? Another good point, sir. Uh, or both. Looking back. Because it was at about the time that we were putting together, and the person responsible for putting the report together is, is, is Ms. Cupido, and I finalize it. Uh, after it's been through the CEO and his team, I finalize it. Uh, uh, both. That, that, that should have been, and both could have been done. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Juan. Uh, members, can we take a comfort break for 10 minutes?
I think we can start. Just before we start, I think something I committed a grave uh, mistake. Uh, I should have dealt with this issue yesterday. Uh, there are people that we did not thank who have made it possible that this meeting proceeds. That is the committee secretariat and the legal services and the secretary to parliament and the speaker. Um, they worked through Good Friday, um, 24 hours. Uh, I think it's important that we should really say that uh, without their hard work, uh, we wouldn't be here uh, from yesterday and today. Uh, thank you very much to, to the Secretariat, the content advisors, the legal advisors, the speaker, because without her instruction to the Secretary to Parliament, those subpoenas would not have come out, and to the Secretary uh, himself for acceding to our request at a very short notice. Um, I think it's important on our side to express uh, a word of gratitude uh, to them. Um, Honorable Thank you very much, Chairperson. And also thank you, Judge Cameron and your team for this presentation. That was very simple and clear for one to follow as you have put it. Uh, good morning, everybody. Chair, I think I'll start with uh, the question. I wanted to find out uh, from the judge uh, your chronological events of, of your engagements with SAPS, DCS, and <coughs> G4S. I'm, I'm looking at your your dates from the first one, which is the 5th of May. No? Is it the 5th or the 3rd? Until the, I can't see properly, I don't have spectacles. The 5th, 25th, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, this information from th these dates, it was dur uh, during the time when you were doing investigations. Uh, on the matter was due to you doing investigation on this, on the matter. Uh, Madam, I, I apologize profoundly for, for the distraction. Could you just repeat the last part of your sentence? And I'm saying the, the dates, the chronological uh, events that you have put here from the first, from the first date of May, which is the third one, until the 25th. I just wanted to find out, it is during the time when you were doing your own investigation when they give you this information. Exactly, ma'am. Okay. Uh, we, 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 the, the way it works is we've got a mandatory unit, which is based in Cape Town at the moment. It's being moved up to HQ in Johannesburg. And the death was reported to them uh, by the controller almost immediately. That, that's what we clarified yesterday, and then reported uh, some seven or eight days later by, by G4S. Uh, then that unit alerts Mr. D'Souza that there's been a death, and Mr. D'Souza immediately was suspicious because his, 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 uh, his uncertainty and alarm was activated in May already because there'd never been uh, a death by fire in Mangong. This is a facility of, uh, uh, that is rightly lauded as being top class, single cell. <clears throat> How do you commit suicide in a single cell uh, by fire? By putting the mattress on top of yourself. 
So uh, it was the first, it was a, a remarkable event in and of itself. So we started then, and Ms. Mutumi, uh, under Mr. D'Souza's direction, was investigating from that date. Thank you. In your uh, preliminary, pre preliminary report, you indicate that uh, this information should, be, should not be made public. And when I read also somewhere here, uh, also when you met with uh, DCS, they also said the information must not be public. Even the subs with the issue of, of the DNA, they said the information must not be public. So my question is, could it be maybe uh, the reason for the delay? Because uh, I don't want, because everybody, you said, uh, you said it yourself that uh, it should be public and is confidential. So does it mean that everybody treated this thing the same way you, 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 you took it? Uh, that is correct, Madam Honorable Member. Uh, the, the hope was, and my surmise was, that by keeping it confidential, there'd be uh, activation of, 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 a, of a recovery spot to put him back behind bars. So th there were real reasons to keep it confidential at that stage. But by towards the end of September, already it became uh, uh, evident to me, I wouldn't say clear, but it became evident to me that we needed some element of publicity, Mr. Horn and Ms. Uh, your, your colleagues, uh, honorable members, have, have indicated to me that I should have perhaps written to, to uh, Mr. Bulani Magwanisha, the honorable chairperson, as well at that time. And, and I, 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 I take the blame for not doing so. But at that point, there was a genuine reason that you could jeopardize uh, delicate SAPS uh, investigations and recoveries uh, by alerting him or by alerting the co-conspirators by alerting the people within G4S who must have uh, facilitated this. Okay, thank you. Uh, Follow-up question on that one. Could this be the reason why? Because now it, it comes out as if the department did not do anything, DCS, they were reluctant in, in speeding up issues, the minister and all that. Could this be the reason to everybody that everyone was treating this matter with caution? Yes, it, it is the reason, ma'am, but uh, it, it's also a reason for criticism, as, as I've indicated. Uh, so while I think that hindsight is, is an infallible wisdom after the event, uh, I also think that all of us should have moved more smartly. But there were reasons at the time for disbelief, for caution, for, for moving uh, e even the, the investigative journalists were gobsmacked. They were astounded. It, it just seemed beyond any form of credence, like the presidential jet for, for the Bushiris. Uh, who, who would believe it? Maybe that's more credible than, than, than what happened here. So there were those reasons, but at the same time, even giving those reasons full weight, we should have been smarter. And now I think in, in the line of the chair opening this uh, a, a session, this in thanking uh, the, 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 the committee, we must also thank the journalist for alerting the country about this matter. Would you agree? Very, 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 very uh, firmly and devoutly, I agree. Thank you. Okay. Uh, in your report, there is, uh, when you were doing your investigation, there were groups of whistleblowers. Uh, I can't say whistleblowers exactly at this moment, but I'm saying the people that you spoke to, those who gave you information, the officials, G4S, is it G, G4S uh, uh, officials, and then uh, at the center. The inmate, who else uh, gave you information? There, there was a, an official who has a pseudonym who wrote to, to the deputy minister. 
a two-line message uh, making sensational allegations without corroboration and without any references, without anything. And, and uh, my respectful view is that if I get something like that in my inbox, it's very difficult to know what to do with it. Uh, it's like saying that, uh, you know, President Ramaphosa has landed on the moon. Uh, what, what do you do with it? You, you uh, aren't given uh, um, um, details. But it is correct that, that we were supplied with very helpful and important information uh, by whistleblowers from within who felt that their lives were in danger after they, they wrote to us. And in two cases, we facilitated relocation of, of those two inmates uh, who supplied us with information. Okay, thank you. Could you say that uh, if we can handle this issue of uh, the whistleblowers mm. in the center mm. properly and give them that comfort that if you pr come forward and give us this information, you can get more information? Because I asked yesterday the gentleman, the G4S, about the whistleblowers. They could not answer that one. Uh, could you maybe say something about that, that maybe we can get to the bottom of this information if you can do something with the whistleblowers in the center? Uh, I don't have much to add to what you've said, ma'am, uh, but I, I do think that if there were an assured way of protecting whistleblowers at all levels of our, the corruption in our national life, we would all be much better off. Uh, uh, it's a, a well-established matter of record that whistleblowers uh, are, are, are given insufficient protection and there should be much, much more done for that, also in correctional centres. Okay. No, I, was, I wanted only in particular in this case because we want people to come forward and we want people to know that uh, they are protected and they will be safe. But um, let's, let's go to the next one. There is somebody in your report that you are saying is um, the official by you call that person is it the official by the name of snowy uh, i've uh, written it somewhere yes who is this person i, I think it, it's it's a it's an anglicization of the first name of mr snowy motswara that's what i inferred but we were only told uh, from the whistleblower that it's snowy but we may find that the gentleman who's now on trial with the father of Dr. Magadumana is, is colloquially known as Snowy. Oh. So now I want to know, yesterday when I opened my questions, I, I did mention the issue of the code of the judges. And from the report here, I did say that, yes, they gave us a very beautiful quote and the good things that uh, how the, the building looks and all those things, but they don't tell us exactly what is it that they know inside. And in your report, you mentioned judges. Could, because the names came out yesterday about those judges, those, the, the one that uh, Honorable Janji made a follow-up on. I want to know, because in this report, we still get these judges. Do we have information uh, about their report on this matter? Because it, it seems as if you, there were two judges. Is it the same judges? Because from the names I, I got it, it was like the same judges. So it means these judges could, they must give more, in, they, they might give us more information on this issue. Is it possible? Thank you, ma'am. I, I don't think these judges will be able to. The uh, Judge Tehran visited Mangong as part of the Constitutional Court's prison visits program. We are hoping, with the backing of the new Chief Justice, to get that prison visits program extended to all judges and all High Court divisions and all uh, uh, um, uh, magistrates' divisions as well, because magistrates are allowed to visit prisons within their jurisdiction. So Judge Tehran's visit was done as part of a regular uh, constitutional court. Uh, all judges in the constitutional court, as part of the program, are asked to visit prisons every year. The, the, visits by, the visit by Judge Nokutula Daniso, Daniso 
and Judge Ilza van Rijn was mandated by Judge President Cagney Moussi of the Free State after the whistleblower wrote to him. And they went there, and then Judge Danisa wrote privately to me. And that is what I furnished uh, to, to ground up uh, at, at around about that, that same time, after not asking her permission, but, uh, but, but mentioning to her what I was planning to do out of, out of respect to her, but not seeking to implicate her. Uh, then they delivered a report later uh, on the 21st of December, and that report is what G4S quotes from. Thank you. So does it mean also themselves they, 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 they were disappointed by the fact that there is a missing video tape? The, the ultimate report of judges Daniso and Van Rijn doesn't record any contentious details. Thank you. Uh, I just want to find out from you would you agree by now that uh, this investigation will never go even, uh, will, will have difficulties even in court without that information of the tape, which is, I believe, is with the officials of G4S? I think there's going to be more and more and more proof and more and more uh, exposure of all those involved and that's why it's, it's good work on the part of the NPA and the police to bring uh, those two people before court because one of them might be a source of, of more information as to who was involved. I don't believe that the operational officials that night or even the overseers were uh, fully responsible for what happened. I think there must have been a far, far larger operation involving many people uh, inside G4S and outside G4S. So uh, I, I, I think that there is a lot of proof and I think there will be more proof and that's why this sitting of the committee and that's why the chastisement of me by uh, your colleagues for, for not bringing this committee in six months ago uh, is justified because this committee process uh, is, is, is cleaving open uh, the, 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 the facts that that, that occurred and will continue to do, to do so. But we still, Judge Cameron, we still don't have the tape. Have you asked G4S when you were doing investigation there that this tape is important and we want it? it yes, ma'am. It must come. Yes, ma'am. We, we were very insistent on that. And because of the plug being pulled out, the crucial cameras were all off. For, for nine hours, 38 minutes, uh, from 7.38 that evening until four the next morning. So it, it is ludicrous that, that you've got the system that works always except when you need it. So we, we immediately asked for the tape. I, I had an experience in the Constitutional Court during the, the Zuma presidency, something on which you and I have, have had an exchange here before, when my desktop was stolen under extremely suspicious circumstances from the Constitutional Court. I hope that those who stole it were hoping to find all sorts of strange things on it because there was nothing, uh, 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 because of the way the court works. But that night too, the Constitutional Court has got this marvelous uh, um, a camera system with backup recordings, and this one isn't uh, 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 DVS tapes. This one is, is on... on, on uh, on hard drive disks. And miraculously, the only camera that wasn't working that night was the one covering my, my chambers. So uh, I've had experience with this. I, I knew that when we got these first reports that, those, that, that, that that camera footage will be missing. And that's still the case now. The, ca the, the crucial camera footage is missing, but I'm confident that despite that, uh, in answer to your question, there will be sufficient evidence to bring a large number of co-perpetrators to book. Thank you. Um, yes, I agree with you. There will be a lot of information coming in assisting this. But that portion, that part that is missing is the, uh, from the discussion here, it looks like it, it is key. Uh, I just want to find out, there is an allegation 
that the, the Mr. John, with the surname that I can't mention, maybe uh, they will assist me as they assisted me yesterday, that uh, uh, before he left, he went to that room. Do you, and uh, there is no record of him going to that room before he left, immediately before he left. So we don't have even that record that says he was there. Uh, my question would be, could it be prop, uh, uh, possible that maybe he was going to give instruction that don't forget that uh, within this time frame this should happen? It's a question. It, it is possible, ma'am, um, and I'm unable to assist further than to say it, it might have happened. Honourable Chair, you. you are left with 10 minutes. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to find out, would you agree that um, DCS trusted G4, G4S and that trust was broken to a point that even today there is a litigation between the two parties. Could we say that the relationship is no longer there? This marriage must just end. What is your view on that? Uh, I would say so. I would say that the breaches have been outrageous. I do agree that DCS trusted G4S, but I also think for the reasons that have been debated with me previously that there could have been more alacrity uh, in, in supervision and in, in, uh, in, in, in kicking the right portions of the anatomy from the DCS side. Is it not ironic for the G4AS to take the DCS, in fact, uh, uh, to be in log ahead this way with the DCS. Uh, uh, when DCS is expecting much from them, even to this point, they have not even complied in terms of accountability to bring forth information that we are sitting here about. Is it not ironic to you, uh, Judge, and the team? I'm, I'm, I might be missing your nu nuance, Madam, but uh, it, it, is, it is paradoxical that there's a, a clash between these two uh, 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 contractual partners who should be in harmony uh, in, in securing uh, criminals inside correctional facilities that those facilities are well run uh, and their, their respective responsibilities on both sides which uh, weren't fully maintained. Oversight on the DCS part and simple operational efficiency and integrity and, 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 and uh, uh, care on the part of G4S. But perhaps I'm missing uh, your nuance. Uh. No, I think I, 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 my last question, Chair, on this one, it is on the issue of the value for money, and uh, Honorable Horn asked it, but I will put it this way. Would you agree with me that the G4S are here only for money, nothing else? Thank you, Chair. That was my last question. Thank you, ma'am. You're asking me for a view on a, a, a huge public issue, which I, 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 I will give. I wouldn't have given it while I was on the bench. I'm very much in favor of public-private partnerships. We were trying for years on the Constitutional Court to get a public-private partnership to get Constitution Hill developed. And we came almost to the point with parliamentary backing, with President uh, Mutlante's backing in, 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 in the, at the end of, of, of his tenure, his seven-month month tenure. So I think properly supervised, properly negotiated, uh, uh, we, we can do a great deal together in the public sector uh, with, with, uh, with, with properly managed uh, private enterprise ingenuity and very hard work. 
So that's my view, ma'am, since you asked it. But I, I see Ms. Yaka has put her hand in the heads, uh, <laughs> her head in her hands, so I hope it's not because of, of my, my, my entrepreneurial streak. But that's my view. Thank you for no, asking no, it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Jala. Uh, you have saved uh, seven minutes. I hope it will not be expropriated. Uh, Honorable Janji. Uh, no, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, if I save time, it can be given to my deputy. Uh, <laughs> so that will be shared. Who is the deputy? Ola. Um, <laughs> thank, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, Maybe before I invite the inspecting judge, Judge Cameron, just to indicate this point, Chair, my preoccupation. Uh, I think uh, the, the central point of what we're doing, I want to repeat the point, that ours is about uh, checking the functionality of the institutions that we have and the effectiveness of the systems within those institutions. Um, and, and, and that's, I carry that uh, throughout, so, throughout so that we don't lose the focus. Um, we, we can easily lose focus on many other issues that are incidental to the real work that we need to do. And, and, and for that, I want to start with an appreciation commentary um, to Jigs. Uh, and maybe for those who don't know, so Jix is a, a, an institution that has got a very modest budget. This current uh, financial year, Jix operates from a budget of 78 million, having to monitor a multi-billion institution of over 23, 25 billion in the correctional services. Uh, that's up by 2 million from the previous year. Now that, but that is Jix. Um, but when you read the report of Jigs presented here, it, it is very clear that the takeoff from the point when they started, and I think that's the 5th of May, there's, there's what I call a consistently uh, cursed manner of doing things with limited resources, um, which says to you the issue is not how big the size is. Their agility to do the work that they need to do and get results out of that. It's a lesson kind of uh, uh, going forward. Because they, and on the 10th of October, August 2022, they would have drove to even the established multidisciplinary team where all role players were brought in based on their consistent insistence on how they want to do work. Um, and, and, and that's that's really the appreciation I want to, 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 to say. This is good work that you have done. It's demonstrated uh, throughout the process. And, and I don't know, maybe the, the only question I can ask there is, could this have been a, a better and, and quicker uh, process with a differently positioned and designed chick? Just your quick take on that should be an easy one. Wow. Thank you very much, Honourable Member. I think so. I think so. We are battling for Jix's final autonomy and independence for an extension of its powers, an extension of its powers so that we don't want to command uh, DCS or its, 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 its contractors what to do, but we want to know why they don't follow our recommendations. That will be built into the bill that will come to this committee. Uh, but the answer, sir, is, is very definitely with a repurposed, enhanced, and slightly, we're asking for, for very little, uh, which eventually we, we persuaded uh, Minister Godongwana and, and, and his Treasury to give us. With a very little enhancement of budget, we'll be able to do a lot more. Thank you, sir. Okay. We, we will be here, walk that journey together. Maybe just a, a few... Uh, quick pickups. I'm hoping that you'll you'll be able to deal that if you can. Just the first quick point uh, as part of your work. 
and, and I would have asked this uh, visitor register here, um, do you know when the last time the notorious doctor visited the prison, the correctional center? It, it was very shortly before the escape, if I'm right. Um, Mr. Mr. Leonard D'Souza and Mr. Takadu will quickly pass the answer to me. I, I can pause for that so they can pass that answer. Thank you, Chair, Honorable Members, <coughs> IJ and CEO. Uh, according to the reports that we received from G4S, the last visit of Dr. Nandi Pa, it was around April 2022. 2022. You can find out the exact date. I'm interested in the exact date. I'm interested in the exact date. I will give you to, not now, okay. to assist us with that. Was, I think uh, it's part of your oversight work that you do, and I think you would have picked that up. There. Hence, I'm posing the questions to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Just, just to confirm on record, you have confirmed in your presentation that uh, you were informed um, on the 5th of May on this, as compared to what was on record yesterday from G4S who said you were informed on the 9th of May. We so, were informed by the, contro the DCS controllers. Through them, we were informed of the death. And then later, by G4S. Confirmed, sir. OK. Thank you. Th that helps. My next point that I want to go to, it's important for me because I sat here listening to you walking away with Honorable Horn and Honorable Breitenbach on this issue. And you're leaving me behind because I'm just not with you on this. You're walking away, and you've even concluded that that walk away is justified. So here's the point. It is correct that in the two quarterly reports, you would have put on record, actually, not even on detail, to the portfolio committee about the matter of Tabo Pesta, um, this inmate. But in both reports, so that I, I, I'm with you, to just to start there, that putting on record had to do with the mysterious deaths in the cell of these inmates and nothing to do with an escape. Am I right? The, the because in all of those two reports, you would not have put on record that you have found that he had escaped. You put on record that uh, there is a process to investigate uh, the whereabouts, the circumstances at, of, of the alleged death of Tabo Besta in both the quarterly reports. Am, am, I, am I correct in that understanding? Because we have to situate things here properly. I think, sir, that the one leads to the other. Once you see that the body is not his, you've got to ask, where is he now? I'm, I'm, I'm not there yet. I'm working towards that, but I don't want to assume that. So my starting point is that your reports to us, hence there would not have been a discussion. It was saying, we're busy with this investigation. On, on these alleged circumstances around his death. That's what the, those two quarterly reports were about, not about the escape from where I'm sitting. Uh, you're quite right, sir. It, it, it was the, a, a loose use of the Tabo Besta overview to, to, to discuss the mysterious events. And as, as was pointed out to me and I conceded earlier, we should have been more precise and we should have been more informative in those two quarterly reports. Okay. Now, I want to try and walk closer to the three of you, yourself, inspecting judge, and my two other colleagues, um, on, on this issue. I, I am of the firm view, and given your, your previous role, I suspect that you will be of that view. I, I would prefer uh, in an investigative process 
that uh, the satisfaction I will get in that investigation process is when matters are ventilated in court and, and somebody is found uh, in this way or that way, as compared to me um, highlighting something prematurely. Um, so in other words, do you succumb to a pressure during your investigation to just release incomplete information because that's, that's the first point perhaps before I, I, I proceed. If you have confidence that it will culminate in an appropriately speedy uh, judicial process, then you should shut up. But if you have doubts, and this is what I, we did have at Chicks, we were, we were grappling in... in and and in your the report court, I mean, shows doubts throughout uh, until it, the end. But if I may just answer, sir, ju uh, ju just the, the point that, that I think one, one, is, one, one should have recourse to Parliament and to trusted, responsible sources in the media as, as, a, as a propellant, to use a loaded term here. Uh, uh, so okay. Let, let me then indicate this to you, being part of this Justice Committee. If you were to come as the inspecting judge, uh, to our committee meeting and say, I, I, there's this, I'm not sure about this. This investigation is not complete. And you, you want to rush to report that to us. I would have serious problems with that kind of an approach that you do. I would be the first in that meeting. Do you, would, would, you, would you agree with me on that? I would agree if, if the significations and indications are inconclusive. But if you, by that stage, by late September, October, already have a post-mortem report and DNA, we don't know who the lady was who claimed she was Tabo West's mother. Out of respect for her, I, 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 I concede her, her claim. I'm not disputing that. We didn't know. If you have those two things, I think that you then are are under a potential obligation to secure the eventual judicial outcome that you put in prospect by using prods and incentives and propellants uh, via the public domain, including parliamentary oversight and including uh, 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 media of integrity. So th this is where, therefore, I, I stand that I would I would rather prefer and I would accept that uh, because this is why, why I want to close this gap. I am comfortable that I would get a report at a point when that report is ready. And, and, and when that is ready, it would not jeopardize both that process. You would not take a case to court where you are already losing it. Would, would, you, would you share that? I would, dear, uh, dear sir. Uh, forgive me, uh, uh, Mr. Honorable Mr. Danchi. Uh, I acted solo as inspecting judge. And I know I didn't ask my colleagues at JIC's permission. I didn't ask their approval. I do know, sitting here before Parliament, that what I was doing uh, made many of them extremely uncomfortable. This was not the JIC's way of doing it. Uh, and and uh, I know that they would agree with you, and I'm, I'm willing to accept criticism as well uh, for maybe not doing it differently, coming to this committee rather than going to the media. Uh, whatever the outstanding task is that, that, that ground up is fulfilled. So earlier on you'd have made a, what I would call a throwaway comment on this notorious doctor. This throwaway comment and I want to know if you, you, you're making that comment from a distance or it's based on particular evidence and facts. The comment is about she should have been charged for perjury and you don't know why that has not happened. What is that based no, on? Uh, no, no, sir, I, 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 the, the affidavit is crammed with falsehoods, uh, crammed with falsehoods about her relationship to him, there are, I can itemize at least 10 falsehoods. Now, one of the lacks, and, and maybe I can 
get my own back on, on Ms. Breitenbach, when she was a senior figure in, in the NPA. There yes. weren't enough prosecutions for perjury. We were having in the Joburg High Court, we were having people fabricating divorce certificates, which has enormous impacts, most, mostly on women, a gender uh, 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 leaning impact. And you bring a couple of those husbands and sometimes wives to a criminal court with a charge of perjury, uh, it will have a miraculous effect. So I, I was only in that context uh, saying that uh, you, could have, you could have gone after her even then. Okay. Well, we'll come to the subs. But just to conclude that point, both you and I are aware about society's uh, um, allergy towards cases that are taken to court and they are kicked out and people got out scot-free. Would you not give the benefit of the doubt uh, to that service that perhaps it would not have come to that point because there would be other variables that it had to consider? And would you still stand by your comment on that? Perhaps it was a, a throwaway comment. I think the general point I was making, sir, was that there was already ground to ask SAPs, when are you going to, to go after this, this uh, 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 publicly prominent, uh, glamorous doctor? Are you going to allow her to, to continue unscathed? The notorious doctor. Yes. You're calling so, it glamorous. That's cool. yes. it's okay. Glamorous. So, so there, there, were there were grounds at least to ask SAPs that, and then they could have given you an answer. Okay. Maybe they move to the next point, Chair. Um, so, so that you just educate us in terms of how jigs operate. Uh, you can take away the mangawonga away from this example now. We might come back to it. So how, how do you approach uh, the incident report? Sometimes it would include death of an inmate. So my, 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 my interest here is, do you first get, get a heads up from DCS that on this day, few hours ago, um, we had this incident and there's a death of this inmate. And secondly, does that get followed up with a submis submitted report? So that we, we, we work with you, we understand uh, the, 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 the road that Jigs navigates in all of these processes. I get weekly reports, sir, and we have a monthly exco meeting where these are rehearsed in detail, the figures, the stats. All suicides and all deaths are brought to my attention quickly. There are appeal processes which don't work properly in, in, in the uh, Correctional Services Act for people who are segregated and manacled. But all suicides they, and hunger strikes, I, I, I will be alerted immediately of a hunger strike somewhere in the Eastern Cape. So uh, I will be informed very, very quickly about that. Did that happen in Mangaung Correctional Center? We were you firstly given a heads up on the 3rd of May? I'm, and I'm then confident that it did. Sorry, sir, I, I interrupted. Go, go ahead. You got, you got me. We, you were able to read my mind. We, we're on the same page. I'm not offended. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm confident to say here that I was for, informed that week uh, I don't recall it, uh, but Mr. D'Souza can perhaps... And that work might include the 5th of May. That's what it is. I, I would think so, but I'll... May so I not on Mr. the day. May I ask Mr. D'Souza? Please do. Thank you. When he told me. Mr. D'Souza's uh, recollection is that he told me on the day that we received the report. On the 5th of May. Okay. Thanks. I, I hope it's not a struck frog. No, 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 make a I guess I'm not a frog. So, guards off. Please just lower your guards. <laughs> don't have to be, de don't, don't pull them up. Um, thank you. The, the, the next point, just to demonstrate I've moved uh, from that point. Uh, G4S, in their report yesterday, in their presentation, uh, it was, it's important for me 
to deal with this narrative. Because the narrative they presented here was that this is the, an ex excellent center. What happened with Tabo Besta was an outlier. It was an exception. This is a narrative we're creating here. And they top that narrative with a commentary of a judge, and I'll come to that, uh, how, how good that and positive that was two judges, as well as jigs uh, in, 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 in terms of this, in, 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 in the sense that in the top seven uh, correctional centers, jigs would have said they, they, they part of the best in that top seven. And I have no problem with that, um, it, because in, 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 in the field that we operate in, where there are difficult issues every day, there is a need to lift up those that are doing well. But the point here is, is your, firstly, when was your over, last oversight uh, visit to, to MCC? We, we were there uh, before the 30th of April I and all of that. At the end of, yes, sir, at the end of June 2021. Yeah, we, we visited Pretoria CMAX in the same week, the last week of June 2021. So it was one, uh, 11 months, before, 10 months before this occurred. And do you, do you want to comment on, on what was uh, attributed to you? Uh, your your assessment of the top seven uh, from you now, not from G4S. Let's hear Jigs saying this. So the 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 terrible conditions we see, and I remember Ms. Breitenbach uh, speaking about St Albans. Um, we 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 last visited uh, Durban Westville medium B and Peter Maritzburg medium A in the last month or so. Uh, Stanga as well and, and uh, but none of the symptomatic horrors which we saw in, in Durban medium B, we saw a cell design for between 19 and 31 people which contained 81 people and these are not remand detainees. Uh, we saw the flooding in, so I can go on and, and tell you the horrors that, that we often do see. None of these are present in Mangaung Max. From, from a structural point of view, it is a model prison. But what is the rot that your, your word yesterday, and I think it's an appropriate word, beneath that there is, 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 uh, there is functionality which is rotten. And uh, I agree with your statement yesterday that uh, the Tabo Besta wasn't a, a rare event, a black swan, an untoward uh, experience. It is symptomatic of a degradation of institutional authority, organizational cohesion, and management control. That could not have occurred without a significant degradation of almost every organizational and control function that you should have in a prison. But that's, I'm making the point that you made yesterday. Okay, uh, thank you. In, in fact, I've just glanced through the report of Judge Thrawn, who would have visited uh, that because something was picked up about a, a, a constitutional court judge um, and a, a particular court listed which must fit the narrative of everything is, is, is good and as good as, and, and nice here. One in the section on security, she goes into detail about the decay and the problems of gangsterism in the Manga Hongkor, in the same report. And I would have made the point yesterday that don't lift up that commentary uh, outside of what the content in the body of that report is saying. And then I hope members will be able to interact with that because as, as a committee, especially us as a subcommittee, will take particular interest in that. I'm making this point so that we're able to bury this narrative that the best thing was just an exception. We now know it was not an exception. It's modus operandi that is happening there in this beautiful place. 
Great, sir. Thank you. And, and so I'm going to leave yes, the time. Sir. The 10 minutes that you want to remind me is going to go to my uh, deputy. Um, and, and, and I'll pause there, but to indicate the point that I think when we go into deliberations, there are matters that we need to get into which have nothing to do with the team in front of us, which are more political matters that we debate as members. And I'm, I, I would want us not to get into those matters now. Uh, it's important that we don't do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Janche. Uh, Honorable Ramulu Beng. Um, Honorable Jele donated her seven minutes to you. I hope I use it well, Chair, because uh, Honorable Janji has donated to the deputy. Uh, Maybe you are a deputy to Honorable Janji. Uh, Honorable, Honorable Jele, yes. yes. I understand this thing of seniority. We seem to be juniors with, with all us, so seniors are donating time to us. Uh, it's, 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 been, it's been groomed well, Chair. Uh, and we take note of it. Chair, let me welcome the report and um, good afternoon to colleagues in the meeting and let's welcome the report from JICS led by Judge Cameroon. Um, Chair, at first when you, we, when you noted hands, I had a, a problem with coming after Honorable Janji. Uh, because if he seems to be sweeping everything that one wants to raise, leaves you with uh, little. Uh, because if he seems to be sweeping everything that one wants to raise, leaves you with uh, little few things you want to raise, and 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 I think I would understand basing that the seat you are actually sitting in has been sitting on it for quite some time with the section 194. So the reasoning uh, becomes somehow. But Chair, I would want to take it from where he would have raised, especially on Dr. Nandipa's records um, from JIX, um, in terms of the visitation to, to, to the Correctional Center. If we do have it, or if it was indeed recorded from the systems of G4S, and I would raise this, um, I don't think it was, Chair, I think the private visit that Honorable Ola mentioned yesterday when raising a question of clarity to um, G4S on the private visit, it was not administered. It was not booked. Uh, because if, if it was booked, it wouldn't be private. The records would be known. You would be able to draw in that report. And I say this because in my possession right now, I have something that confirms that the last visit the doctor made to the correctional center was on the 17th of December, 2021, recorded to G4S systems. And she further booked a visit again on the 14th of February, 2022, but she canceled that, 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 that booking. So my question is, um, I don't think you'll find it, um, Judge Cameron, that record. But if you do, do kindly furnish us with that, with that, with that record. Um, do you think perhaps this is possible that the way visits that were administered that are not locked in the G4S system, based on you, your internal investigation, and how you have been interacting with the MCC? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honourable Member. I'll, I'll have to check again. With, with our investigators, but we will come back to the committee with the verified log that, that, that we received and which I believe we based our response on. But your, it may well be that your uh, records are more accurate, but we will come back to the committee with, with a, a, a formal response. Thank you. We try by all means that when we sit here and question, we question on informed basis, not to bring things that we equally ourselves can't even get away with it. Uh, because of it makes no point of this. Um, there is another thing that, in this instance of the private visit, it was exposed by an inmate. Do you have any 
information on that or aware of that? I don't believe we do, ma'am. Okay, you don't. Because of, for me, what I have, Judge Cameroon, is that um, there is an inmate that saw the, the private visit to Tabo Bester on the 16th of April uh, that would have notified. I'm afraid of mentioning the name of the inmate. Um, uh, so I would, I, would, I would leave it at that. I'll privately share, but I don't want to. Um, and this inmate was transferred from the MCC to Fernaheng um, Prison. Are you aware of that? Yeah, we, we, we assisted uh, with the Deputy Minister and the National Commissioner. We assisted on a Friday night in getting that person. His, his name is known to me, uh, and it, it's in the Krunpunt Correctional Centre. So you are confirming that there is someone. No, I, I, I can't. I, I know that he gave that information, but we haven't confirmed it. So you are aware of the transfer of someone from the MCC to Fernaheim Prison. We helped facilitate it that on, on a Friday. It was the Friday, the seventeenth uh, of February, that that occurred, and and I was phoned at eight o'clock on the Friday evening by Ms. Toby Zodwa Sabuta, our head of regions, to say that the transfer had been effected, and the prisoner has, has subsequently written to say that to express his appreciation because he is now safe. He, he, he and another prisoner, whose name is also known to me, were of the view that, that their lives were in danger. Okay. So I'll take it. You, 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 you might be, you facilitated the process of transfer, but you might not know the, the basis of that transfer, what was it? I, I, exactly right. And I might be muddling up uh, instances, but I believe that we are, are resonating in, in these instances. We might find later, but we will come back to the committee if I'm muddling up the wrong instance. But you do confirm that the, the basis of transferring that inmate was on fearing for his life. Exactly. And on whistleblowing. Thank you. Uh, for me, that covers why the transfer happened. Um, Judge Cameron. The point was that he is the one that would have alerted on that private visit of, of, of Tabo Bester, of Dr. Nandipa to Tabo Bester, which G4S did not admit it, uh, administer that in their, in their system. Hence, you will not find the records for that visit. Um, Two weeks exactly before the walkout. Coincidentally. And she becomes the person that wants to collect the body um, immediately after um, the incident. Judge Cameron, they, you made mention, I read somewhere through the reports, I'm not sure you'd correct me whether it's three inmates or it's two inmates, that um, you would have officiated the transfers of them, bearing in mind fearing for their lives. Uh, in this regard, it was two inmates from, from Mango. What was the basis for them being transferred in fearing for that? This is excluding this one that I've, I would have mentioned now to fear nothing. It's including. Okay, what, is, what was the reason for the other one? In both cases, uh, the, in, the reason for the other one was also extensive whistleblowing allegations uh, of, of a, an astonishing nature, uh, after which the inmate told, it was also our investigator, uh, Ms. Deneo Mutkumi, uh, whom he told that he felt that he was in peril, because he actually gave names. He said, these are the four G4S employees who are doing this. Uh, uh, and, and, and then he perceived that his life was in danger and we helped him uh, get out of there. Okay. They with, with the assistance, sorry ma'am for interrupting, may I say, of, of uh, the executive authorities and the National Commissioner. There is, um, amongst the letters or the inmates that would have wanted to alert authorities on what would have been perceived uh, as a suicide to being a staged escape, and that has been led by inmates. There were claims from some inmates that um, they might have or would have witnessed the whole incident, and to such an extent that led to them being transferred because of they would have been feared for their lives. Are this part of the two that we have explained, or this is a separate process? I might be wrong, but I think that is the inmate who said that he was downstairs and able through the, 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 the post box uh, view of, uh, from his cell to, to, to be able to see upstairs. 
and he gave an extensive report uh, about uh, the, how the, the fire was ex post facto. Uh, f uh, of, uh, it, it occurred after uh, the various goings on in the cell. Then there was a conflagration uh, at, at a later time. We haven't fitted all of that in to the, 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 the detailed timeline yet, and that's one of the reasons why a full report was quite intricate to, to provide. But, but uh, I think it's the same inmate. Is the same one with the two that we've just spoken of right now? Yes, I think so. But I'm, I'm suddenly, uh, I'm getting more hesitant. Yes, I think so. So you're not sure? Yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm moderately confident, but not entirely sure. You did your own investigations. You did have, um, based on your report, you did um, interview inmates and officials of the G4S or the MCC, um, and this was conducted on the 19th to the 21st of October. So I'm assuming when we raise this, you would be able to, to give um, a sense and, and a chronology of events of that. Bearing on those interviews of inmates, what was your findings? Um, or what is it that you found conclusive out of it? Our finding was uh, very clearly that there was skullduggery occurring in and around that cell, that there was skullduggery preceding it in the way that uh, Bester was placed in that cell at late notice. Uh, there was skullduggery preceding the fire uh, and after the fire. Uh, and uh, the discharge, for example, of the fire extinguisher, uh, all of that was extremely suspicious. Uh, so that, that, uh, those were our conclusions, that, that there was uh, um, markedly, demonstrably untoward incidents preceding, during, and after the alleged uh, suicide of Tabo Besta. In one of the interviews with the inmates, or in when you were interviewing inmates, especially those who were at that Broadway, um, did you, can you confirm the claims that says inmates were forced to come in and clean uh, the scene immediately after the fire broke and there was hot water used in cleaning up? I think um, Saps would, would, would in detail tell us um, if that the tempering of evidence in terms of the scene would have occurred. But I want from your side when you interviewed inmates, has that some of the inmates make mention of that because there are claims that says they were they were called to clean up that scene and used hot water to um, and and that would have led to some of them fearing for their lives from officials of G4S. Um, are Madam you able to confirm if that would have happened? With the permission of the chair, I'd like to defer to Mr. Takadu. Uh, I believe the answer is yes, but I'd ask him to answer if I may. Thank you, IJ. Uh, honorable members, yes, there are evidence from inmates that uh, the inmates were used to clean cell 35 with hot water before SAPS arrived. How many inmates were they? It's only one inmate statement that is confirming that. And where is the inmate right now? Still is he still detained in MCC or is transferred somewhere else? Still detained at MCC. So we, we, we haven't found out that um, officials would have tried to brutalize him um, since there are some inmates that would have indicated that they are being threatened by officials for coming forth with information. With regards to that said inmate. No, ma'am. You're not sure? Not sure. we, we, we don't have information indicating that, and that the particular source is still in Mangong. And that, that information will be uh, included in the finalized version of the report. There is um, the inmate that was moved from cell 35. <clears throat> I have the name of the inmate. I think yesterday I even made a request from G4S to provide us with those details because we have a sequence of when he was moved in Broadway 
the reasons why he was moved to Broadway, which cell was moved into until ultimately that led to him being in cell 35 and to move um, again for when Tabo Bester was put in. Um, are you aware of that sequence of events of that inmate? Uh, of Tabo Bester? The inmate that was, was moved, moved in South 35 to accommodate Bester. I'm not aware of that. Uh, but we know that there was an inmate moved and we, know, we have sources that say, and it, I think that's included in our report, that the removal of that inmate in order to accommodate Bester in that conveniently placed cell was seen as untoward. We don't know why the uh, previous occupant suddenly lost all his fear on a Saturday night of his previous uh, cell. Why, why, mm. why was he suddenly willing on a Saturday night to be relocated, a long weekend Saturday night? So uh, all of this is regarded by inmates and by Jicks as being quite untoward and suspicious. You know the inmate's name. You are aware of who is that inmate? Do you know who is that inmate? The name is Eric that you are having in our report. I'm saying, but do you know, let's, let's avoid mentioning inmates' names for their own safety because of we still have G4S operating the MCC. Let's just move away from that because they are inmates that have been moved on a bearing on an issue that they're fearing for their lives. That's why they've been moved out of the center. I have the names, so let's just avoid. The issue, the question is, do you know the name of the inmate that was moved from South 35 to accommodate Tabo Bester? Yes, we know. With your permission, ma'am, may I uh, ask, ask just to interrupt? The, our records show that Dr. Magurumana, her last recorded visit was on the 17th of December 2021. She had an appointment to visit on the 14th, Valentine's Day, of February last year, 2022, and that visit was allegedly cancelled. That's what I said. That's what I've raised. I'm, I'm with apologies, just uh, correcting what, what, what information I passed on earlier. Thank you for confirming that, that the information I have is quite correct. I'm not equally misled. Um, You, don't, you didn't think that it would be prudent for you to inquire with the inmate, since you know who he is, that what led to him cancelling his, his reasons of going to segregation in the first place? Definitely it would be, ma'am. And if we haven't done it adequately until now, we will certainly follow up because it's highly suggestive. The inmate that wrote to the president subsequent to the minister, are you aware of that inmate? We, we've seen that uh, in media reports. Those, those letters were never passed on to us. We told that Jix was CC'd. Uh, and the, the averment is that those letters were, were never passed on by G4S. Uh, we haven't seen those letters. We're aware of the media reports describing them. You have not seen the content of the letter in actual fact? We haven't. You have no idea who that inmate is? As I sit here, no, ma'am. Did we try to get that info from the GFO staff, especially the lady that would have responded to, to that letter? The, the media reports, if I'm correct, were in the last week or 10 days, uh, and, and we haven't, to my, the best of my knowledge, followed up in, the, in that period. You, 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 when you started speaking, you made mention of how officials of G4S um, are playing part in smuggling of drugs, um, contrabands, all those things. Um, did you try to at least inform SAPS or DCS in, 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 in what you would have found in the, in the center? Or you assume it's happening, activities that are happening? I do assume because that is our, our regular process, uh, yes. Uh, I, I assume that that is done because that is what we ordinarily will do. You have done? Yes. So, so I'm assuming that that is what we have done now. So my answer is a lawyer's answer of some ambiguity, but yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> Judge Cameron, I'm not familiar with the law side of things. 
Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to take part on it anytime soon, so I'd prefer to say for you to confirm yes or no, um, so that we, I equally am able to be able to make follow-ups or not on that matter, um, with, with, with due respect. Um, so I would, I would take it that yes, you would have informed SAPS and DCS on that process um, of your, of what you might think is happening. It was alleged that one of the inmates or some of the inmates would have made mention that um, Tabo Bester was equally dealing in, in, in inside the center, selling stuff. Uh, there's way I read as well that on the, on the actual day of the incident, he had a lot of money on top of his bed um, whilst he's having his laptop and so forth and so on. Um, do you perhaps think what officials were smuggling in, it has a link with, with, with Tabo Bester or they were, their dealings are, uh, are linked or they were dealing together in that sense? We, we know from our meeting with the on-the-ground G4S personnel in Bloemfontein on the same day that we met SAPS, uh, the last question I asked them right at the end of our meeting was, was Tabo Besta a powerful figure in this uh, facility? And they both said instantly yes, uh, the, 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 the two officials present. And the, the one official afterwards indicated to us that Tabo Besta had made enormous amounts of money while inside. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why I think that uh, the, the question uh, put to G4S yesterday about the video appearance at the Santon Convention Center in 2018 was so significant because he was continuing, and that's why Ms. Uh, uh, Ms. Ms. Breitenbach's anxieties are so pertinent because he was carrying on his fraudulent activities from in, within the center and making, as you've indicated, ma'am, a huge amount of money. That, that, that certainly uh, was, was signaled to us by the, 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 the two G4S officials that, 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 that we quizzed in early February this year. Thank you. With, 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 you would have made mention when we started that um, Tabo Bester has been tried to be moved three times and so forth into segregations and so forth and so on. When you, you, you realize that there is a lot of movement, a movement around this particular inmate, um, didn't that trigger you to to investigate or just pay attention to this said inmate, um, a worrying fact um, in, in that instance. Uh, this, this we discovered only after the walkout, stroke escape, uh, but before that event, uh, we, we have to leave uh, operational details to, to the personnel. So. Uh, Intrinsically, um, a set of movements won't necessarily be suspicious or trigger suspicion. Judge Cameron, in your interaction uh, with the executive authority, uh, bear, whether it's the minister or the deputy minister in this instance, um, did you give an assurance that uh, with absolute certainty um, this is an escape or you would have preempted not sure? in that instance, so that at least we, we, we leave here knowing that um, both the minister and the deputy minister would have known by this and decided to turn a blind eye or not. I, I don't think they turned a blind eye, if, if you would ask uh, me from my inference, but I also couched both my telephone conversation with uh, Minister Lamola and my letter to him of 26th of October Again, in loyally language, I said to him, though, this is beyond, seems beyond belief. Indications uh, point to the conclusion that. So th that's the way I put it. I didn't say we know and it is certain that. Because who knows whether some of what is put before us might itself be bogus. We, we have the difficulty in JIX and we, we, we have it even in Mangaung that prisoners, and not surprising except to a, a, a very naive person. Prisons don't always tell us the truth. So we have a, a, a lot of complaints. Most of the complaints are justified because prison is an awful experience. Uh, 
Deputy Chief Justice Di Khang Moseneke used to tell us that in, in the Constitutional Court. Uh, but nevertheless, we, we have the difficulty that we don't always know what, it, what is being told to us is truth. So that's why I say to Minister Lamola, this seems crazy, but this is what we think might have or must have happened. And that's the way I come. So you, you, would, have, you would have poised it not being certain. Uh, it was just a thinking at that it's not informed by um, the investigation that would have came before you. It's a thinking on the basis of your, 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 your preliminary report would suggest that there's something fishy on this. Exactly, but based on the facts available to us in October, which now seem rock hard facts, but at the time we were shaking our heads. Was this, was this discussions or what you have reiterated now, was this written on the 26th when you wrote the letter or was this still the telephonic discussion that you would have had? I repeated uh, very much either before or after the letter, I don't remember when, but I, what I said in paragraph three of my letter and I'm indebted to my CEO for saying that, I said, dear minister, uh, we're still investigating, SABS is also involved Jix has been deeply concerned by a seemingly highly untoward incident at Mangaung. Even at this stage, there are indications, despite the, the ongoing investigations, that with the collusion of G4S employees and others, a fire was staged in the single cell of Tabu Besta, the notoriously named Facebook rapist, and a corpse was smuggled into the cell with the objective of faking his death and facilitating his escape. This is on the 26th of October. And Thank then I, sorry ma'am, may I just, uh, forgive me, may I just read the next sentence? Much of this appears to exceed probability or even credence. Further investigation is proceeding and we are being, uh, we are in the receipt of inquiries from the media. I'm sorry for interrupting you ma'am. This was based on the preliminary report, the letter. Yes. yes. And then you, you would have concluded the, 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 the investigation. When did you send the final report? The, the final report has not yet come, come out, but we, 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 we finalized the preliminary report. Now I'll just ask Mr. Takadu. We're busy finalizing it, ma'am. When did we send out the provisional report? Okay, I guess we do not have the final report. Thank you, We're still working on the preliminary report. Um, the segregation process of inmates uh, being moved, or what becomes the role of JICS? Do you, do you get reported on the process before um, an allocation of a cell gets to be given to an inmate or do you get reported after that process has, has been done? We, we have to be notified when it's been done, so it is reported to us. May I say, ma'am, that the whole mandatory reporting system is, is very insufficient. I almost said lamentable. It, it, it's DCS has been trying to improve it through the e-corrections online system. There is an, an appeal available for manicling and for segregation. And please may I add a, a, an important footnote. The Correctional Services Act, when it was enacted in, two th in, in 1998, made provision for, for, for solitary confinement. That was taken out of the 2004 amendments. There were a whole series of amendments in 2004. Instead, there was a limited form of segregation permitted. We, we have concluded that at Pretoria CMAX and at Ebongweni, there is in fact solitary confinement happening. We sent our report to this committee uh, and we hope that this committee would release it to the media. Uh, I, I don't believe that has happened yet. Judge uh, Cameroon. You are walking away with me, and I don't want you to walk away with me. My apologies. I want to stay where I am, which is the MCC, uh, G4S. I, 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 I can see you, 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 what you do, you know, you know about it. 
but I want us to focus on the MCC issue. Are you, you, do you get reported on inmates being taken to segregation when the process unfolds or after the process has unfolded? That's what I want to know. When a segregation has been effected, when a correctional official with the approval of the head of center exercises his or her statutory power to segregate someone, that fact having been performed must be reported to us. So in this instance, you would have been aware of that process being taken on Tabo Bester. It should have been reported to us, and it wasn't. The, the last one wasn't at all uh, when it occurred on the 30th of April. When did you know about the segregation of Tabo Bester? I think we can get back to you. I, I don't know when I knew about it, but uh, we can check our segregation reports. They are sent to uh, Mr. Ra uh, Rapule. Yeah. Uh, but Judge Cameron. Honorable Ramulubem. Ten minutes. You are now left with the credited time. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> I don't like that credited time. Uh, <laughs> Justice Cameron, in your response to, to Honorable Glennis Beitenbeck, you mentioned that shared, you, you shared the information with grown up. Um, that you would have received. How did you guard against the possibility of, of, of this jeopardizing any SAPS criminal investigation since you knew that the process is underway, especially being conducted by SAPS? It's a very fair question, if I may say so. I didn't uh, guarantee it. I relied on, the, on my belief in the utter integrity of the editor, whom I've, I've known for a long time, for 23 or 24 years, since he was the treasurer of the Treatment Action Campaign and played a significant part there. Uh, so I trust his integrity greatly. The second thing, ma'am, to answer your question is that I supplied Ground Up only with publicly accessible information. So after Judge Danisa had gone and written to me her findings, she wrote privately to me, she later lodged the report which is now time. I believe the findings that you would have shared with ground up. Yes. Uh, you would have shared with SAPS. Um, I, it, it's a good question, ma'am. I, I don't believe we did at that time, but it's a good question. You didn't think it's an it's an actual fair thing. No, it, it's a it's since a they are the ones conducting the the investigations. No. Uh, we may have fallen. I will, I will check up and uh, indicate the correct position if I'm wrong in making the concession now, but if we did your, the burden of your question that we should have done so is correct, and I concede that. Judge, you equally mentioned that with hindsight we are all wiser, and that this matter was just beyond belief, that what has transpired, the escape. Would you regard an anonymous email as a credible um, information or source of information? An anonymous or pseudonymous email. Uh, it depends on what is said inside it. If it's a two-line email without any backup, just saying uh, someone landed on the moon last night, I would not regard it as credible. What is the relationship um, between Jigs and the department? It's a respectful uh, at times, spiky working relationship. Uh, I, I think it's spiky on both sides. <laughs> I don't want to get to the spiky part. I might not be able to manage or contain it. <laughs> um, do you have bilateral meetings between, between you and the department? Initiated by the current National Commissioner of, of his own accord, those meetings I think my last meeting with his predecessor was on the 4th of December 2020. So for the last uh, 18 or 20 months of his, uh, his, sorry, Vic, of, please, Vic, uh, of his tenure, I didn't meet with him. But soon after taking over, as first as acting NC and then as, as, as appointed National Commissioner, the, the current National Commissioner said, we've got to get these quarterly meetings over, so all credit to him. How often do you sit with this current National Commissioner? 
at least every quarter, but we are in frequent contact by SMS and by uh, telephone and by uh, uh, letter. Uh, so it's a better relation than the predecessor one? That's very spiky, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> but the answer is yes. <laughs> Thank you, Judge Cameron. Uh, with all these inquiries that you have received, um, especially basing the internal investigations that you would have done, what would have been your expectation for the National Commissioner given that the final report is not yet received? What, would have, what was your expectation or what do you would have expected of him to do pending the final report? I would have wanted him, also with the, the uh, virtue of hindsight, to have kicked butt more quickly. Kick someone's that? posterior. <laughs> uh, they, can, uh, they say it nicely, kick butt. Okay. Um, that's the spiky part. Chair, um, I think I would have... Um, arrested or exhausted my, my, my questions. Um, thank you so much. Um, and I hope all the outstanding um, information that one would have requested, they would then come forth so that they equally assist us in this process. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Ramulubeng. Uh, Honorable Yako. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, let me just put this here. You have no credit. It's okay. I don't need credit. <laughs> I'll be fine. <laughs> um, I hope the mic is working right now. I have to ask. Um, thank you very much, Judge Cameron um, and Mr. Um, Vic Massa, for your very comprehensive and very detailed um, presentation to us. This is exactly what we were asking of G4S, and you outlined and highlighted things that G4S, as a primary holder of the situation, should have given to us. Um, and I thank you for that. Um, this timeline is um, is very it's very thorough, it's very clear, um, it's action based, it's, it's action orientated, and I think judging from your body language, um, as as when G4S was presenting and we were posing questions to them. Um, I think they've made your jobs very hard. Um, it's blatantly obvious that it was hard to cooperate with them or they didn't want to cooperate with you. Um, that's obvious. Um, so I'm going to look at the report that you provided with us and some of the things I may say may not be um, questions but perhaps um, opinions or seeking opinion and maybe may not be directed at you but maybe your opinion on the other entities that you had to work with um, regards to this case. Um, so the events that happened between um, May and August, um, I'd like to know, you say that in May 25th there was a sworn statement from Detective Flayman. Do you have that as part of your report? I think we referred to it. Uh, but we obtained that later. We, we obtained that later, if I'm, if I'm correct, uh, when we met the SAPS in Bloemfontein. So it is forming part of your report? Yes, we, we, it, it, correct. Sorry, ma'am, yes. It's fine. Um, secondly, um, on the 10th of August, you say that SAPS um, furnished you with copies of the autopsy report and DNA tests and requested that these tests not be made public. Um, was G4S a part of this consultation? I believe not. And do you know why? Uh, I, I don't know why, ma'am. Uh, may I ask? Uh been brought, <clears throat> he'd just been brought in. May I ask Mr. D'Souza to, to explain uh, why, Mr. D'Souza, please?
Honorable Chair, I'll answer the question. Sure. Uh, thank you so much. I think at that, st at that stage, um, uh, Madam Sumi was actually the uh, lead investigator. She was dealing with it at, uh, it, at Bloemfontein at the local level. And uh, Mr. Takaru was only brought in at a later stage from the 15th of August, some five days later. So at that point in time, your question was very clear whether G4S was part of that uh, a meeting that was held, and they were not. Okay. Um, that's fine. Um, on the 15th of August, um, you say there's more meetings between JIGS, SAPS, DCS, and G4S. Um, and what is interesting to me um, is that G4S nowhere mentions it in their report. There's no 15th of August in your timeline. There's nothing. You talk about May and nothing about um, the 15th of August on your report. And it's interesting to me why that is. Um, did you ask why and who is responsible for the missing video footage on that day? Definitely. It was a, a source of, of, it sounds self-righteous, but disgust and outrage on, on our part. Why? why? Why do you have all of this if, if, if the, the, the only time you need it, it, it isn't there? So we definitely asked after that. And just for clarity, the missing video footage, you're talking about the time when it was switched off to the time when it was switched back on. Nine hours and 30 plus minutes. Was Integra, is it Integraton part of that delegation that you met with? No, we, we, we weren't aware of Integraton until much later. So GFS never divulged that um, they had consulted with Integraton at the time? Sorry, ma'am? So GFS never co told you that they consulted with Integraton at the time? I think we did know that, that no, no, we were told by, by G4S. We were definitely told by G4S that this was subcontracted. Um, on your report, you also speak to um, the regional commissioner, Subashini Mutli. Um, and for me, I, 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 I don't want to pose it to them now. Uh, I think I would just like your opinion. Uh, and I think you alluded to the fact that perhaps it was more of a hierarchical issue for her to come to the party. But do you normally find that that is the course of action when you approach um, an area commissioner and they don't um, respond in a positive light or they are reluctant to meet you halfway? It, it's, a, it's another spikiness, ma'am, uh, because we, we have complex relations between the national commissioner and, in this case, his regional commissioners, uh, the KwaZulu-Natal Regional Commissioner is a conspicuous case in point. So I'm not aware of, of, of what, I think some regional commissioners are uh, better able to cooperate yeah. uh, hierarchically. Uh, I should just add that, that uh, Regional Commissioner Moodley says that she did not go white in that meeting. Okay. <laughs> okay I don't know what that means. <laughs> the 4th of November uh, oh. last year. Oh, okay. That's fine. Um, Judge, there's, on the, on the 21st of October, um, Judge Daniso says that um, the head of the prison was confirmed that um, the post-mortem led to SAPS docket being changed to murder. Um, and it seems to me there's so many red flags to this, and GFS had no willingness to cooperate with you. Um, and it feels like there's some sort of heist that G4 East was taking us on, um, and it seemed to, to not want to admit, because no way also is this part of their report. Um, and when they were compiling this report, did they confer with you? No, they didn't confer with us, but I agree with the preparatory statement that you made. Yeah. Um, again... Um, DCS on the 18th does not hand over the report but says the investigation is at an advanced stage and reports difficulty in obtaining information from G4S. Um, would, what, did you take this as, as, as normal? Do you, did you take this at face value? Is DCS not obliged to have a report from G, G4S as part of their partnership? We, we took that view. Uh, our, our, our way of working is that we wait for, uh, for DCS's report. And in this case, we'd have to wait for both G4S and for DCS's report. That's one of the reasons why we, we took so long. We were waiting. Uh, 
Uh, did you ask G4S directly? Yes, repeatedly. And what did they say? Uh, they said it's not ready or they'll make it available to us and, and then there was some delay. And we did after the meeting with Mr. Renzo Smith. We wanted it in advance of the meeting and we didn't get it. But we got their preliminary report afterwards, which was not of, of informative value to us. And you've got proof of this back and forth between you and G4S yes. and their lack of cooperation it's, it, for it's all, it. Thank you, ma'am. It's, it's, it's in the correspondence. Um, and then you write to the minister, and I've just listened to your letter that you wrote to him. Have you ever had any um, instances where you write concerns to the minister? Um, and what normally happens when you raise a concern that is of, of matter to you, to the minister within your relationship? Um, how do they respond? Do they say to you, we acknowledge receipt? Has there ever been lack of action? Is this a normalcy that you don't get any ref um, um, response from them? We are in a, a lobbying relationship with the minister. His staff is, is very accessible to us, uh, Mr. Sorella, Ms. Mobu, uh, Mr. Piri, and other members of, of his office. Uh, the, the, the minister has, uh, heaven knows, he doesn't need me to say it, he has enormous responsibility. So I'm lobbying him right now about lifers, and I don't want to do what, what Ms. Ramalabeng uh, rightly accused me of, of taking you down a different road. But the lifers issue is crucial to Jix. So I'm, I buttonholed him yesterday morning and I've but, been buttonholing Ms. Mobu. So the Tabo Besta was one of a number of issues that, that, are, are, that we were trying to crowd onto his table. And uh, what, in, what intervention were you seeking from him immediately in his capacity at that time? Also kicking butt. And he did not kick butt? I don't know. I think he did. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Uh, when did he kick butt? Because it seems to me there's nothing happened after this. I can't say that, and I'm, I'm not trying to protect the minister. I, I, if I had better information, I know that he was concerned because he was responsive to, to, to me in, in the telephone call. Uh, but w what he did or what his staff did, I know his staff uh, are, are also very concerned uh, about correctional issues, um, but it's a big portfolio and uh, you, of course you were entirely unaware because you were in an opposition party of what was happening in December. Mm -hmm. So there, there were, there were a, a, a range of claims. I think, I think, we, you've, we yeah, I think you've been too kind, Judge. I think you've been too kind to the minister. Maybe so, ma'am. Yeah, because now you're adding other issues that we all have to go through in this line of politics. So I don't think that for me is, is, um, is reason enough for him not to um, respond to you. Um, again, G4S does not, uh, G4S does an internal investigation. Did they hand that to you? So you received it on the 10th of November. And again, this footage is incomplete. When you say the footage is incomplete, is it still the time when they switched it off to the time when they switched it back on? Exactly. And did you write a reply towards that? I believe we did. I have a recollection of doing so. I can't put my finger on it now, but did, uh, it was outrageous to, to us. Yes, if, if need be, we can. Did they respond back to you? I, uh, allow me, it'll be one of the list of things that we'll get back to the committee on. Thank you. Okay. Um, again, I think I'm, I'm a bit um, worried that this Mr. Smith did not form part of the delegation here because it seemed to me that you conferred with him a lot and he's not the person to account here. In fact, even the investigator at G4S was insufficient in relaying proper information to us as a committee. And that for me is an issue because it seems to me that uh, G4S deliberately did not bring the ones that were at the core or at the center of what happened during that day. Um, do you know where he is right now? I don't know. My impression for, from the meeting with, with Mr. Smith is that he didn't have robust first-hand operational experience of incarceration. Uh, my impression was that he, he may have had a, an accounting or, or other background. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, uh, but, but this is an answer to your question. But on uh, what capacity were you meeting with him? as the, the, the one described by Ms. Breitenbach as the operations CEO of G4S in Middle East and Africa. At a high level? 
Exactly. Covering all the... Again, you'll, you may say to me I'm being too kind, but I think that he, he, was, he covered all of G4S's guarding uh, 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 carceral and other activities. And what informed you dealing with him instead of dealing with the, with the lower fruits? We, we had a meeting the next week in Bloemfontein with the hands-on people, the, the people who did the tough job uh, in Mangaung. Okay, um, thank you, Judge. Um, again, I'm concerned about um, Ms. Moodley's lack of assistance because, again, on the 6th of February, um, you note that um, the commissioner takes that the matter is still under consideration by contract of management of NDCS, and they're still waiting a report. Did that not uh, raise a flag to you that there's no um, sort of, uh, or, or DCS is a bit afraid of G4S for, so, or for some reason? Or maybe there's a power dynamic there that shouldn't be? Quite possibly. Uh, I, I would be speculating, but uh, uh, the, the proposition you're putting is a fair one. And did they not, and did, why did they, did they explain to you? Because they say again, um, R.C. Moodley and her team will not be of assistance. Did you ask why? I didn't ask why, uh, because we were hoping to meet her the next day. But it seemed to indicate to me that this was being taken to national office uh, and, and that the commissioner himself, national commissioner himself, was keeping hands on this. Yeah, um, I'm just going to make observations. Again, I'm very concerned with the lack of cooperation from DCS and the lack of will to meet you halfway as GIX. Um, because, again, on the 9th of February, um, you're still begging DCS to conclude the investigation into what happened a year before. Um, and normally, what is the process when, when that happens, when you have investigations of that nature? How, do, how, how soon are investigations concluded? They, they do take time. Uh, maybe we should be examining our own processes. We have been doing that. Again, I'm taking uh, we down, uh, us down Ms. Ronald Wing's uh, side road. But we are, we, we've, we've, we've introduced a complaints matrix and, and so that we get re more responsive to complaints. Maybe we should do the same with investigations uh, so that they, they hurried up. I, I cannot give you a figure for the average time taken for investigations, but they do take time, particularly because we wait for the, uh, the, the DCS investigation report, so that we can see what DCS be, has been told by its own uh, officials, and then we can finalize ours and say, well, we disbelieve this, or we, we, we do believe this, or we don't believe the inmates, or whatever conclusions we reach. Judge, again, you... You, re you, you keep reiterating in your report that you keep engaging, you keep begging them. On the 9th of March, you are telling them that you have a suspicion in this report that Mr. Be Mr. is alive, well, and dangerous. Um, it seems to me with your capacity of investigating, obviously you have many cases that you're investigating. However, this was at a level where you were consistently begging DCS, begging G4S to come to the party and assist you. Um, and what do you think should be the recourse towards their lack of action in meeting you in the time frame? Because you, honestly, I think the part that, um, that, that is concerning for us is that this person is alive, he's well, he is moneyed, he's dangerous. Um, what should be the recourse for, for us moving forward around the lack of action with your stakeholders in inhibiting your investigation to its full um, outcome? Thank you very much for asking that. Uh, and I, may I answer it by speaking about the new JIX bill, which will be before this committee. We, 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 the bill says that DCS, if it refuses to implement a recommendation, must tell us why. So, for example, we will make a recommendation that every DCS investigation be finished within six weeks, say. Okay. Then the National Commissioner will say to me, but six weeks is unreasonable. And then I will say, why? So there will be a mechanism which we don't have at the moment. We, we are donkey bass hand, uh, cap in hands with DCS. We've got to wait because we've got no power at all apart from our voice. And as Ms. Breitenbach says, we have got a voice. Yes. And we have got power to investigate. We have got power to set up even commissions. We could have set up, the, the statute says, uh, we can set up a, a, a formal commission or get someone else to go in. We could have exercised those powers, but actually over the operations within a correctional center, we have no power. 
and you've never raised this before, before the JICS, the JICS bill that's coming to the, to the, to the committee now. Yes. Um, there's never been a concern because it seems to me there's, there's disjuncture in the whole Department of Justice. In fact, there's no coloration between the different um, entities. Has there never been a concern before? It's again, ma'am, if you don't mind me saying so, a very good question. There are different models of uh, outside inspection of carceral facilities across the world. A few, a, a few models make it compulsory to implement recommendations. Most of them are like our model, which is uh, 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 no power. The, the, a big group of them, which we are going to ask this committee to endorse to Parliament, is uh, in the middle, where you either must implement or you have to implement, unless with good reason. Okay. So there are various models one can follow, but we have raise this consistently. Okay. Um, again, you write on the 23rd of March that you wrote to the Deputy Minister, um, Gorsi Patekile Olomisa, in he requesting his personal attention to the best case. Um, and what did he do? We, uh, I think that the inference Mr. Horn or Ms. Uh, uh, Breitenbach made was that that he must have spoken to the commissioner because the report came soon afterwards. I haven't asked him what he did. Okay. Honorable Yago, we are left with 10 minutes. It's fine. It's 10. <laughs> Judge, in your opinion, and I'm sure you've, you've worked with G4S before, have you ever done other investigations around the Mangawong Correctional Center? And how much cooperation have you received from G4S around other cases? And maybe can you make an example of a certain case that, you, that was f raised and flagged to you? Because we know, um, as we went to the Correctional Center last year, we raised concerns at G4S because what they showed us was a pretty picture, as you've said. It was beautiful, well-run, clean. Everything looked proper. And again, I must emphasize that that was a formal visit. So we had told them that would come and do a visit to them. So it was obvious that that would have been what we'd see is what we'd been, would be shown. Um, but we, we had heard, we had um, people telling us, we had inside prisoners who were telling us of the amounts of violence that happened within the correctional center, the amounts of corruption that happened within the correctional center. And we raised it as a committee that time. And we were told that no, 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 everything is fine. But it, it, what investigations have you done with them and how much cooperation have you received from them on prior cases to this one? Thank you, ma'am. I believe we have received cooperation in the past. C can I make another uh, wayward point, according to Mr. Romul uh, Ms. Romul Bing, uh, that, that the most hardened criminals are sent to CMAX, to Ebongweni, and to, 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 to G4S's facility at Mangong. Uh, we have been in a long wrestling, a lobbying wrestling with the department in order to get the protocols by which people are sent there revised and supervised so that the, it's not used punitively. That, that's a big issue still. So, but G4S doesn't have power over who gets sent to them. Okay. Uh, and and they, 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 they have, they, they're getting paid for a full facility. So there's a, a difficulty about that as well. What, what when someone is, is de- uh, Judge, you're not answering me. <laughs> Sorry, ma'am? You're not answering me. No. You, you're moving away from me. He's walking away from me. No, no you're right, ma'am. Yeah, I'm, I'm using this as a lobbying yeah. no, occasion. No, no, no. I've got five well. minutes left, so yes. I need to use it very wisely. Uh, please, please forgive it's me. Not too, yeah. So, so we, we have received cooperation in the past. Thank you. In the you. past. Great. Thank you. You spoke about skullduggery that happens there um, and uh, many, many times. You spoke also about the issue and the concern that you have with the triple P structure of G4S. And I want to ask you on your personal opinion, do you not think that G4S's brazenness, their utter refusal and the fear from DCS to engage with you and make G4S account, not perhaps politically motivated because there's entities within G4S that stand to gain from G4S staying as a triple P partner there? I'm absolutely sure you're right, ma'am. So that's your opinion. Okay. Um, lastly, um, 
On this issue of the of Tabo Bester's segregation, so you don't have any record of them having applied to you for that? I don't believe we do, ma'am. Okay. Also, just one last thing. With regards to my last question, is your investigation, ultimately when you bring it to the committee, having any recommendations with regards to the triple P structure of G4S and how it's modeled in a way that um, puts you at a weaker position as an investigative um, entity? No, we, we, we haven't gone there yet, but uh, it is a, f a fertile angle to, to, to take up. Thank you very much, Judge. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Yako. Uh, you were left with 10 minutes. Uh, but uh, I can see that you don't want to credit anyone. <laughs> no, yes. Um, I think before we break for lunch, Honorable Ngola will come after lunch. Um, we have organized a dinner. We anticipate that we are going to work until very, very late. Um, but that, dep that is dependent on you members. Uh, we won't push you, um, but the longer you want to stay here, we will oblige. Uh, we shall oblige as the as the chair as the chairperson. I shall oblige. So we will push until midnight, but it is dependent on you. Um, then, if midnight, there are still many questions. We will push again, but it is all in your hands. Yes, it is. It is all in your hands. Uh, can we break for lunch? It's now five past one until two o'clock.
Kemne chest. Can you speak? Yes, sir. Can you can you hear me that side? They say you can speak. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chair. So I was finishing uh, saying uh, this would have cemented a very great legacy for chicks. Because I'm telling you, we may now be speaking about uh, Mangaung Correctional Center, whilst in a number of correctional centers, the same modus operandi is actually uh, taking place. Nevertheless, let me leave it like that. In the report, uh, the incident happens on the third morning, on the third day of May in the morning, then 4th, 5th, and 19th, uh, and the 25th of May, there is a movement Jigs is making. But from the 25th of May until the 7th day of August, Jigs is silent. So what has been happening in, from the 25th of May until the 7th of August, what were you doing as Jigs boss? In terms of the report, there is nothing that reflects as the work that you were trying to do in assisting the situation. This is an aftermath after the incident occurred. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ngola. Uh, we were taking statements. We were uh, investigating through our ICCVs on the ground. Our Bloemfontein investigator was collating statements. She was uh, coordinating with the police. I can't give you a detailed timeline, but if the committee requires it, I can find out from her exactly what she did amidst all the other investigations. Uh, so we were active. We, we weren't in it. it. It seems like a big gap, uh, but again, uh, I would humbly submit that that is because of the wisdom of hindsight. Okay. I get that you don't have a final report. But there is investigations that you undertook since the day of the incident. An inmate writes a letter to a judge saying he is of the knowledge that a man So we knowing that you have, they, we brought such a person in that center. Do we have to believe you, what you are saying? Honorable member, please do believe me. There's lots of inmates okay, there with you. a very high profile thank that we are keeping much. in the center. It's 2,928. Very high profile inmates. Thank you very much. Chair, um, I just want to find out, Chair, uh, we have Mr. Kobas who is a national director. We have two uh, directors who their works are very, uh, your work is very important. Like, uh, let's take for example, Mr. Munyani, you are responsible for uh, 
the facility, you are a center director. I believe that you are every day there. You're supposed to be there every day, or maybe you'll tell us if you're not there every day, both of you. Because uh, the other one, Mr. Hert, you are responsible for risk uh, within, risk, risk man management within the center. And I'm sure you understand the work that you are doing. Um, there's, 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 there's a somewhere where I'm going with. Thank um, you. Depending Thank you very on much. the challenges that are coming, then I will not find myself I at the center. I, I, I get the idea. When you are not there, who is there on your behalf? I do have the deputy director, uh, Ms. Derek Dittler. Where was Mr. Derek Dittler on the day of the uh, incident? Both of you, one of you, was 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 present. On yes, Honorable Chair, you will have realized on the slide when I have done the presentation is one of the people that has arrived at the scene, those early hours of the morning. No, I'm saying that time, at that time, who was the manager supposed to be the on-site operational manager? Or you don't have something like that? Honorable member, unless I don't understand the question, but how it works, during the night there is a senior official on duty whom we call the, uh, the night duty operations supervisor. Who is that one, the name? In, in, the case, in this case, it was Senue Matswara. Oh, the one that you talked about. Yes. Okay. Thank, you, thank you very much. Uh, I, I would like to believe that you have a system of reporting, Mr. Kobas and your team, can, can you fashion this uh, or, or tell us today or how your, your, your reporting system goes? Uh, Honorable Chair, the, uh, my two colleagues who are intimately involved with the operations of, of the facility um, report uh, in the G4S line of command to uh, the director who's in charge of our Southern Africa operations. So these are operations across South Africa and Southern Africa countries, um, with the Mangung facility then being one of those, um, one of those facilities or, or businesses that, that operate uh, or report into him. Um, sorry, sorry, Chair, can, can he raise the voice? I, I can't hear properly. Am I a bit soft? Yes, you're a bit okay. going down. Shall I start again? No, some of it I did hear. Okay. Some yes. Can continue. So, so, so the the facility reports to the, the we refer to it as a cluster director. This is a person, a senior person within G4S, who's responsible for the activities in in Southern Africa. Obviously, South Africa, one of those countries, and the Mangung facility being one of those businesses um, accountable to him. That information flows on a continuous basis, and there's a lot of cooperation between colleagues in the Mangung facility uh, and, and, and that individual. If you ask specifically about me, I'm, I'm the commercial director for, for Africa, so I have a, a, an Africa remit um, dealing with commercial matters um, but pertaining to G4S's activities. Um, as I said this morning in my introduction, I'm also a director of G4S Care and Justice, which is one of the entities related to the, the Mangung facility. So my apology, I'm, 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 I don't want to be rude. I think I got that one early in the morning. So I just wanted to find out exactly how do you get a report, particularly from this team. But I, th I think I got that one. So uh, can I go, can I, can I get from, from them now? Because my time is short and the absolutely. person is going to kill me. <laughs> Can I find out their reports? I just want to hear the content, the deep in, uh, 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 issues of the report as to daily. Do you report daily, hourly, monthly, quarterly, because I'm getting somewhere? Yes or no? Honorable member, um, in terms of the inmate behaviors, let's say there's an unusual behavior that is happening in the center. We are obliged by the contract to report to the controller on site one hour after the incident has happened. No, 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 no. I don't want the incident. I'm saying the reports in terms of the activities of, of the facility because if, if there is something wrong, 
within the facility if the reports if are, are being done or are, uh, reporting is taking place, something will be, you will find something along the way. Somebody who is going to report, uh, receive those reports will find something. So I want to know, do you report, uh, do your officials, because if I'm saying report, not specifying exactly your report from the ground up to your level, to the level of the national, I want that system. Honorable member, uh, possibly I can answer that. The reporting line is directly to the controller who's on site. Uh, there's daily reports being submitted to the controller on all activities at the center on a daily basis. Uh, the controller in his case reporting to the national commissioner via the contract management office in Pretoria. So those, uh, uh, it means they, they do re receive those reports early, ev every day? Yes, that, there's a contractual obligation that if we're not supplying those reports, we will receive a notice and it will follow into a penalty if we've been found guilty on that. So it means within your reports, there must be a risk, some risk that you've noticed in terms of what is happening within the, the facility, especially from your side. The risk is not in, in, in the report. We've got a risk register that we manage in the center, which is containing all the company risks that is, that is involved in that, and the operational risk, if it's like that. In this case, I can confirm that the investigation proved that up until this incident, there was no confirmation of misbehavior on the side of Bester, there was no disciplinary offenses registered against uh, Bester up until that point, and there was no information that was shared with us uh, prior to this incident from okay, Bester. Okay, but let me say about other reports within the center. Did you report, did you get any reports in terms of how the, the especially the, the, the I'm, I'm driving to the point of uh, the issues, complaints of the, the, the inmates and, and everything that is happening here in terms of how they are treated, how they are being, because I'm saying this because there's a report that I'm, I've read about that I want to know if the national office has received. The report of 2013 about the beatings that are happening within the facilities, about the, I'm just, I'm passing, because about the, 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 the also the issue of the, the inmates being injected and all, I just want you to give us a small, I want to see if these reports, they do go to the places where they're supposed to go, so that you are able to mitigate some of the problems that we are facing today about these dangerous uh, 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 inmates. Do you get the report of the wrongdoings uh, within the, the facility as you're supposed to be receiving, Mr. Kobas? Because uh, I can see that from yes. that side, I can't get what let, I want. Let me answer that question, uh, Honorable Member. Information filters through the organization like any other organization. The ma more material matters are raised to senior levels. So, for example, the report that you're referring to in 2013 is before my time, but that report would have gone to senior levels. There was a um, uh, uh, mention made earlier this morning about a, a Ruth Hopkins report. That report, being a, a, a controversial report and an important report, would have, would have gone through the channels. Where I sit on the VCC board, on a quarterly basis, I get informed of the material matters pertaining to, to um, to, to the facility, and, and I can assure you that when, when the incident was converted from the police from a, uh, a suicide to a murder, that information would have gone way beyond my level and would have gone to the international head office because that is a material development. Do you know if something was done about these things, those that were reported? You have 10 minutes. Honorable member, I can. Mike is off. 
Opshe. Sorry. In fact, this, these questions are taking me to the point of how do you deal with the whistleblowers? Because these people, they come and get this information of PESTA, you know it from, you know some, some of the wrongdoings there, they might have been reported. Because there are so many things that has been reported that you have never attended to. So how do you deal with the issue of the whistleblowers? People who are giving information as to the wrongs that are happening within the, 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 the facility. Honorable member, what we are normally doing if we do get information from uh, inmates, we, we, we will do a, a document where we write our findings as well as our recommendation and then we'll take that document and submit to the controller on site uh, where we will normally recommend that either the inmate must receive either 12 months remission of sentence or whatever that that document of DCS is giving to say for divulging information the inmate can receive either between one, one month and three months or between three months and six months. Okay, I have only 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Okay. There are names, you are, you, you are saying there are people who are suspended. They are seven. The three ones, they, they, they are seven, we don't know about the four, but are these, I, I, I should think, uh, is Mr. Tsuwane Tsunohe and Mr. Johnson, uh, Ms. Johnson Mabutz and also Mr. Mabutza among those people? Honorable member, that's the three people that's already been dismissed. Sonoi, Janssen. Are the only um, people that uh, in, in all that happened uh, in this best Saka that are being responsible or being found having committed wrong on this? Honorable member, remember, as we said earlier today, those are the three members whose actions are not in, a, uh, in accordance with their duties and with the policies and procedures. So we therefore question oh. their motives on that evening, and for that reason, we've dismissed them. It's also one of the reasons why SAPS uh, arrested one of them uh, in, in, in the last few days. Then we mentioned earlier today that pertaining to the, the Sally Port incident where the vehicle passed into the facility back in, in April, 20, April 2022, um, seven members have to date been suspended whilst that investigation is, is ongoing. I, I hope I've answered your question. Thank you very much. I've got names here. I want you to tell me who are these people and what is their uh, 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 duty at work and where were these people when all this was happening? And uh, if possible, why are these people not uh, suspended or fired? One, I have John. I don't know, is Kohlai or is C-O-A-N-G L-A-E. Who is this person? That is number one. Tell this house. Number two, I have somebody by the name of Anike Lekhranje. Who is this person? What is he doing? And, and also I have this person, Aida. All of these people are part of your team uh, in the center. And the only people that has been suspended or fired or being found ro doing wrong, there are only three there, the one that you have uh, spoken about. So my question, which is the question before the last one, is that why is it uh, only, I'm going to be very controversial with this one, Chair, why are we only having those three blacks when we have these others who are not blacks who were part of that? I'm sorry, Chair, to be controversial, but I'm, I just had, want to say it. Are you G4S racist? Honorable uh, member, the, no, we are not. You are not? No, we're not. Okay. Can I hear from you? Why only three people and blacks for that matter when there are other people? who are managers, I'm t I'll tell you because it seems as if you don't want to tell me who are those people. Number one, we have Aida, who is a security supervisor. And he must be knowing who said that uh, big, the car 
must get insight. He must be having a report. But you don't have a report here about that secu uh, a security uh, supervisor. We have this Lekhranji, who is an operational manager. I am telling you because you, are not, you, you don't want to tell me. <laughs> the reason why I'm saying are you a racist is because they are white. And they, they were responsible. They're supposed to be part of the uh, 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 people who have given the responsibility and accountable for all these things that we are talking about today. Uh, Chair, I've got the last question. Can they give us the answer on that one? Sorry. You are left with three minutes. Honorable Member, can I answer you quickly? Ida. He's the newly appointed supervisor after Sonoy was dismissed. It's a, a lady um, that's working for us. She was not working as the uh, supervisor at the date of the incident. Then Kong Hwai was the person that worked in Broadway the night of the incident. And he reported all the information to us. The investigation did not prove any involvement. And therefore, he was not suspended nor was a disciplinary action against him. And the same with Anna Kallegransi, the operations uh, manager. This John, is this John who uh, left immediately before the, uh, uh, the incident happened? That's correct, madam, but he didn't, um, honorable member, he didn't uh, leave. He was instructed by the supervisor and that formed part of the supervisor's disciplinary action, why he instructed this person to leave his position to attend to a medical emergency. The same supervisor who allowed the car to come in and removed the person who was refusing to give those people permission to get in. No, um, honorable member, that supervisor is the one that's currently being detained by the SAPS who was involved in the situation on both occasions, on the 29th, as well as on the 2nd and 3rd of May that night. This Aniki Lechrant, you are saying is a new person? No, she's not a new person. She's been in a long, a long time in the position as operations manager. Ida is the new person. No, th uh, but uh, uh, this Lechrant, you're saying, is an is a operational manager? That's correct. So I'm remember. saying, where was she also? Because they are... Once we're dealing with these operations, they... She was not on duty during that incident. She, uh, the person that was on duty in the incident that was in charge was Senoy. Why do you think is <laughs> a coincidence that these people, they decided to leave, uh, they, they, they not be in, in duty on that day, they left earlier before the whole thing, the real thing happened? Um, Madam Chair, um, oh, Mar uh, sorry, um, Honourable Member, that person did not leave. There's a shift pattern according to which people work, and it, wa it wasn't those people that had to be on shift. The night shift people was on shift when this incident happened, which was 23 of them, under the supervision um, of Mr. Senoy, um, that's currently being dismissed. Uh, because if you look at this thing, it was not, it, it did not happen uh, like, uh, it, it, was, it was planned. We all agree now that it was a plan. It was a plan. Because of the shift that we have, you know, it takes me to the question of uh, Honorable, Honorable Yako, that uh, are you saying for example, you, 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 you are not supposed to have been Honorable investigated yourself as, as the people who are responsible for the center. Chair, my last question is that, plus the one that I've asked. My last question is, it goes to Mr. Gobas. Mr. Gobas, after all that has been said in this house, are you still denying that you have failed DCS as your con a person who con you are contracted, contracted with and also the government of this country. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Honorable Member, I'm, I'm not denying and I, I can't recall that I have denied that, that, we, have, that we have not failed. Uh, it's clear that this was a very, very carefully 
orchestrated uh, plan of BESTA to, to break out of, of MCC. Um, and it is clear that we have indicated to the police those members whose actions on that night we cannot reconcile. And we've given those, number, those names to the police. And I think for me, the fact that the police recently ac uh, invest, um, arrested one of them, based amongst others on information that we provided is testament to the fact that we have cooperated throughout. Um, it also proves that certain of our members may have been, well, we know at least one was involved in, in the incident that evening. I hope I've answered your question. You mean only no, those no, three black no, no, people? No, Thank no. you, Chair. Thank you. Honorable Swart. Chair, thank you very much. Um, just following on with my colleagues' questions, the, a lot has uh, gone around the role of integrity tron and the issue around the cameras. Have you received any feedback from them as to the, um, the involvement of their technician that night? Um, where the technician indicated when he went off duty, everything was working. Um, I don't know who answered that question. Have you received uh, uh, some uh, contract of duty? Honorable Swart, your yes. voice is too soft today. I don't know why. The voice is too soft. Yes. Did you hear me now? Yeah. I just want to find out whether you've received any information from them relating to their investigations as to their technician. Honorable Member, no. I, I did not receive any feedback from them as yet on any investigation conducted by them. I understand the, uh, the affidavit that there was a polygraph test done on one of their technicians, and I'm sure we will deal with that at a later stage um, where that technician failed the polygraph test. Um, just to then move across what, what, what the, the notorious cell 35, we were there last week. And if you look at the corridor, besides the cameras that were not working, there's an official posted there in the middle of the corridor. There's an official. So what happened to that official that night? Was he there? Has he been investigated? Because besides the camera, which obviously you, you couldn't see, I looked myself, you couldn't see what was going on there. But there is an official there on night duty who's in that position. Where was he that night? Honourable Member, um, that employee is the one that was requested by the previous committee member, Hong Hui. He was removed by the supervisor, Senoy, that night, and he has sent him to a medical emergency in one of the other living units in Waltz to attend to the, uh, the um, medical emergency there. That did form part of the disciplinary uh, procedure against Senoy, which led to his dismissal because he removed uh, employees from single positions, which wa he was not allowed to do within the policies and procedures. So the cell 35, which we know is at the right-hand side looking down, and the emergency exit is below that, which can only be controlled by the control room, who are watching with cameras, but they're also the only ones that can open the emergency and the cell door, is that correct? That's correct. So the control room, and those were the two control room uh, people that have been suspended and dismissed, is that correct? 100% correct. And they will be facing criminal action as well, one presumes. We've reported that to the SAP uh, as well, uh, their actions, and we've given them all the documentation and the records that was kept in the control room. Yes, Honourable. When was Mr. Senoy admitted to the facility? Roundabout, yeah? Uh, at, at, um, not 100% correct. I think it was 24 October 2014 or 13. I might, might be wrong with the year. 2013. Yes. I think 13, 14. Um, I might be incorrect with that. I can come back with the exact date. So he's been around the prison for a long time. People know him. Is that what you... Wardens would know him in the facility? He's been around there for almost eight, nine years. That's correct. 
and yet he's able to allegedly conduct a business from prison. Is that not deeply concerning? Does the G4S, are you aware of all the allegations around him running a business and has any investigation been done into that? Uh, Honourable Member, maybe I can answer that one. We are aware of the allegations. We have no evidence available to us that that in fact took place. Sorry, Mr. Krunovok, there is more than enough evidence. If you go on Facebook, if you can see videos of Mr. Bester addressing a launch conference where he's supposed to be in prison, are you aware of that? I've, I've not seen that video. But that's highly and irresponsible, I put it to you, sir. And, and if, the, if the suggestion is that it's from New York, then I, I, I cannot no, say that. No, the picture, that is it's very easy to ascertain whether that person who purports to be someone from New York, one can ascertain and do an investigation into that. I'm, I'm perturbed that it, you seem to bear no knowledge of it or you're not concerned about it. In, do you have any response to that? I am concerned about that. Uh, that. No action has been taken at all in that regard. We've not been able to substantiate those facts. Have you taken no, no, no. any steps at all to substantiate that? Not to my knowledge. Well, that's inexcusable. Sorry, Honorable Swart. I mean, given your responses, why should the country vest its security in your hands? Given your responses? Because it's either you are seriously incompetent or you do not care. Honourable Chair, it's not, the, it's not the case that we don't care. Um, I think... So if you don't care, incompetent. I think if you look back at our track record over the last almost 22 years, I think we have a very good track record. Now, leave the track record aside, but a company of your magnitude failing to answer this question asked by Honourable Swart, would anybody listening take that company seriously? Honourable Chair, the best I can answer that question is to say that there are many allegations in social media and the substance of what one sees nowadays in social media is very difficult to determine. Uh, we, we cannot, we cannot um, investigate each and every social media allegation. Mr. So you leave some of them. Mr. Krunovart, given the outrage of the public about this incident, surely, surely, when you read media reports or whatever, you would have, and given the fact that you sit on the board and given the fact that you indicated earlier this would have international repercussions, surely it would have had some attention from you. This is very serious. It goes to the heart of the reputation of your company. But I can understand that you are unable to give a satisfactory explanation for that but one can presume that it causes, an, well, it causes an uproar amongst the average South African and amongst us as well. I'm sure you'll agree with that. Can I just ask you then back to the cell and back to the fact that Mr. Bester was admitted in 2013. He's probably well known He's been there almost eight years. How tall was Mr. Bester? Do you know, offhand? Was he tall? Would you know how tall he is? He's a mm. tall person, he's, would you say? I didn't work with Mr. Bester myself, so I cannot answer that question, but I can look into the records at the center where all this information is well, available. Apparently he's 1.7 meters tall. How long was the body that was found in the cell? Do you have any idea? I saw the length on the report that we what received. What was that? Uh, we, the report that we received from Jix yes. on, on the 2nd of February. And uh, I think the length there, if I don't misinterpret it, is 1.49, 1.48. 1.45. There's a big difference between 1.7 meters and 1.45 meters. So at first glance, the warders that came to that cell would have known that the person that is burnt there 
was highly unlikely to have been Mr. Bester. Would you agree with that, given the fact that Mr. Bester is 1.7 meters, according to your own records, check them, and the body was 1.45 meters? Do you not agree, given the fact that he's been around, he's a tall person, here you have a very short body that is there. Surely it should have raised suspicions immediately. Can anyone explain that? Honourable Member, my understanding, and again, I did not see these, these photographs, but my understanding is that the body, uh, once the cell was opened, and until the pathologists arrived, was covered in um, fire extinguisher residue.
personal life of Tabo Beste. The investigation reveals that the alleged wife, who was known to be a doctor, came to claim the body of Tabo Beste. A member of SAPS noted that this is not the first body claimed by the same doctor in the free state. This necessitated further investigation and an additional inquiry was registered. The investigation further necessitated that subs stop the burial, which was intended to be a cremation, and send the body for forensic tests. The preliminary autopsy report. The report suggested that the cause of death as being a natural death caused by a blunt force trauma to the head of the victim. The report revealed that the child body that was of an adult male which was suffered a skull fracture. The autopsy also revealed that there was no smoke inhalation in the lungs. Therefore, indication was that the disease was already dead during fire incident. Based on the autopsy report, the case was converted from an inquest to a murder. The subs also registered the following charges which regard to the incident. Fourth, perjury, violation of the dead body, aiding and abating escape of a convicted person, and defeating the ends of justice. On the 1st of July 2022, the first DNA analysis conducted on the body believed to be that of Tabo Bester, and the person known by the investigators as Tabo Bester's mother did not match. The DNA analysis on the mother of Tabo Bester was essential in establishing whether or not the body was that of Tabo Bester. The results further necessitates that the comparison of the DNA for Tabo Bester, taken during 20, 2011 when he was previously arrested, with that of the child body that was found in the cell, be compared. Tabo Bester, the alleged female doctor, and the Mozambican national were arrested in the early hours of Saturday morning, the 8th of April, 2023, in Tanzania. A delegation of senior officials traveled to Tanzania to oversee the repatriation of the suspects to South Africa. Former G4S official and alleged father were arrested on Saturday, the 8th of April, 2023, and they are charged with murder, arson, defeating the ends of justice, and aiding escape from lawful custody. Both appeared before court on Tuesday, the 11th of April, 2023, and the case was remanded until Monday, the 17th of April, and they are still in custody. On the 11th of April, 2023, the employee of Integritron Integrated Solutions was arrested and appeared before court today, which is the 13th of April, 2023, for aiding escape from lawful custody and defeating the ends of justice. In conclusion, the DNA of the child body was taken for further investigation to establish the identity. A test team has been established to investigate the matter further, and the investigation is ongoing and is currently at an advanced stage. That's our submission, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. Uh, any hands? Oh. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, Last time I was advised that it would be 15 minutes. Do you want to? So do you agree on 10 minutes? <laughs> and that of course, 10 minutes, ne? Everybody 10 minutes. Ish, Chair, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thanks for indulging us. Sibonge, ngale setulo, no my presentation. Ebewe la payana is kulo sama poisa ngalulitaba. I would want to just ask a, a, a few questions. It has been uh, brought to attention that the, firm, the SAPS conducted the DNA test 
on the body purported to be that of Tabo Best, and the results came back negative. Now, uh, what I wish to find out uh, is uh, how, 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 how is it that uh, when uh, the DNA was conducted and uh, Tabo Pesta's uh, DNA was never found on the database, the DNA database of the police? Because in terms of the law, every offender that is uh, sentenced for Schedule 8 uh, cases that includes uh, rape and murder, they need to take their buccal test, I mean, uh, uh, test, yes, and have their DNA stored in a police database. But that of Tabo Pesta was never stored. Um, we wish to find out how was that done. Number two, I want to check. Uh, well, oh, oh, yes, all right. Maybe yeah, for so, a prefer to go to the question, not only answer. Okay, even more interactive. thank you. So, thanks, Honorable Chairperson. All protocol observed. Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, Chairperson, the sorry, DNA sorry, of. Sorry, can you introduce yourself? No, sorry. Okay, sorry for that. I'm Major General Motsepe from the Office of the Division Detective and Forensic Service in Pretoria at the National Office. The DNA of Tabo Bester is in the database of the South African Police DNA database. Let me go historically when it comes to the issue of the DNA. Tabo Bester was arrested during the year 2011 on a rape and murder. The sample was taken during a death so period sorry. of the victim of rape. Sorry, don't be too violent on the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Minimum force. Okay. The sample was taken, uh, which, which is a standard procedure. The sample was taken from the victim of death rape and it was sent to forensic for DNA. During those years, when the suspect was uh, denying the charges, the NPA will give us a letter so that the DNA can be uh, uh, run there. But we all must remember that the, defi the definition of rape is not all about DNA. So what transpired that during that year, Tabo Bester confessed to the crime. And then he was solely uh, linked with the case through the, the cyber investigation and through his confession. But the DNA was there. And then there was no request to make the linkage of uh, his DNA, like the blood sample, to the sample which was the control, I mean the sample which was taken from the victim, which is the sexual offenses kit, which when you take it, there are DNA, uh, DNA samples there. Thank you. Uh, my um, second question, Chair. Um, when this body was discovered, uh, this uh, victim of murder, uh, by, for now, let's say, by Pastor, was uh, discovered, a sample was taken, again, back to the mother of um, Pastor. And uh, we are told that uh, it, was, it was matched, and it didn't match. I understand that because this one, this uh, uh, victim was deceased. So you had to do a, a familial uh, sample. When we visited the forensic laboratory. Apologies, Chair. Can the member just um, go back to, if you can just uh, go back to the question again when you're talking about the sample was taken from okay. the mother. I, I, I'm, 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 I am saying, um, for for this for 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 the police to prove that uh, uh, the deceased was not Tabo Best, they had to go to the mother, take the sample, try and match it with that of Tabo Best. For them to do that, they needed a software called uh, Codis. Well, that's what we were told when we visited the forensic laboratories that you've just acquired this technology from the F FBI recently. Is it my understanding that 
in 2022, you did not have this technology. How did you then ascertain that? Because when you questioned why would you want, why would you use this codice from the FBI, you said, no, you are unable to do a familial analysis without this uh, technology, this uh, uh, software. Now, then it was not there. How did you ascertain that this DNA of the deceased does not match that of Tabo Pesta's mother because you had said to us only this technology that you acquired recently would enable you to do that. If we can get clarity on that, please. Thank you. Chair, let me go a little bit about that one of the 2011. During the era of 2011, as I've explained that uh, we didn't do the DNA because Tabo Bester was confessed to the crime and we also link him through the cyber investigation. During uh, 2018, the Forensic Amendment Act of the Schedule 8 offenses was passed as a law in Parliament which was implemented during uh, 2015. So Tabo Bester was arrested during 2011, and then we didn't, uh, the, the, that act was not in, in, for, in force by that time. And then 2013, the law wa was passed that we must uh, uh, do the, usually to the, the buccal samples. So all the inmates, the law says all the inmates or every person who's arrested on a Schedule 18 must be subjected to a buccal sample. So the project which we put, or the program which we put in place together with a correctional service was that all the, in, all the inmates or all the, 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 the accused who are supposed to be released on parole, we prioritized on them. Then three months before the release of the parolees, then they will send us a list of all those parolees, then we'll go and buccal sample them and we put them under the, the database, starting from uh, 2015. So most of the inmates who were sentenced for, for life sentences, who were still on the project of rounding all the pris prisoners to take the, the buccal sample on, on that one. But the one of codes that we acquired codes during 2022, of which we have already started, uh, 2015, taking the buccal sample and putting them in the system to run. Uh, that one, uh, I'm not aware of that one, Chairperson. Chair, Chairperson, my question is not answered. My question is, how did you analyze the sample of the diseased body against that of Tabo Pesta's mother? Because you did not have this FBI uh, uh, software to do that. How did you do it? Thank you. Our Commissioner. Th thanks, uh, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members. We, we do DNA continuously every day, uh, all the time, Honorable Chair, where we compare people's DNA. The CODIS is a software that just make the job much more easier in the search. Currently, we, do, we you, you are aware that we've been doing DNA all along, and uh, we've been successful. So here it was about taking the DNA of that chartered body compared with uh, the mother of uh, Bester. That capability, we have it, we've been having it all along. But the software you talk about, as soon as we finalize it and put it on the system, it's going to make, make the work much more easier. So I won't say we're doing it manually now, we do it automatically, but that software is gonna make the work of our officials much more easier in searching the whole system. Thank you very much. So the, 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 the three minutes. It's, it's, yeah, no, it's fine, I'll make it um, against all odds. Can you, uh, it, it, in your presentation, you say that uh, this is not the first body that uh, this, uh, dishonorable doctor, Dr. Mandisa, has, has, has claimed. When he claimed the first body, um, what happened to the first body? Because our understanding is that the body was handed over to her. What happened to that body? What investigations have the police done to the first body before she came back to claim the second body that was uh, blocked? 
Thanks, uh, Honorable Chair. Maybe I'll allow the Provincial Commissioner to answer that, but before that, let me just a little bit dwell on a question that might have come earlier, but not really now. Uh, one of the reasons why, after having had the DNA of the chartered body, not, uh, not, 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 been, not been the same with the mother of uh, Bester, and of course also on the other side, the preliminary post-mortem indicating that this person did not die out of fire, but he died out of other causes. One of the reasons why we had to not conclusively say, yes, uh, it is Bester's mother and this body does not match, so it means it's not Bester. But there was also a question whether, is this really Bester's mother? There was that question. And it took long to investigate because you have to get to relatives and so on to really come to a conclusion that it is indeed a Bester's mother because we had to go as far as get into hospital, find you know, your records. So that also had to play a role. We could not conclusively just say this is Bester's mother based on the DNA. We had to go on relatives and get collaborative evidence that will uh, confirm that. Thanks. Can proceed. Proceed to answer the question that was asked, uh, what happened to the body? Uh, thanks, uh, Chairperson. What I can say is that the body is still in the government mortuary. Because if I can uh, just explain what happened, the, the body was found floating on the 29th of April 2022 in Copa Bloomfontein. It was taken to the government mortuary. In the government mortuary, then they identified the body as the one they already worked on, of which it was claimed by the doctor on the 25th of April. And it was taken to a certain undertaker in Bloomfontein. And according to the undertaker, that body was buried on the 28th of April. So on the, on the 8th of April, but it was found floating on the 29th of April. Thanks, Chair Chair, Chair, uh, please indulge me. A, a, a body is found, is claimed by a doctor. It is Babu taken Shays. away. Babu Shays. Yes. I hope this is your last This is my last, no, it's a follow-up question, uh, Chair. I've, yeah. I've never been answered. A body is claimed by uh, Dr. Mandisa, uh, I, I mean Nandipa. It is found floating in a, in, in, in a river. You go, you retrieve it, take it to some mortuary, and there is no case that is being followed. I, my question is, the body was handed to her, the first body. Then it is found floating in the river. It was retrieved, and then what happened to a police case? A case should have been opened, uh, a follow-up investigation. There must be an investigating officer and all those so that the law, the law is followed. You only block her when she claims the second body, but you can't tell us what you have done as the police in terms of the very first body. I want an answer, the, the committee is, is entitled to an answer to say, what did you do as the police with the first body? Chairperson, uh, the inquiry was opened and investigated. I was saying that the inquiry was opened and investigated. That's why you even added an extra charge of violation of the dead body. So this one is the violation of the first body, not the second board. The charge you are adding. Yeah, Thank you, Chair. My oh, 10 yeah. minutes is done, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well. Next one. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Mam Jele. Only do I am Goku. Because I'll share minutes for when. <laughs> Chair, um, I did not get, um, let me welcome the report from SAPS, um, uh, the report that was flagged there or given to us is not the same as the one that we were given, Chair, I think we must note that, because I tried to follow some segments of the reports were not here, um, possibly would have been 
edited and reworked, bearing in mind that it must also include the, the, the arrest in Tanzania. Let's, let's welcome that as well. And, and, and let's also congratulate all the teams that have been working in this operation to make sure that indeed Tabo Bester is arrested or traced and found in Tanzania. And we hope you would be taken to um, our maximum C correctional centers. No more triple PPEs uh, on this matter, Commissioner, um, including the Minister of, of SAPS. Chair, um, and also let's take note of the person responsible in making sure that Dr. Nandipa gets to be investigated when she tried to claim whether it's a second board or a third board so that uh, an inquest gets to be put on this matter, possibly we wouldn't find ourselves here. But yeah, I want to understand from what Honorable Koza would have raised, how many bodies did Dr. Nandipa try to claim? Is it two, including the one that got banned, or is it one plus the one that got banned um, I'm, I'm just confused there. Thanks, Honorable Chair. Dr. Nandipa claimed the first body, which she said that it's her father. Then she went and claimed the second body, which she alleged it was the brother of a friend. Then the third body is the one when she claimed it's her husband, a customary law husband, she wants to go and cremate the body. The one of the incident in the MCC. That's correct, Chepesi. Okay. Yeah, maybe no. just a follow up. Uh, maybe just a follow up, Honorable Chair, with regard to. I uh, understand the Honorable Member is asking as to where is uh, Bester. I handed him over, Honorable Chair, to the Department of Correctional Services. Where he is, I don't know, but I gave them. <laughs> no, you. no, I was not asking where he is. I was just congratulating the efforts, the team uh, that has been tracing, working together. That joint operation, I was congratulating. I'm well aware where he's currently at right now, uh, or who takes over that process, and we can't put it on SAPS. It would be unfair uh, on that. Um, Chair, I just want to get clarity as well. Um, you, you, your document makes an indication that on the 1st of July, you would have conducted the DNA. And I don't want to get to the complicities that Honorable Koza speaks to. Um, after realizing that the body after DNA, they did not match. In actual fact, let me start with this one. When did you open a case of escape? Yeah. Chairperson, case of escape was opened by Correctional Services on the 16th of January, 2023. It gets to be opened by DCS. It's DCS, not, Chairperson. It's not, it's not a prerogative of SAPS. No, 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 it's, 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 it's DCS, uh, Chairperson. As DCS. Yes, thanks, Chairperson. When realizing that on the 1st of July, the bodies that have taken through a DNA are not speaking to each other, and you, you, you realize that we must zoom into this matter, what is it that has been done since then up until, not necessarily uh, up until the tracing was done of, 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 of Bester? I'm trying to link this in terms of the work that would have taken place between DCS, G4S, and SAPS. I understand those process of G4S not cooperating to an extent that um, information was hit, withheld and so forth. But what, what was actually the role of SAPS in entirely in this process to make sure that um, whatever that was not done correctly uh, gets to be brought to book? The left is five minutes. Hi, Bo. Can challenge it. Okay, Chair. 
Dr. Nandipa, when he came, she came to claim the body, there was an affidavit that she had. And in that affidavit, there is a stamp that it's from Pulukwane. Can we confirm that? Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, honorable members. Um, yes, um, when um, he sub she submitted the affidavit to court, there was a stamp that was um, made um, at Pulukwane. Uh, um, we did investigate also it's part of the investigation. No, no, I just want you to confirm. Yes. The stamp was in Polokwa. Correct. Uh, and then coming to Bloemfontein uh, to use that affidavit. Yes. And the officer that would have signed that affidavit is Officer Moremi. Correct. And it is found that Officer Moremi was dismissed in January when an affidavit was written in February or March Correct. or April was dismissed in January. What steps did we take after realizing that the person would have authorized an affidavit was dismissed from service? Um, I think as, as the provincial in, uh, commissioner has indicated, because this investigation, um, the more we dig in, the more we found more evidence that needed to be collaborated. Um, the issue of uh, Moremi, who is dismissed with the stem uh, that was attached on the, on the, on the um, affidavit, is also part of the investigation. Um, like we indicated, the investigation is broader than just the escape, uh, because it also involves issues of the documents that were also received from court that need also to be verified that we feel that um, there was some fraudulent document that we are receiving court. So like we indicated, it's a very broad um, investigation that is involving a lot of stakeholders, a lot of people. So hence, um, we still continue the investigation so that when we start effecting arrest, everything comes um, 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 uh, to full force so that we don't have a case whereby it's being uh, withdrawn or uh, nolly prosecute based on the gaps or loopholes. So. That is basically what, what is happening with regard to that investigation of the affidavit that was signed in Polokwan. Thank you, Chair. The controller in TCS that is assigned or stationed at the MCC would have opened a letter to open a case of an escape on the 14th of January, which then a case number would have been issued on the 16th. Is this correct? The, the A1 statement chairperson I made a copy of it was signed on the 16th of January when the kennel, uh, the kennel from who is the, who is the lead in this investigation was called to correctional services and opened the case and made sure that the same day it was registered on our systems. Can we get verification of that, that a letter from TCS controller did not do that on the 14th and an actual case was done on the 16th? Why did we take so long to, up to bring those who would have been listed or fired by G4X, especially pending your investigation when you realize that here something does not add up to questioning? Might not be opening a case against them, but just to bring them for questioning. Um, Chair, as indicated um, earlier, um, there has been a struggle in terms of cooperation from DCS. Even um, employees were not willing to talk um, with regard to this case. Hence, um, we needed to engage also JIGS to say we are struggling. We are also struggling with regard to the data of the uh, IT equipment. So we needed also their intervention so that we can be able to access those. The other thing, Chair, is that because members, employees were not willing to come um, to the party and talk, uh, because we already, from the first day, um, I think there were red flags to indicate that this was not a suicide. Um, so based on that, because of the time delay, if you look at the whole thing, um, it was uh, they, they alleged that the fire started at three, but they called the police at six o'clock. There was also um, a lot of issues regarding the extent of the damage. Can I cut you because I'm only left for a few seconds. Okay. Upon arriving at the scene, um, cell 35. Honorable, uh, Honorable Jale has instructed me to give you five minutes of your yes. time. Then after Honorable Jale, it will be Honorable Yanko. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
it's good to be groomed in this house. You get the, the, such privileges without expropriating anyone's time. Um, upon realizing, upon the call time, you have been, a fire broke at 2.30 a.m. Um, it would have been registered to say it's 3 a.m. It's another matter, but you get to be, quest to be called at 10 past six in the morning. You get to the scene, which is the cell 35 in Broadway. Upon arriving, um, based on inmates and with the confirmation of jigs when investigating the inmates that, or an inmate that was assigned to clean, was the, the cell tempered with in terms of evidence or evidence the scene was tempered with when, when, when subs arrived at the scene or whoever was dealing with the investigation or authorized to go to the scene? Uh, Chairperson, according to the members who went to the crime scene, they said that there was no tempering of the crime scene. Thank you. There is no tempering of the crime scene. We have an inmate that alludes that he was told to come and clean the scene of an incident using hot water to an extent that he seeks uh, refuge for his life uh, and then there's no tempering. Who was the officer authorized to go to the scene on the actual incident day? Jefferson, it was Colonel Storm who was the detective of, uh, officer of the station of Bloomsbury. Is he still part of the investigation? He retired, Jefferson. When did he retire? I think Last year, November, December, around there, but it's not long time ago, Chairperson. He retired whilst the, the investigation was still ongoing. Correct, Chairperson. He is 60, if I can remember. What is the age? I know DCS officials retired 60 years. Um, what is the age of retirement in SAPS? Is it, is it the same thing? 60 years, Chairperson. Is this the same thing? Did we, with Wallace, who are continuing with investigation, do we have an idea of bringing him on board to further these investigations? As he was an officer that went, who first uh, was on the scene. Bearing in mind what an inmate would have said. And this is an inmate that says, I'm willing to provide evidence of this matter. I did it. Not I assumed or I seen. I did the cleaning up. Thanks, Chair. Uh, to answer that question, Chair, the crime scene, we do have crime scene photos which was uh, conducted by our uh, local criminal records. You are not answering me. I don't want photos and crime scene. Do we have any chance of bringing the retired yes, Chair, official sir. that yes. went to the scene to further assist us in these investigations? Yes, Chairperson. Thank you, Chair. Chair? Just one correction on, the, on the retiring age of the South African police. is 60. But the decision was taken that they can retire at 55, trying to, <laughs> trying to save some money. And indeed, quite a big chunk of them, they are, re they are retiring between 55 and 60. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, you very minister. much, Minister. Honorable Chairman, you have five minutes. You Thank decided chair. to donate. No problem, Chair. In your fact, other I, I still wanted to give her more because as our, as I wanted her to get that information. You still Unless want to do that? she's done. As long as she's done. No, I'm done, Chair. Thank you. Thank chair. you. Thank you. Okay. Chair, my, my first question is that there is a disc, uh, there's a, uh, 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 what is it? Time, uh, I don't want to say it that it's a discrepancy, but I wanted to say time that uh, the fire happens or uh, broke up, it was 3, 3 a.m. And then the police came six, ten past 6. Is it normal? Chairperson, uh, it's not normal, but the call was received at the police station at 10 past 6. The members then attended Thank to the you. Thank you. My time is just limited. Thank you. Uh, 
So it means the official was, uh, the inmate was still cleaning by then. And then the second question, Chair, is that do we, are we sure that we have best now? Th th thanks, uh, Honorable uh, Chairperson. Let me assure the committee, firstly, that uh, all inmates from Mangau Correction Service uh, who are involved, we have got their affidavits as part of the investigation. Uh, coming to, are we sure we have Bester? Yes, indeed. We do have uh, a Bester. While he was in Tanzania, we ran his fingerprints. His fingerprints taken by Tanzanian police there was sent here. We ran it and it came out positive with his criminal record, the previous criminal record. Uh, as I explained a little bit earlier about the issue of DNA's mother and himself, we have to take note that it has been discovered that this uh, person do not have an identity document. So the criminal record was the only one that were able to assist us that it is indeed best. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. My other question, Chair, would be, how is, in your investigation, did you maybe find out how easy it is for a civilian to be uh, able to claim the body from the mortuary when he's not an insurance company or anything? Uh, thanks, 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 special. Because initially, after we picked up of the doctor claiming bodies, we start, we first started checking whether was she not claiming for the sake of insurance. That one was not; it was not confirmed. Then we thought that maybe because she was a doctor, body parts, it was not. Then that's where we went to this other route, which now started to link us more to G4S. Thanks, Chairperson. In your investigation, have you maybe find out who is ditching bodies in this government mortuary? Uh, Chairperson is part of, of the investigation because the first body she claimed that the government mortuary, the second body was from National Hospital because the first body died as a result of culpable homicide. The second body, they said it was a natural cause. Thanks, Chairperson. In your investigation, did you find out why this body and not this body? I mean... That not be part of the ongoing investigation? Yes, that's what I wanted to find out, that have they noted that they still has to go and find out why this body and why not the other one? Because uh, where I'm getting, Chair, is that we in this uh, government mortuary, we might be having bodies that are not claimed. That has been there for a long time. That maybe this business of selling bodies has been going on, maybe for multi or anything. Thank you, Chair. It, it, it has been noted, Chairperson, and we'll follow that route also. Thanks. Thank you. Just w w one issue, uh, National Commissioner. You said Mr. Bester does not have an ID. Correct. Uh, so we don't know if he is a South African or a foreigner? No, he is a South African by criminal record. The person who served at uh, Mangaung Correctional Service Center is the same person that we was arrested by Tanzanians. As I said, the Tanzanians took fingerprints, they sent it to us and we ran it through the system and it was confirmed it is him. Uh, and as he arrived here again, we took Bakal Sabu, we're gonna do the second uh, DNA, but he is uh, South African. He is Tabo Bester, Honorable Chair, even though, as I said, uh, on the ID part, there is 
uh, a problem because there is other two turbo boosters with IDs that are out there. And this one, of course, it doesn't have IDs, so you won't find him there. Thanks, Dr. Bush. So the person who was at Mangawung Correctional Center who has been arrested uh, in uh, Tanzania, how, 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 what did you do to verify that he is a South African if he does not have an ID? Honorable Chair, we verified him through his criminal record of the previous crime that he committed that he was saving at uh, various correctional service centers in South Africa. You would recall that the criminal record center of the South African Police Service, we have databases of people that have previously committed crime, uh, not those that uh, haven't committed crime. So, because he served, he has committed crime, we took his fingerprints then, we took his DNA. Now, we were able to identify it is him, Honorable Chair. Thank you, Chair, um, for your indulgence. Um, I think SAPS has been um, a passive partner in this whole investigation. And um, I think we're missing the key role you should have played um, as the investigating, the main investigating space. Firstly, you have someone who's claimed two bodies. Those bodies are claimed three times. One of those bodies was found floating. One of those bodies is confirmed to not be the person claimed to be that person. Two bodies claimed three times. And yet, the SAPS did not bring the person into custody, and yet there's no record of the SAPS arresting that person, there's no record of the SAPS charging that person. And you even have the nerve to tell us that you suspected of a body parts syndicate, but yet you did not bring that person to SAPS to say, we are suspecting that you are involved at a high level of moving human parts. Can you explain to us how it is that Dr. Nandipa, who has claimed two bodies, was not brought and charged and arrested based on you finding those two bodies under her name. If uh, as I've indicated that there was an inquiry registered and that this was a prosecutorial guided investigation, there's a prosecutor dedicated to this team dealing with these cases of what happened in G4S. She's been guiding the police throughout. And that's why Dr. Nandipa, oh sorry. That's why the investigation where we are now is at an advanced stage and anything will happen at any time. Thanks. One more question. No, I don't have a question, I have a comment, Chair. There seems to be no will from the police. It seems as if you gave this away to someone else. Your role was to investigate, make recommendations, arrest. You had information, you had forensic reports, you had answers, you had a body, you had another body, and yet you did nothing, and you're telling us about an inquiry? I don't think we can accept that, and we've not been looking at you because we're busy with G4S who's taking us for a ride, whereas we've got a state entity which is supposed to protect us, not doing what it's supposed to do. So what did you expect us to do? Seems to be a question. Okay. <laughs> uh, Honorable Chair, uh, thanks. Honorable Chair members, the brief I got is that this was discovered on the, the body that is claimed to be Tabo Bester. That was the last body. And thereafter, they went caught uh, fighting for funeral and fight, subs fighting to keep the body not uh, to be cremated. And in that process, they were still there, and that's when they were still investigating the, whether the previous bodies is it the same person. And after that, the, uh, the alleged uh, doctor vanished, and that's when he was wanted. Uh, the PC can add on that, thanks.
I venture to say that the, the SAPS came here unprepared. The SAPS came here to this committee. Firstly, they were oscillating around who's going to present to us with themselves, and they came here unprepared, and I, I, I don't think we can take that, because G4S is got a partnership with GCS, so they're on the side. However, you, as our protector and security in this country, you are supposed to come to us and say, we did our best to apprehend these criminals. We did our best to make sure we don't waste state resources. We've got a flight from Tanzania bringing these two people down here right now. On whose paycheck is that coming from? Because you failed to apprehend her when she was here, when you had evidence from last year. You did not do that. And I don't think we can accept it, Chair, as a committee. We can't. Uh, I allowed you to proceed because you were still within your five minutes. But if you are not within your five minutes, I wouldn't have allowed you to proceed. So are you expecting an answer on the paycheck? Over to you, Commissioner. Chairperson, can the question be repeated? I'll do so very slowly, Chair. We have two bodies that were found to not be the people. There's an investigation by the SAPS finding that those people are not the people that were claimed to be by one person. They're claimed three times. Your timeline tells us that. Yet you did not bring that person into your space to say, we have suspicion that you have done this, we have proof. You did not say that. You did not apprehend, you did not charge, you did nothing. Wasted all this time, a year later, even with DCS's incompetence and G4S's lack of cooperation, you did not do your part as SAPS. And now we have criminals that are outside of the borders of South Africa who we must then fly into the country for us to then charge again, go through all that process on whose monies, on South Africa's paycheck, who's going to take that person and bring them here. So I'm asking, how did you allow that to get to a stage where it did not happen in the timelines that it was supposed to happen in? Chairperson, it was not an easy investigation. Um, each and every time you investigate, then something out comes more. As I said, that there was a prosecutor who was guiding us. We were presenting the cases before her, and then she will give us advice. She will ask questions. We will go back. And as I'm stating now, the charges now have been added, and the relevant people will be charged. Thanks, Chairperson. Thank you. Um, I think this side, uh, I forgot the, the sequence. Can you raise your hands? Uh, Honorable Nibot Duchan, Honorable Swart, Honorable Engelbert. Okay, one, two, three, okay. And then Honorable Chance will be the last. Thank you, Chair. Um, on slide six, the charges are listed there, um, fraud, perjury, violation of a dead body, aiding and abetting an escape, um, and defeating the ends of justice. I just wanted to know these charges are to who? Is it Dr. Nandipa or Bester? Just clarity. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, as indicated, because the um, investigation has been done with the prosecutor, those charges are um, against the current suspect that have been arrested, um, that appeared in court, um, um, I think it was yesterday, um, as well as the one that, um, which is um, uh, the employee of G4S, the father. Um, also, the charges here include um, the doctor, um, as well as uh, the, for escape, it will include also the, um, the main suspect, which is um, Tabo Bester. 
then um, some of the charges, uh, uh, Chair, we are still going to add more people because of their contribution. Like indicated um, earlier, um, we need to collaborate some of the information that we are having. We, it will be premature to go and effect arrest when we've not necessarily done our investigation properly so that we don't end up having to have matters that are withdrawn in court. So it's important that we get information like uh, uh, we already have some of the inmates that we requested through JICS that they be allocated to other prisons so that we can get their statement because they were not willing to cooperate with SAPS. So hence we need more information and we need okay, to Okay, thank collaborate. you, thank you. Earlier, okay. earlier you said that DCS made um, a submission for the charge of the escape, right? DCS. Okay, right. So that is, is that being investigated as well? Correct, Jefferson. Okay, okay. So then, secondly, the cause of the fire, is SAPS investigating that as well? Correct, Jefferson. Okay, fine. Um, clear, so I'm hoping that we as the committee can get the final report of all the investigations once it is completed. And, uh, and then secondly, I wanted to say, I'm a little bit worried from the time that you knew that this was not Bester, up until today, you know, nothing, that nothing came before any committee, I'm assuming both this committee and the police, that we have a major escape, so nothing came before us. So I just wanted to know why no information was forthcoming. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, like I indicated, um, because of the fact that um, there was that preliminary or red flag that we've established, also there was that post-mortem report that shows that um, the cause of death might not have been through burn. Um, also, the fact that now there was this court application whereby um, our suspect is also um, uh, claiming the body. We did not want, because when we received the first DNA uh, comparing the mother of Tabo Bester as well as the child body, we needed to, co to get to do further investigation. So based on that, it was not possible for us to open an escape case because G4S was still adamant as the custodian that we don't have an escape. Um, the dead body, that the child body that is in the cell is, is that I'm of Sorry, Chair, I'm going to interrupt you there. I just wanted to say I don't know why you left it to G4S with their adamancy or whatever the case may be. I mean, it's up to you to investigate that there was an escape because you knew the DNA proof that the body was not based there. But I'm going to leave it there for now. Thank you, Chair. Do you want to comment or you're fine? Yes, Chair. I, I wanted to indicate that despite the fact that G4S was not opening a case, SAPS was still continuing with its investigation. Hence, it managed to get the bodies that was found and trying to establish what is the relation of our doctor to these bodies that were found. And how is this body that were found related to the child body that was found in the cell? So that, info, that investigation, it still needs to be because we still don't know who is the deceased child body in the cell. So it's important for us to have all that information. We can even link whoever that is able, because if she was not working alone, there are other people that are working with her that are necessary for us to get the statement and also to collaborate to put them to the scene so that we can know that they were part of the, of the syndicate. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Honorable Swart. Thank you, Chair. Very, very briefly, I think my, our concern and the public's concern is the lack of advising the public to the fact that a dangerous serial rapist and murderer was out and had escaped and was in the public domain. Now, I appreciate there's a process of investigation. I fully appreciate that, and there is a certain confidentiality required in that. But 
in the investigating officer, Captain Flyman, already on the 25th of May, that's the same month as this event took place, indicates according to the timeline of JICS, suspicion about events at the cell. And then the investigation comes on. And then the brigadier does incredibly good work with that high court application in Gauteng, which is opposed and blocked. Now at that stage already, there should have been an investigation for perjury against the doctor following your successful opposition of that high court action. Why was there no investigation then already against Dr. Nandipa for perjury that was very clear in that case? The Judge Cameron pointed out a number, he said there were a number of inconsistencies with the affidavits that were filed. So yes, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. You did well with the application, but the question then is, at that stage already, in June of last year, there was information that firstly indicated that Tabo Bester was not the person that died, and yes, it's ongoing, but my concern is at what stage and what is the process of the police? Commissioner, maybe you can help us. At what stage do you warn the public that there's a dangerous person out there that you're looking for him. I've seen those adverts. We're looking for this person. He's a, a person of interest. And at what stage do you warn the victims, the rape victims, that this person who was convicted is possibly out? Can you help us with this? Because that's a question that everyone is asking. Thanks, uh, Honorable Chair Pastor. Uh, yeah, I think uh, we will take uh, responsibility as subs to say maybe we did not want the public in time. But uh, Honorable Chairperson, what uh, made a bit of a trick around whether is this Tabu Bester? Initially, the mother was uncooperative. She said she will talk us through a lawyer, which is a right. And uh, we struggled to to get that, those affidavits. And until some of the relatives, we were able to obtain their statements, and then to an extent that then we can, it was early this year, we can be able to come to a conclusion that it was indeed a uh, Tabo Bester. Because as I said, the fact that that DNA ruled out uh, the mother and Tabo Bester, the question was, as the mother was quite uncooperative for some time. The question is, is it the real mother? And that brings further the question whether is that Tabo Bester? So we, we had that problem. We had to get collaborative evidence from relatives around that confirm, yes, this is the son to this one, this is the son to this one. So that investigation did take a little bit of time, yes, uh, but yes, maybe we, w we acknowledge we might have not done it early enough to warn the public until uh, the my colleague, the commissioner, uh, went out to the public. Thanks. General, I just generally, what is the policy in warning victims of crime, or is there a policy when a, p and when a person has escaped and you know here was a person, uh, witness or someone that is at risk, is there a policy in place? Uh, there is a policy around uh, identification parades, honorable chair, and uh, in the process of investigation, we, uh, yes, in some cases we do, but in some cases the, there is a, there is an intricacy that if you take out a photo of uh, somebody throw it out there as wanted. It will depend on analysis by the IO. It always, uh, at some point, it have this problem that you can't go and do identification parade once you arrest the person. Because when you go for ID parade, the defense will say, but this person was all over, so you can't say this one knows this one because he saw him everywhere. So in this case, uh, yes, there are those intricacies. But, but I, I'm speaking specifically about on your police dockets, you would have the victims, the sexual offenses victims, the rape victims. Those are the ones that I'm asking about a policy. 
Okay, you've got a convicted criminal of rape, Facebook rapist. Now you know your dockets, there are two, there are rape victims here. What is your policy in advising those rape victims that this person might be out? Is there a policy to warn those people? Yeah, we, yeah, not maybe one, but we have a policy around the victims of crime. I'm aware of the yeah. victims of crime, but in a particular case where the people might be a danger, and, and maybe that's something we need to look into, because yeah. obviously here you had suspicions of a person had escaped, and you've got surviving victims of crime, and of course women in general would be concerned, but I'm talking mm. about specifically, and that's something we can look at okay. in future, time's limited. Um, can I just ask you, on the 18th of October, the JIX reports that you met with SAPS and JIX, and you indicated SAPS have reason to believe that a dead person might have been smuggled into the cell and the cell set on fire to fabricate a suicide. SAPS requests Jig's assistance to bring in the Hawks. Now why, why would you do that, the director? Did you want to escalate the level of the offense being investigated? Honorable Chairperson, I'll, I'll ask the Provincial Commissioner to co comment on that. The Hawks are part of SAPS, and I don't have to ask anybody external to assist uh, myself talking to the Hawks or the Provincial Commissioner, but uh, maybe she can comment better on that. Thanks. Uh, th thanks, sir. Sorry, before, uh, Minister. Chairperson, on, on, on two things. The question of Informing the community is correct, but there is a cash 22 situation here on Pesta Pese that you are investigating. You might be warning him and his accomplices when you begin to warn that he must run. So, it, as I'm saying, the cash 22, when you need this sympathetic with the victims and all that, but at the same time, remember for some time. Uh, th th there was this contradiction even within the, the agencies to say, she said, that person was in there when it has been established that is not him. So I, I, I will leave with the 20, uh, that uh, problem of, of, of when is it, but the policy to be developed, and there are two kinds of escapees. There are escapees that escape from the custody of the South African Police Service. And there is, uh, are those that escape from the correctional service. And then they will move. Correctional service will, will, will be responsible for hunting those supported by the South African police. But those that escape from the South African police will be by the South African police, which means they've got a, a broader leeway on them. But indeed, it would be good to find the police. When do you get the, the, the community to know without jeopardizing your own investigations uh, to find, uh, to find that, to that person? Thank you, Minister. Just my particular inf emphasis was on the victims of crime there, the surviving victims, but I appreciate your response. There's something to develop. Can I just quickly, I know my time is limited. The two issues I raised earlier with Jix, that is that the investigative journalists um, on, on their version emailed the brigadier asking if there was a police official to whom they could refer sources about Bester's whereabouts. This is in March this year. And the response was, um, uh, 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 the response was that Crime Stop could be contacted or it could be reported using my SAPS app. Now, surely that is unacceptable given the role that they had played as in, in giving information, um, that they'd been sharing information as they were uncovered it and getting leaks. And I understand there are a lot of fabricated issues as well, but this is a reputable organization that is giving a lot of attention. And then secondly, generals, particularly um, here, your comment on the 26th of March about the leaking of sensitive and confidential information to media houses. And I appreciate it can prejudice. I'm a lawyer, I understand it can prejudice a criminal investigation from the police's side. But the fact is that it can also assist you greatly. And so by saying that, we, it's been looked into by authorities. Does it, 
the, 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 unfortunately what it creates is the impression is the whistleblowers and investigative journalists are being pursued as opposed to the actual criminals, the wardens, everyone involved in this. Uh, would you comment on that? Thank you so much. Before Chair President, I was going to answer the first question of the Hawks. Uh, I don't know why Hawks will ask from the judge, or the, the investigating team in, in Free State will ask the judge to bring in the Hawks. Hawks have the mandate, got two mandates. They've got the mandate of being invited to the case or themselves taking over the case. They look at the weight of the case, how much it threatened the state. They deal with those cases that will threaten the, 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 the state. So if they felt, the investigating team in Free State, that there was an issue, they themselves, through their leadership, through the Provincial Commission, National Commission, they would have dropped in without really uh, 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 going through the charge. But Chair, may, may I raise the issue uh, on, the, on the last one, the, the app and all the answer. It, I, I, I wish, while it's good to go to meet and all that, I wish the same information from Jigs would have been raised with the police. So uh, to us, that would really help. Maybe if they are seen not to be coming on board on the matter, then it goes nothing going to the, to, the, to the media, but the difference, others are investigating, others are making news. So it would be, it would be good that uh, uh, by the time it goes there, but it also sheds so that they go on a thorough kind of uh, investigation. Minister, yes, yes, and I agree with you, and the, minister, uh, the judge did make that concession as well, <laughs> but maybe there was an incorrect reflection there of that note uh, because it does make sense to me, the SAP's asking Jigs to go to Hawks. Clearly, you, you would, um, as the general, you would instruct the Hawks yourselves. But uh, maybe, General, um, if you could just respond to that last issue, because it does, it is a matter of concern to us, and I think to investigative journalists as well, that you are, what, what is purported here seems to s indicate that it's a chilling effect on whistleblowers, on investigative journalists, um, when, in fact, maybe you should be spending your time investigating the case, which you are doing. Thank you, Chief. Um, thanks, uh, Honorable Chair and members. Uh, <coughs> yes, I think, uh, well, the Brigadier, what he did was incorrect. Actually, also, early May, uh, I did, uh, firstly, early this year, we capacitated further the task team. Uh, the team in Houghton consisted of one, I mean two uh, uh, officers. We increased it to 18 Houghton, over 18, and we increased it also in the Free State. And during that meeting, I said there should be two investigators in both the provinces, and their numbers must be given out for evidence. And the numbers, the, 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 their names were given out in the Free State, Brigadier Mkaulezi and Flyman, in Houting, it was severe, and I said the numbers, the spokesperson must give that to the public so that they can only talk to those uh, two people. Uh, to refer them to 08600, well, it was wrong because I directed the spokesperson to give uh, those details. And with regard to investigative uh, journalism, uh, well, that statement was issued on the basis that there were journalists that were assisting us in terms of uh, giving information, but there were those, uh, unfortunately maybe we didn't clarify it, there were those that were trying to mislead us, so we don't know who were behind them, but we could see that they are really uh, misleading us, so it was a warning to those. Maybe we're not uh, clear in terms of distinguishing between the two. Thanks, Honorable Chair. Chair, just also to commend after all the issues that we've had, the arrest that did take place eventually. So I think we do need a commendation in that regard. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Engelberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, most of my questions have already been posed, so I will be rather short, I think. Um, Tabu Bester being rearrested is obviously um, a very important individual 
because he would be able to shed light on all this bizarre uh, things that led to his escape. Um, however, it's, it, it's very clear that there's a lot of interests and a lot of money involved here. So I am very concerned about uh, whether Mr. Bester will be alive long enough to be questioned by the police. So I would want to know when will uh, the South African Police Service conduct an interview with Mr. Bester where he is incarcerated at the present moment? Thanks, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, the investigation have started. Uh, yeah, what format, where, but the investigation have started with the investigating officers of both the provinces. Thank you very much. You, you are done. Honorable Chancha. Oh, I, I thought you said you, you don't want to ask questions. Okay, Honorable Breitenbach. Are you going to answer, uh, ask question after Honorable Hon? Okay. Honorable Hon, please, Honorable Hon, just uh, do us a favor. Uh, expropriate all her uh, time. No, I want to expropriate Yankee's time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, the one thing that's not quite clear to me, and maybe uh, given what Justice Cameron also said this morning about the lack of trust um, in, in all role players and stakeholders in the criminal justice value chain. Uh, we can slowly start building trust again if the answer is yes. Can we at least get a confirmation that Dr. Nandipa was questioned by SAPS before ground up ultimately middle of March? published the report that, that brought all of the wheels of the justice system into, uh, into action, seemingly. Oh, uh, Chairperson, uh -huh. according to my information, she was not yet questioned. Yeah, um, maybe I must just leave it there. Um, so you you now say your 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 investigation in, isn't at advanced stage. When Ground Up published their expose on the fifteenth of March, followed I believe what by what really convinced you to get in, into action, the, the photos on the 16th of March. Where were, you at, where were you with that investigation then? What, what did you believe happened? Uh, and who were your suspects? Uh, Chairperson, she was still one of the suspects, but by then she was already on the run. Yeah, so maybe at the risk of, of just repeating myself, I mean, the minister now made, uh, gave us the assurance that the decision not to go public was, re was really all informed by the risk of warning suspects. So if she was a suspect, even though you chose not to question her at any stage, and if you didn't want to take the public into confidence and warn the public, importantly, because you felt it's more important to keep everything under wraps, 
was her movements and her home watched? And if so, uh, how did she? How did she then? How was she able to flee? Did she maybe phone the Guptas in in the United Arab Emirates and advice, get their advice? advice? Or, or was she watched? I mean, that's basically the question. Given the minister's assurance that this was all informed by the need to to tread carefully and not alert the suspects. Chairperson, for the answer, my 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 statement is on Besta. Oh, yes. So does that mean that by then you've not linked Besta to the good doctor? My issue of responding to the question by Honourable Sir, that is a cash 22 situation. Remember, we acknowledged that it would have been good that especially those individuals that were victim previously would have been warned. Mm. But at the same time, they would not have warned best that we know that you're out there. So this this statement is based on best per se. Yeah. Thanks. But, but best obviously, well, I, I don't want to say obviously. Uh, to my mind, logically speaking, would not go into hiding as an individual. So does, does your answer then mean, Minister, that up to that stage, despite the fact that there was these bizarre circumstances around claiming unclaimed bodies and finding familial relationships which saps, it, it, it rightly so, well, seemingly, raised alarm bells at saps, but not alarm bells which necessitated action. Despite those bizarre circumstances, does that then yet still mean that at that stage, SAPS has not put one and one together and realized that the answer is two, the likelihood that this doctor is involved is very high? Maybe the answer is three. <laughs> well, even four. Well, even, even, I think that... Even, that <laughs> chair, even four, even five, even six. Yeah. Because... What is very clear here, that this is not even a tango of two. It's not for Pesta and the and, uh, doctor. Yeah. It goes vertical and perpendicular. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we just believe that uh, maybe that's one point that has not been made, to say why, why we, we have to really respect this board and all this, but uh, investigation is less than making news, or is more than making news. Uh, you, that, there are quite cases that uh, they'll take you a year, two, three, four. For instance, I think the Honorable Judge and Mr. Swart, they raised the issue of perjury for, for Dr. Nandipa with the body. An investigator will realize that this is less. I need more here. And the investigator will be led by the investigation as the judge, honorable judge, has that he, he would have expect, expected that there he will be arrested. You might, you might go for the immediate one and you lose the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. And the, with Nandipa, it was very clear that there's a bigger picture. Uh, I, I, I had Honorable PR2 raising the matter. I, 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 I would say that the, there will be time where even at the ministry level you get impatient, very impatient, with this thing that seems to be obvious and you'll be told that cool off. You are, <laughs> you are jeopardizing our case. We are going for th this case at this level. We are dealing with sardines. We are going for sharks here. Give us that opportunity. And uh, th th that's, that's, that's an area and the pressures that we face with the communities. Unfortunately, at the minister, ministerial level is where you need to answer uh, on this matter when they delay. But it's where you need to answer when they fall apart. Uh, for instance, I'm answering on the question of uh, 
uh, Honorable Katia's daughter, because the case seems to have been fallen apart. Mm -hmm. But also you answer if you delay. So th th there is that situation, cash 22 situation, that, that happens here. Uh, you will be wondering that the questions you answer here are the questions that sometimes and most of them you answer when you, when you are briefed by the team. And the team will remind you that you are not the investigator. <laughs> the investigator is informed by the investigation who to follow, when to follow, when to act. So there is that, there is that situation. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I'll, I'll conclude by just saying that that's all well and fine to remind us that there's this bigger picture and sometimes there's a, a method to the madness, so to speak, and a broader strategy. But even if that is then the case in, in respect of the good doctor, the question then, which is written largely across this room, is why was the doctor's movements then not at least monitored, even if it is to be accepted that SAPS had a, a reasonable reason not to bring her in for questioning at any stage. So that doesn't explain that failure. It also doesn't explain, and the minister says sometimes in the police one-on-one -on -one is, is three or four or five, and he talks about horizontal and vertical movements. I think that's what we as ordinary citizens would call joining the dots. And it would seem SAPS either didn't want to join the dots or didn't have the ability to do so. Thanks, Jim. Yes, uh, the minister would say he has already answered. Uh, Honorable Breitenbach. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'd like to make clear at the outset that my comments that may follow do not include the brigadier sitting over there. She's expressly excluded. Uh, as is the young man who, who uh, assisted her in doing his job. So, two of them, this doesn't apply to you. Uh, you say that you were struggling. I think, I'm sorry, I can't see your rank from here. No. You, yes. I, I don't know your name and I can't see your rank. Thank you. You say that you struggle to get cooperation from DCS. Is that correct? I think G4S. G4S, DCS, whomsoever. Who did you struggle with? G4S, Chairperson. You're a Lieutenant General, did you say? Yes, Chairperson. That's quite a rank. How, tell, tell me, how does a lieutenant general in the South African police force struggle to get anything from anyone in this country? Please explain that. Uh, Chairperson, with the challenges we have, that's why we, uh, we did get Section 205, because there are processes to follow. We did get Section 205 against G4S on the documentation we want. And further on that, then we started communicating through uh, JIGS and DCS itself. Thanks, Chairperson. You needed to get a Section 205 subpoena in order to get information from G4S. Is that what you're telling us? We needed those documents for investigation, Chairperson. Then we sectioned them so that we can get those documentation. I wish you told me that yesterday. Um, who is the prosecutor who's leading this prosecutor? Lead investigation? Advocate Amanda Bestel, Chairperson. From where? From Bloomfontein Court. Good. Uh, can, can somebody tell me, perhaps it's an answer that the DCS will give, so I won't ask you. Uh, can somebody tell me why it was necessary to charter a private jet in order to bring Bestel and this woman back to South Africa? The police have a jet. The state has another jet. Uh, why was it necessary to charter a private jet? <coughs> Thanks, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, if the police had to transport all the people from that side to here, uh, after the team met the Tanzanian team, they established that for any uh, deportation, 
uh, does not involve the police. When you deport anybody from a country, uh, you deport the person, probably uh, people that are responsible for immigration are the ones that uh, come on board, but you don't deport through uh, police. Police can assist in the process. I'm sorry, that doesn't answer my question. Why Cha do you need to charter a private jet? Chairperson, simply put, it was part of negotiations with the officials on the other side that it would be their pleasure if the the is done the way that it, it, wa it was done. So we had to respect those negotiations. With so the Tanzanians <laughs> wanted to fly to South Africa in a pl private jet. Is that what you're saying? It's a yes or no answer. No, I'm not going to answer that way. No, not at all. Then don't answer. You can tell others to answer yes or no. No, don't I'm answer. Absolutely not mm. in court yet. We, we send a team to negotiate. The, te the team left on the 9th. So it would be initially the extradition or the, if not extradition, is a deportation. So we advise which is a better one, which is an easier one. So we had to negotiate with that. So th th that was, was raised by the team as we were in contact with the team to say they would be more comfortable if something private rather than the police comes. So we had to respect that. Thanks. So. Mm. What is the case number of this particular investigation, this escape, murder, violation of dead bodies, whatever? Chairperson, for the escape is Blue Spray case 316 of 1 2023. Fraud and violation of the body is Park Road case 1572 3 2023. The murder is Blue Spray case 2895 2022. Batu case 401021 is for culpable homicide where the body of the father was claimed. Thanks, Chairperson. So the escape was registered in January 2023. Correct, Chair Person. Despite the fact that you knew about it many months earlier. Why was it why did it take so long to register on the criminal asset system? From the subs of site we did register an inquiry. Together with GC, D, DCS, they indicated who they are still busy with their investigation. That's why when they, are, they were ready with their investigation, DCS, Mr. Mohuang, approached us to say on instruction of their national office, they are to register as case based on the, rec on the report they received. Uh, General, I'm sorry, but I, I'm having trouble with this. DCS does not have an investigative capacity as far as I'm aware. They investigate escapes within the prison environment, but they don't investigate criminal matters. They have no capacity to investigate criminal matters. That's entirely your purview. Am I correct? There are, but Chairperson, there were things they need to verify because firstly, who's Tabo Bester? Was Tabo Bester supposed to be in, DC, uh, in, in Group 4? Is Tabo Bester not in one of the cells in Group 4? Those are the information they were supposed to verify for uh, to us as the police. And that took uh, six months? That's when they said December they are ready, Chairperson. It took six months. Is that what you're telling us? Yes, correct, Chairperson. So when DCS came uh, to us to say they are ready with the A1 statement. Thank the police you. sat on their hands and did nothing for six months so that DCS could run through the, 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 the prison in Mangaung and see if Tobo Bester wasn't in another cell. Chairperson, I think even as it was indicated by Judge Cameroon, or he indicated or they must finalize the report so that the report can be submitted and we take it from there. Thanks, Chairperson. 
I listened quite carefully, uh, and this is directed at the Minister. Uh, I listened quite carefully to your explanation of Catch-22. Is you fond of that, uh, that phrase, Catch-22? Three three minutes. Sorry, how many? Like three minutes. Thank you. You're fond of the uh, use of the phrase Catch-22, and you sometimes apply it appropriately, and sometimes you apply it conveniently. Uh, a Catch-22 situation, you described to the Honourable Swart that uh, you didn't inform the public of the escape uh, because it was a Catch-22. It may have alerted Bester that, uh, that you were on the lookout for him uh, and you didn't want to compromise the investigation. Well, yes, but don't you think that uh, the public interest in this instant trumps the investigation of the police that was going absolutely nowhere until January? It also of the public interest that when the arrest is effected, that case stands the test of time. Uh, but already, I don't know why that question comes, because it has been considered that indeed, in re-looking really at things, at least the victims would have been taken on board. I'm getting to the victims, General. I'm getting to the victims. Now we're talking about the public, <laughs> the South African public, citizens who live in this country are entitled because your job is to make sure they're safe living in this country. That's your job. And you allow a serial rapist and murderer to run around doing as he pleases while you know that that's the case and you don't inform the citizens of this country. And you say it's a catch-22. Well, Chairperson, let me repeat. We're not making news. We're investigating. It is important, then, now, and forever, to say the police, they investigate, and they put those people out of circulation. To say you will announce that it be careful. People will say, now it is mad. You go and get that person, and we have been on that track. That's why today, at two o'clock, it was expected that the other one appears in court, the other one it's at Mampura and all that. It's the work that has been followed, including, there is this famous one, maybe I can come to it, including to say uh, the, the arrest uh, in, 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 in Arusha towards Kenya has nothing to do with the South African authorities. It's got a lot to do. Maybe those are things that will be kept there until the case comes and all that. The, the, major, yeah. the, 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 the major work of the police is very defined. It's very defined on 205. Investigate, prevent, and the, indeed, I fully agree with you. At this one, it would have been on the limited way of talking with the families, the victims, Indeed, the point is taken on board. But broadly, it would be good to say this has happened and we have arrested those people, people of South Africa, as it has happened. Minister, I, I would like to say two things to you because I probably only have a minute left. You don't. <laughs> huh? I don't. Yankee, give me a minute. <laughs> you give me a minute. Oh, I will give you that give minute give uh, so that you assist the committee going forward say two things to you. One, please don't lecture me on what the police do and don't do. I know what they do. I know what they don't do. I did it for years. You can teach me nothing about police investigations with respect. Secondly, you, and I'm glad you take the point and I'm glad that you concede it, it's an absolute disgrace that the victims of this man were not warned, were not prepared, were not protected. It's an absolute disgrace and you should hang your head in shame, all of you. It's no way to treat people. But the most important thing is answer me this. If while you were so busy protecting the secrecy of your investigation and deciding not to warn the South African public who incidentally uh, expect all of us here to protect them, and we've all failed, all of us. If Bester had murdered another woman, had raped another woman, what would you have said then? Well, I'm not a speculator. 
That has not happened. Yes, it did, it did not happen. And, and secondly, I know you are a prosecutor, a, a, a vintage one for that matter. But, but don't, tell me, don't tell me about investigating and the police. You only deal with that after they've investigated. Yes, prosecution, indeed, but investigation, absolutely no, not for you. Thank you, thank you very much. Honorable Janje. Thank you. So you have nine minutes. <laughs> you donated a minute to. No, don't worry. <laughs> no I, I'm an accountant. <laughs> I'm an accountant here. I must make sure that I balance the books. No, in the interest of the process, <laughs> I might even leave those nine minutes so that we proceed to the next uh, session. But just, just a few issues to, to raise, Chair, very, very briefly. I think, firstly, it's important to add to Honorable Swart, in the same way I would have done with Jigs, uh, to thank the delegation of SARPs led by the minister on the thankless job you're doing. Uh, I normally say this to DCS, that their job is a thankless job, that they must never expect us to say thank you or sometimes even appreciate. Um, for the work that they have done up to this point, because yesterday in the morning we were told, and I want to just repeat this on record, we were told that Besta is dead. In the afternoon we were told he has a reason. Same, same day. Now, I don't know who you have arrest, re-arrested. Uh, but you... Maybe your math is wrong. You are still waiting for the 40 days. Okay. <laughs> 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 uh, so, so I think uh, it, it's, it's, it's a relief. Um, whatever the imperfections that are into that process, as we are going to be forced to deal with the root causes of all of this, and I maintain the point, that's where ours must be. Uh, there's a relief that uh, we can do so in an environment where this inmate uh, who's been there for being a rapist and a murderer is back. And I'm told now that's Jose Mamburu. Uh, so he's got a new space. Um, but the second point I wanted to make, just for subs to confirm, has the notorious doctor appeared in court today? The person, she appeared and she's been remanded in prison. Thank you. On, on what charges? Uh, violation of the body, fraud, perjury, aiding and abetting escape, defeating the ends of justice. Those are the charges proffered to Dr. Nandipa Magoduman. Um, yes, yes, Chairperson, but maybe we can still add some more. Okay. I thank you, Chairperson. That's all I wanted to raise. Chairperson, so can I make a, a comment? Okay, uh, over the, to you, Minister. Chair, the point raised about the difficult that encountered by the police working with the chief was. I don't know what is amazing about it because you encountered the same difficult <laughs> working with them. You had to really work on extra thing as you issued summons, we had to issue 205. Uh, so that, that, that shows the difficult on that. But uh, maybe without really being arrogant and showing some kind of a finger, uh, it must be this board must be reminded that we have a portfolio committee called Police Portfolio Committee. So I just want to remind this board that one. Thank you very much. Uh, no, uh, Minister, there is nothing stopping the Portfolio Committee on Police uh, for uh, to invite you. Uh, but no portfolio committee has got exclusive jurisdiction. 
So to the extent that there are things that touch us, then we call, we are also entitled to call and to have a benefit of any board and any entity. So if they want to, they will call you, but there's nothing that stopped us from calling you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me take this opportunity to also thank you for making the effort to appear before us and congratulate you for for ensuring that uh, Mr. Bester uh, working with the Tanzanians, I think also let's thank them for assisting us to ensure that Mr. Bester is arrested. Uh, thank you very much uh, for all the work that has been done. Hopefully, all the other loose ends will be tied up soon. Thank you very much. Uh, now we will come to DCS. But before we do that, let's have a comfort break oh, okay. for 10 minutes.
of clarity. They requested that we send to them the information and uh, all that information was then used at the end to say the process has been concluded and conclu uh, in terms of the Tanzanian laws. I also want to take this opportunity, uh, Chairperson, to, to apologize to the victims of the convicted rapist, uh, Mr. Tabo Pesta, and to all the people of South Africa that uh, this dangerous uh, criminal was let loose in the public by the G4S uh, officials. And as DCS, we take full responsibility for this as we are the custodian of the Correctional Services Act. And we are the people doing so on behalf of the people of South Africa. The people of South Africa don't know just for us as the custodian of these services. So it's us who must take this responsibility. It is the first of its kind, uh, Chairperson, incident that we had to deal with uh, of this nature, uniqueness, and magnitude. But uh, with your indulgence, Chairperson, before I go to the matter itself and before I request the National Commissioner to come in to give the detailed presentation, I just want to give a, a brief background of the setup of the private-public partnership, relationship between public uh, partnership and the Department of Correctional Services so that the society understand um, this met. During 1997, the Department of Correctional Services um, uh, entered uh, the processes of uh, looking for, for, for bidders to design, construct, finance, and operate prisons. And this le was led by the Department of Public Works in collaboration with the Department of Finance. This was aimed at acquiring additional accommodation, bed spaces due to the overcrowding in our facilities and to learn best practices which will in turn be rolled over to other DCS facilities in ensuring that inmates are treated in human environment while they are being rehabilitated. At the time, two models were considered. The Asset Procurement Operational Partnership Systems, called APROPS, and the Procurement and Operational Partnership Systems, which was called POPS. I will no longer speak about POPS because POPS, there was an award uh, to a, 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 a company called Gijima, but it was not proceeded with. Only the APOPS was proceeded with. And in APOPS is where we find the Mangaung Correctional Facility and where we also find Kutama Sintimur, which is the second uh, private prison in South Africa. In terms of the written agreement concluded between the Department of Correctional Services and the Bloemfontein contracts now that we are dealing with, on the 24th of March 2000, the concession agreement, Bloemfontein co co uh, uh, Correctional Contracts PTYLTD BCC operates the Mangaung Correctional Center as a pi public private partnership, correctional center under section 103 and 112 of the Correctional Services Act. The expenditure payment made to date since 2001 to 2021 or 2022 financial year is 7.7 .7 billion rands. The projection until the end of the contract is about 2.58 2 uh, 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 2 billion and 52 million and 841,427 rands. So, that is what will take us up until the end of the, of the contract. I heard honorable members were asking how much, what will this cost, and so forth. We are paying a, an amount of 45 million rands a month to, for this facility. With regard to the Kutama Sintimule one, uh, the amount that has been spent since inception, it is an amount of 8.9 billion rands of that contract and the department is paying an amount of about 44 million rands per month. Honorable members were raising an issue whether there was value for money or not, and what is the situation? An, an assessment was done in 2002 by the National Treasurer. That assessment found that DCS got value for money in terms of infrastructure. And I think that is a point Honorable Horn was referring to. Indeed, 
there's excellent infrastructure. Uh, it cannot be debated. However, the department is experiencing significant affordability constraints in meeting its contractual obligations in relation to the two uh, PPP uh, prisons. But we have a contract, we must honor it. And that is what is happening. What is the prison population in our country? The approved accommodation is 108 and 804,000. And the inmate population um, at the last date of checking, 28th of March, was 157,135 uh, sentenced. And um, that is the whole prison population. Sentence is 100,587. These are sentenced inmates. 56,431, these are remand detainees. 170, these are the state patients, the patients of the president. Zero involuntary mental health care users, as reported on the 28th of March, 2023, which translate to an overcrowding level at that date of 44%, 44.42%. The total number of inmates detained in private prisons is 5,952, and that being Kuntama Sintimula, 3,024 inmates, and 2,928, that is Mangao. It translates to about 3.7%. The presentation by the National Commissioner will cover um, the following. As you will have seen, uh, Honorable Chair, that while we are going to take the nation into confidence, and some of the matters will beg your indulgence to exercise restraint on some of the information that we believe might jeopardize ongoing police investigations and the court processes, but we will endeavor to provide all the information that we believe the committee must be able to, to use. The the topics that are going to be covered is, firstly, the, um, which I have already covered some, an overview of the pu private public partnership, the cost incurred, the bed capacity, the number of security incidents at the facility in Mangao, the number of disputes with operating company to date, and the dispute resolution process, a profile of the offender in question, uh, Mr. Tabo Pesta, the sequence of events as outlined in the DCS investigation, the findings of the DCS investigation, the recommendation of the DCS investigative report, the steps taken after receiving the final recommendations, an outline of the legal remedies available to the Department of Correctional Services in relation to the concession contract, the internal consequence management process implemented to date, we also table what should be an action plan as we move forward, what we believe could help us to remedy this situation. I also want to deal with this matter <coughs> of the information received from the inspecting judge. In late October 2022, the Inspectorate Judge for Correctional Services, Justice Edwin Cameron, informed me indeed through a telephone call that he has come across information which may indicate that the offender Tawo Bester's death may be mysteriously or as previously notified might not be society. Justice Cameroon informed me that it appears to him this exceed probability or credence, but it's an investigation that is underway uh, from themselves as chicks, but there's also investigation by both uh, the South African Police Service and the Department of Correctional Services. This left me and induced me with shock, uh, uh, Chairperson. Disbelief, incredibility, and uh, I sat down after he, I spoke to him because our, he left me confused that can such a thing really happen uh, in our country. But after I have recollected myself, I immediately called the National Commissioner for Correctional Services to inform him about my telephonic discussion with the inspecting judge. What he informed me, and that this is very important and urgent. That the National Commissioner must prioritize this matter of uh, this suspected escape. 
because if indeed it's true, this is going to be one of the most uh, um, biggest undermination of the criminal justice system. In response, the National Commissioner informed me that indeed he is aware that there is an ongoing investigation in the department and that he could not inform me at that stage because the investigation was at a very preliminary stage uh, at the department. He was awaiting some concrete information to take it further with myself. And I will from time to time inquire uh, with the National Commissioner on the progress on this investigation. To which he responded that he is awaiting the final report and all the processes. And again, I said to him, this is very important and urgent. But I also asked him, but if indeed this guy is, is true that the, the, it's not him and so forth, he said, no, there is, a, there is complications. So I asked, what are these complications? He said, no. The first one is that G4S is insisting that the person who died on that day is double best. So I said, okay, that's one I get it. But the judge, I mean, if the judge is raising this thing, I suspect that there's something. And then he said, no, the second complication is that there is an ongoing police investigation by SAPS, which they have informed him that we must not do anything that might jeopardize the investigation. So I said, but uh, what are those things they're doing, dealing with? Because, I mean, if we're dealing with a straightforward escape, I don't see what is the complication. They can just go arrest this person that is suspected to be this guy and uh, test this person. Then he says, no, the problem is that they have informed him that this is broader than just an escape. There's multiple bodies. There's a suspicion of a scheme. There's a huge network that is being investigated that might be alerted with any uh, process that might jeopardize the investigation. I then said to the National Commissioner, then that's fine, uh, but let's find a way to prioritize, check the matter and follow it up. I also want to deal with the issue that the, uh, the inspecting judge raised uh, earlier, that from the, when I realized, uh, Chairperson, that uh, from the timelines that the inspecting judge submitted here, a report that he sent me a letter on the 26th of October, 2022, and I asked my office because I had never seen the letter. What I still remembered is the telephone discussion. I checked with my office if we did receive this email, and they indicated that we did not receive the email and the letter and I've requested them to provide proof to the committee uh, to that effect, which shows that it did not uh, come through to the, to the chief of staff. But still, that does not mean that I was not informed by the judge. The judge informed me. The content of the letter I confirmed is what he informed me in the telephone conversation. And I dealt with that matter in that, uh, in that context. I received the final investigation report from DCS on the 24th of March, 2023, and we then convened a meeting with the DM immediately to after receiving this report, and also when we were uh, also pricked by the public uh, um, in terms of the media issues and so forth to say, we have been pushing since that period to say, let's get this, uh, this report which we finally got on the 24th of March, 2023. And the questions were asked, and I think as DCS present, it will become apparent what we dealt with. We, as Chicks said, we will get the final report uh, from, from Chicks. I also want the uh, chairperson to say that th there could be other details of the identity of uh, the gentleman and so forth, and passports. We will endeavor to explain from our side. We know him as Tabo Pest. But some of the things I think Home Affairs, they said they will hold a press briefing to explain exactly how it works that someone can be a South African and, and still not have an ID document or something like that. So I will request Chairperson with your indulgence that they will allow the National Commissioner to go into the details of the, of the presentation. Thank you. No, thank you very much, uh, Minister.
National Commissioner. Thank you, um, Honorable Chairperson and uh, Honorable Members of the Committee, um, the Inspecting Judge, uh, CEO of, uh, of JICS, um, colleagues that are in the, in the meeting, and everybody else, good afternoon. Um, Honorable Chairperson, I'm going to request that uh, we go straight into the presentation of the department. The um, inspecting judge did indicate that uh, our investigation report is 40 pages. Um, I would like to, to indicate to the committee that uh, this investigation report is supported by um, an extras in the form of um, evidence that supports every statement we make in the report. The whole report with the annexures actually um, is, is more than 336 pages. Um, I'm mentioning that because we had to support each and every statement we make with either affidavits or information that we could um, gather as we continued with the investigation. And uh, the annexures um, as evidence are available immediately uh, to the committee. I'm going to request Honorable Chairperson that uh, we um, present the report through Director Killian, who's a director responsible for the Departmental uh, Investigation Unit. He will be assisted by uh, the acting deputy commissioner in the office of the national uh, commissioner, Dr. Zota Musoma. I'm also with the team uh, from the department. As we continue to engage, we will then introduce members of the team. As, um, but also on that, honorable chairperson and uh, honorable members, I'll be guided in terms of, because we actually have a team here. Um, thank you, honorable chairperson. I suspect the other members of the team would be answering questions, but not everybody will be presenting. Yes, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you. Um, Director, I think the Minister and the National Commissioner have already greeted us on your behalf, so let's just go straight to the presentation. Thank you, Chairperson, Honorable Members. Um, I'm going to start right away, I should request. The purpose of this presentation today is to provide a Portfolio Committee on Justice Correction Services with a summary of a security-related incident on 3 May 2022 regarding offender Tabu Besta, who was tentated Mangaung Correctional Center, a private-public partnership in the Free State Northern Cape region. Um, I'm not going to go to the overview of the, some of the pages in the presentation. I'm, I'll ask Dr. Matsuma just to go to slide six because the minister already alluded to that in his, in his opening. That will be a repetition. Slide six, a background to Mangaung Correctional Center. In terms of the written agreement concluded between the Department of Correctional Services and Bluefontein Contracts, um, or BCC as they are commonly known, on 24 March 2000, the concession agreement, um, Bluefontein Correctional Contracts operates the Mangaung Correctional Center, MCC, as a public-private partnership under the sections 103 to 112 of the Correctional Services Act as amended. The contractor shareholding equity and the rights confirms the following shareholding. G4S Care and Justice Limited is 20%, Old Mutual 20%, Fikile Mangaun is 20%, Equisi, I hope I pronounced that correct, Community Trust is 20%, and 10 Alliance Mangaun is 20%. In terms of Section 107 of the Correctional Services Act, the contractor appoints a director with the prior approval of the National Commissioner as the head of the, of the center. The subcontractors and the functions Mangaung Correctional Center are the following. G4S is responsible for custodial services, KKS uh, for food services, Parani health, uh, health care solutions, and Integron Integrate Solution Maintenance, already here before the Commission. 
In terms of Manga Hoon Correction Center, became operational on 1 July 2001 with a bed capacity of 2,928. And as we've heard, the contract will end on 30 June 2026 with a, capac a staff capacity of 507. I need to mention that there is currently litigation pending, uh, civil litigation to recover an amount of 110 million for invoking section 112 during 2013. And that matter is, is, is uh, pending before court as we speak. I'm going to skip nine. Okay, ten. Mangaung and Katumas Tutamule became operational 1 July and 16 February 2002 with bed capacities, as we already said, of 3,024 and 2,298 respectively. Contracts will end on 30 uh, June 2026 and 15 February. The National Commission appointed two operational takeover teams in November 2021, led by the regional commissions of Free State Northern Cape and LNM, and these regional commissioners are resp is responsible for those two specific regions where these centers are situated. The teams will be under the management of the DCS Management Committee, consisting of all chief deputy commissioners. The task team development work stream for each of the disciplines in the takeover process. It is envisaged that DCS will work with the current contractors for the last 12 months of the contract period to ensure a smooth takeover when the contract ends. If we look at of, uh, inmate offence categories uh, of the inmates that's currently in, in uh, Mongoon, um, aggressive, murder, assault and robbery, total of 3,200. Sexual, which is rape, attempted rape and indecent assault is 1,900. Theft, 86. Drugs is 18. And economic, 592. And then there's other various crimes of 1,036. Um, just to mention that some of the inmates have committed more Sorry, than one Director. Crime. Uh, I'm not sure um, because we received this document some time back, uh, last week uh, already. We have gone through the document. Um, I think you can jump some of these slides and go to the most pertinent issues. Okay. okay. Thank you, Chairperson. I'll go to the findings under the incident things. Thank you. I'll start with the, the incident where Tabu Bester is then involved. An inmate by the name of Tabu Bester was reported by G4S to the DCS controller to have committed suicide by means of setting his cell alight on 3rd of May 2022. As per the standing operating procedures, an investigation was initiated, and although the investigation started, challenges were experienced in terms of accessing relevant information and persons of interest.
meaning that they still considered the body as that of Tabo Bester. G4S proceeded to conduct their own investigation. Uh, the outcome of this investigation was, however, never provided to DCS until 31 March. Operate procedures, it is expected that the controller becomes aware of any purported breach of contract by the contractor. Um, the, con the controller shall procure the diligent investigation of such purported breach. The controller therefore appointed two officials, Mr. MP Supply, head of Grootvlei Medium B, Miss, my apologies, uh, head of uh, Grootvlei Medium B Correctional Center, and Mr. MP Mosweshwe, they, they are actually here sitting in the Crime Commissioner, senior professional nurse from Weapon Correctional Center to assist him and his deputy to investigate the incident. Uh, on 28 October, maybe I must just pause here, um, on the document that was provided to the members, uh, Chairperson, it was says 18 October, and it's also shown on the slide, but it's actually the 28th of October, that's a typing error. 28 October, the controllers had a meeting with SAPS and Jigs, and a copy of the post-mortem and DNA results were received from, from the SAPS. Uh, actually from, from the, from Jigs. The, the investigators signed the draft investigation report on 18 November 2022, and the controller signed the draft investigation report on 22 November 22. The draft report was submitted by hand on 25 November to the Director of Contract Management for finalization and submission to the National Commissioner. The National Commissioner received a copy of this draft investigation report on the same day, that is 25 November, from the region and requested the acting DC executive management in his office to make a follow with the region if a criminal case was opened, um, as subs referred to. On 12 January, the controller opened a case, and I hear SAPS says it's the 14th, um, so there's a little bit of a dispute about the date there. The controller opened a case of escape with SAPS Bloomsbrate, and case number 316 of January 2023 was received on 16 January. The region then indicated uh, that the subs refused to open a case in prior engagements with them. And I think they re refer to that. The National Commissioner made inquiries with Director Contract Management in, in the National Head Office, uh, who is responsible for the two private prisons, on several occasions between November 2022 and March 23, to which she replied that she's still engaging with the additional information that was received. In the week of 13 March, 2023, the National Commissioner directed that a final investigation report to be delivered by his office by the 22nd of March, 2023. Um, that report was delivered as directed, signed by the Director of Contract Management on 22 March, 2023. So if we go to the investigation process and the findings of that investigation, um, it's quite elaborate. The sequence of events outlined in, invest in the report substantiates that there were a number of breaches of the contract leading up to the escape of Tabo Besta. The contractor allowed a private vehicle to enter the center via the sally port without a gate pass and the driver was the security supervisor and these actions constitute a breach of security. The contractor segregated offended Tabo Besta for own safety to Broadway unit without approval of the CSC in terms of the contract. The contractor misled the Department of Correctional Services by reporting a natural death of offender Tabu Bester instead of an aided, aided escape. Number four, the contractor failed to ensure supervision in Broadway unit where the incident occurred. The contractor failed to perform general supervision specifically at cell 35 after the report of smoke from Broadway unit. The contractor failed to provide CSC, the, 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 the controller, were video recordings of the Broadway unit, which indicates a failure to, to house block security as all activities were not monitored. The contractor submitted false records with regard to defects on the security system, and yet there was a malfunction of the system in Broadway unit, Atman building, and Sally Port. The contractor failed to ensure effective patrolling around the center between 1900 um, and 7, 7.30, that's 1900 in the evening, and 7.30 the following morning on the 2nd of May. The contractor contravened the contract by bringing an authorized article, that is the petrol, the salarant, including then a corpse into the facility. The contractor breached the contract by assisting offender Tabo Bester to escape from Monga Home Correctional Center through all these breaches. The contractor intelligence system failed to gather, analyze, and disseminate information 
hence no alert of an escape which was planned by G4S officials. Contractor failed to monitor perimeter security which led to an aided escape, failed to monitor the prison on 24 hours basis which led to aided escape, contractor failed to monitor CCTV and alarm security system which failed to alert the incident of escape, the security intelligence system of the contractor is not effective in gathering intelligence security information by not picking up the major incident of planned escape uh, through all systems in place which resulted to aided escape without their knowledge. Contractor failed to keep the offender in custody as it allowed the escape to happen and operational procedures were not followed and thus compromised security of the prison. Contractor failed to secure safe custody and rehabilitation of offenders and that's your view that a contact by the contractor has damaged the relationship between the two parties. I refer to the post-mortem and DNA results and maybe just to say that this was also elaborated on by the SAPS already. Um, so maybe I'm going to go to the next one. The recommendations on the investigation report. The investigation report mainly that penalties must be issued to the contractor for the breaches as listed and the, the findings. And this issuing of penalties will be handled as provided for in the concession contract, which is quite an elaborate process. Steps taken after receiving the final report. After considering the investigation report, the National Commission called for a meeting with various people um, in the office, which will take place in the office of regional commissioner. Purpose of this meeting was to receive a brief on the investigation report commissioned by the controller. This meeting took place 23rd March 2023 in the office of the regional commissioner, uh, Bloemfontein Free State in Northern Cape. Um, there are a few inquiries and follow-ups made by JICS to DCS and the Ministry regarding the investigation of offender Tabo Besta. However, at that stage, the investigation was not yet finalized. Therefore, there is no information that could have been provided. Emanating out of the brief, the National Commission addressed a letter to the controller to obtain further information, which will assist to validate the findings and recommendations, in particular the assertion that offender was aided in his escape from custody. Out of the factual findings of the investigation report, and information available and presented during this brief to the National Commissioner um, by the investigators. It was concluded that inmate Tabu Beste escaped from Mangaung Correctional Center on the 3rd of May, 2022. It was only reported to the National Commissioner in the briefing meeting on the 23rd March that a controller opened a criminal case on 12th January and the case number was received from SAPS, as I already said. Uh, the SAPS is still investigating escape and the events surrounding the escape as we've heard from them. Activation of the track and trace team. Early hours of the morning of the 24th of March this year, the National Commissioner activated the DCS team to work in collaboration with SAPS to track, trace, and re-arrest the offender. Track and trace team compromised of the following officials, DCS, SAPS, Department of Home Affairs, and the Asset Forfeiture Unit. Um, and this team provides regular feedback to the SAPS. So DCS was, DCS was throughout involved with this track and trace. Legal remedies in terms of Section 112 of the Correctional Services Act. Section 112 of the Correctional Services Act states the following, in if, if in the opinion of the Commissioner, in consultation with the Minister, the Director has lost or is likely to lose effective control of a public-private partnership, central or any part of it. It is necessary in the interest of safety and security to take control of such public-private partnership, correctional center or part of it. He or she may appoint a temporary manager to act as the head of that correctional center and may replace custody officials with correctional officials to the extent necessary. The appointment B, appointment referred to in paragraph A starts at the time specified in the temporary manager's written letter of appointment and ends on written notice to that effect. During the appointment of appointment referred to in paragraph B, the temporary manager performs the functions of the director and the contractor and any subcontractor must do all that is possible to facilitate the performance by the temporary manager of those functions. As soon as practical, after making or terminating the appointment of a temporary manager, the National Commissioner must give notice of such action to the contractor, the director, and the controller. 24 March, the National Commissioner directed the Departmental Investiga Investigation Unit to investigate the role and conduct of DCS officials. And this investigation process is currently in process. On 29 March 2023, the National Commissioner suspended the director contract management. 30 March, the National Commissioner contemplated the controller and deputy controller to suspend them. 
uh, Ms. Gladys Rantente is appointed as the DCS controller for Mangaun. She's currently there. I think she's here today. The Department of Correctional Services has referred a concession contract and the related document for legal advice, exploring other remedies available to the Department of Correctional Services. Um, after carefully considering the findings and recommendations of the investigation report on the Tabo Best Escape incident, and consulting the Minister of Justice and Correctional Services, Mr. Lamola, the National Commissioner decided to invoke Section 112 of the Correctional Services Act, read with Clause 55 of the concession contract. Findings of the investigation report pointed to the fact that the director of the Mangaung Correctional Center has lost effective control of the facility, amongst other factors, and the Correctional Services Act does provide for a mechanism to restore safety and security by taking control of the Correctional Center by means of appointing a temporary manager, as we've done. Temporary manager will perform the functions of the director. Mr. Patrick Ali Mashabataha was appointed as temporary manager of Mangaung Correctional Center uh, with immediate effect. Uh, the Section 112 process will be reviewed in six months. Contractor has been duly informed of this decision, and Mr. Mashabataha will be supported by other officials that have been appointed in order to ensure that a Mangaung Correctional Facility is able to render the required services without experiencing shortcomings. To support the temporary manager, the region has identified the following support staff. The area commissioner of Grootvlei will provide support, uh, assistant director, one senior correctional officer and a and security officer, and the emergency support team from Grootvlei will be made available when needed. In terms of an action plan, a physical roll call of inmates with fingerprints identification uh, to take place from 31 March to 6 April, and we can confirm that that roll call was completed with fingerprints of all those inmates taken and that all the inmates that are supposed to be there are then accounted for. The reinstatement of inmates disciplinary hearings, and that will be a continuous process. The reclassification transfer of inmates qualifying to be medium, continuous process. Controlled movement of inmates from one unit to the other, continuous. Enhancement of handling of complaints and requests, continuous. An analysis of incidents for the past five years, um, that's a target date from the 3rd of, um, to the 14th of April, it should be 31 March. Proper mending of access control gates, that's a continuous process. Confirmation of vetting of custodial officials, uh, those dates are still to be determined. Uh, lifestyle audits of custodial officials of G4S, uh, that process still needs to be arranged. A review of structured day programs, uh, which should happen with immediate effect, they're already busy with that. Implementation of monthly security committee meetings uh, from the 1st of May. A reassessment of the surveillance camera system as well as the position of such um, to establish implementation of a uh, backup system and to extend the period seven, uh, seven day data storage. Um, and that's a continuous process. To conduct a building structural survey to determine the current state of the structure. There was actually a, such a document already available. Uh, activities taking place at night must be in the presence of the director, security, or delegated manager. Um, we would know from all the what was said here is that the people that was on duty were able to open the cell. And normally in correctional centers, the cell is not just open. The person on standby must come out and be present when the cell is opened after hours. Um, for security reasons, identification reasons, etc. On the 31 March 2023, DCS received a letter from the legal representative of G4S demanding that DCS immediately revoke the Section 112 notice by close of business on Monday, 3rd of April, failing which they will approach the court on an urgent basis for a leave. Um, that letter was responded to that appointment of the temporary manager remains. In terms of what was in the media environment, communication. Media entities made inquiries on the 3rd of May 2022 about Tabo Bester before the department issued an alert on the incident. It became necessary for the department to confirm what was reported by Mangaung Correctional Center affirming that Tabo Bester committing suicide by setting his cell alight. The issue remained in the media environment then for a few days and disappeared. It was in November 22 when there was explosive media reports from ground up on Tabu Besta casting doubts about a suicide report and asking if this was not an escape. 
What was to follow was sustained media coverage from Grant Up on the same matter, and it started giving details on what may have happened on the 3rd of May 2022. Media engagement, media statements, and response to inquiries have been the preferred methods in managing this issue. The presentation is submitted to the committee. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much. Uh, is that all? National Commissioner. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Um, that is all. Very much. I note the hands, Honorable. In fact, there are two requests. Let's say, let's drop our hands. There were two requests first. It was Honorable Jale and Honorable Breitenbach. I will start with Honorable Jale and then Honorable Breitenbach. Then the third one, let's start. Honorable Ramulibim. Honorable Swartz, okay. Honorable Swartz, Honorable Engelberg, uh, Honorable Horn, Honorable. Uh, I can't tell him. <laughs> Velma, you vote, Drochen. Honorable Yako, Honorable Ramulu Bing. Honorable Koza and then Honorable Janji in that order. <laughs> um, do you want to stick to the last agreement or do you want to revert back to the first agreement? Fifteen, chair. Fifteen, fifteen, fifteen. So when I stick to time, Liang Bang is, yeah. I just say I am your servant. I stick to time as given by you. So Liang Bang is. No, no. In terms of the rules, donation do happen. Um, so the rules of the National Assembly still do apply. Um, but every report is going to be limited to 15 minutes. Honorable Swart. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Chair. Chair I, I so wish that uh, I can escape. <laughs> Honorable. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Masego Chele. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. And Thank you to the minister, the Mr. DM, and the national commissioner and the team. Uh, your presentation gave us a lot of information that we needed, and I think it's easy for us now. Honorable Chair. Uh, please, uh, your voice is low. It, it, it seems as if you want to escape more than me. <laughs> no, my apology, Chair, and, and the committee. No, my question, Chair, I was just thanking the minister and the team. My, my, my question, Chair, first, we note, Chair, uh, that uh, the department has already taken a decision on, on this matter and we appreciate that. And also, Chair, we note the, the, the findings by the department indeed are very serious, very serious. Uh, considering the amount that we pay monthly, Chair, that is one thing that we raised earlier, that do we get value for money? And <clears throat> Sorry, the, 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 the minister has confirmed that, Chair, that indeed uh, on the matters that those were raised by the committee, in terms of the infrastructure, we are happy. But in terms of the runnings of, of the centers, some of us, Chair, we are definitely, in fact, if not all of us, we are not happy, totally not happy, and we appreciate the action that has been taken 
uh, by the National Commit, uh, Commission and the Minister on this matter, as I said earlier. But uh, the first question that I would, I would like to ask, to question, to, 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 to pose to the National Commissioner is that uh, Mr. Matabata, what is this? Mashabataha, Mashabataha. Is, is he already now, as we are speaking, uh, on site? That is the first question, Chair. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Yes, uh, Mr. Mashabataha was uh, installed on the 30th of March. And the team. Uh, 2023, and the team. Thank you very much. The second question is that, Chair, we are paying 45 million a month. And now Mr. Mat Matabaha is already there in the team. It means G uh, G4S have vacated the place. Does, it, does, does, does that mean we don't have the officials of G4S on site? Is the question. Thank you, um, Honorable Chairperson. In terms of Section 112, the action that um, has been uh, put in place is the replacement of the director of G4S by a temporary manager in the person of Mr. Mashaba Taha. The management of G4S is still at the center, and uh, also the staff of G4S is still at the center. What we also did was to provide Mr. Mashabataha with um, colleagues to assist him because uh, Mangaung and Khrotfle are next to each other. We put together a team of the officials that uh, are from the region to assist him. So what does that mean, mean uh, National Commissioner, is that we are, continue, we are going to continue paying them 45 million rents a month? Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. In terms of the, the concession agreement, any cost that we go into in care as the department, we will claim back from G4S on this intervention. Okay. Um, another question on, on that matter, Chair. Uh, is there anything in the contract that makes us not to cancel this thing altogether at this mo uh, moment, even if you are still working on with the two structures on site. Um, okay. It's means I was thinking about it because my understanding is that the department has uh, sought legal opinion on this issue. No, I'm not on that. Yeah, but, but let me first deal oh, with okay. this one. Um, it has sought legal opinion on this issue. Uh, maybe let's uh, let us not put them on the spot um, because they've said specifically on that particular issue. Thank you, Chair. But it seems as if the minister uh, uh, would want to say something. Can you give him? Yeah, no. It was on the first question, the the, the issue of the claiming back of the money from um, G4S to just state to, to the committee that you will remember that when we presented, we said that there's a dispute of 2013. So the dispute also emanated from us taking over. Uh, it was about 100 and, uh, 100 and something million. The commissioner can, can, can confirm the amount. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, on the issue of the escape piece, it, it seems as if this is not the, not, not even it seems as if it is now known that uh, it is not the first escape in, in that center. We have others previously, even though we are, we are given uh, low numbers, but um, there's a lot that is happening uh, that has been reported by uh, the journalist uh, dating back to 2013. Um, I just want to find out, after uh, someone, or uh, I, mean, I mean to say inmate has escaped and later that inmate is apprehended what is the procedure do you just take that uh, inmate back without maybe 
having some charges that are adding on top of the, the case or the, the punishment that the inmate would have uh, got before coming to the center. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. An escape is, a, is a, um, an act of criminality, so uh, that's why we open a case with SAPS. Um, that's number one. Number two, also in terms of our internal disciplinary code that we um, uh, implement with regards to the, to the behavior of offenders, we will then uh, uh, apply that. Number three, what we do immediately after we've realized that there's an escape, we institute an investigation, and the investigation will point out to um, uh, problems that we've had uh, in terms of security. It would, sometimes it points out to the role that has been played by uh, officials. Uh, it will point out to any defects in the system. So, you know, uh, implement improvements where we need to uh, uh, implement consequence management, we do that. Uh, National Commissioner, there is an allegation that uh, there were other escapes uh, recently uh, before this one of, of, of uh, Bester. And uh, the allegation is that the procedure was not followed. Do you know anything about that? That procedure of that inmate that you normally do was not followed. There was an escape um, in December. Um, the department knows about that. I know about that. The escape was reported by, by G4S uh, to the department through the controller. There was an investigation that was conducted uh, by G4S. The controller also conducted uh, an investigation. We have received a, a, an executive preliminary report. Um, we have asked questions about that investigation. Well, part of the tasks uh, of the, the team led by Mr. Mashabataha is to look at that investigation. We have received also um, anonymous uh, in, uh, letters. We've also received complaints from uh, uh, inmates about how that escape was treated and the role of some of the uh, officials from G4S. And part of the investigation that uh, Mr. Killian from the Departmental Investigation Unit uh, is working on is the same uh, uh, escape. Now we've got the issue of Bester. How long is that going to take, uh, the, the, the investigation for the, the, the one that you've just spoken about? How long is it going to take for it to be resolved? Because I don't know what, what investigations needed to be done because this person escaped and then came back and that person just would just have to add the, the charges. Maybe it's, it's because I don't know the procedure, hence I said that. And the, what happened to the manager, responsible operation manager, because there is somebody who's responsible for that. Did we get the report that uh, tells us exactly what happened by the manager? The ones, some of them are those names that I, call, I, I, I mentioned yesterday, uh, was it yesterday? Uh, the, the, there's Olga, somebody by the name of Olga, if I'm not mistaken, and the other one is for security, which is Ida, but the other one, you'll, you'll remember, they will remember, they will remind us if they still remember those names. But I know there's this lady who is an operational manager. That is, I think, is supposed to be giving us that report. Do you have the report of that operational manager in terms of this case? Um, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. We have a report, as I have indicated, of the work that was done on G4S on this matter. And I've indicated that uh, since we, uh, since Mr. Mashabataka started working from the 30th of March, we gave an instruction that he must start the investigation from scratch because we've got questions about that. But over and above that, um, the director uh, investigation unit in the department is investigating the role of the controller, the GPT controller, and any other staff of the department that was, in for, or that was involved before we took over on the 30th of March. <laughs> now, in terms of how long will that investigation uh, take, I would not necessarily give the exact time, but what I would say is that um, we are the ones now 
as DCS that are managing the institution from the, the point of view and the authority of the temporary manager. Now, that will give us access to all the information we need faster uh, and better than uh, before when we're dealing with the issue of uh, uh, Tabo Bester. Was the matter reported to Jigs? Yes, the matter was reported to Jigs in terms of the procedures. Thank you. Can we go to page? Five minutes. Yes, page six, I'm, I'm done, Chair. On page six, Chair, uh, the, the inmate population, population in Mangau, Chair, there's, a, there's something strange down there. It says unidentified uh, what, in, inmate, and there are about 100. What do you mean by that? And also, is, is, is Besta one of them? Um, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. I'm going to ask uh, a thing, uh, DC, uh, Dr. Musoma, to answer that question. I may come in after that if there is a need through you, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, thank you, National Commissioner, and thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, the slide on inmate population in Mangaung Correctional Center, as you would uh, see in this uh, table, is actually indicating uh, the, the, the origin of those uh, inmates per province. You will also notice that uh, just on row number three from the bottom that we have also indicated the number of the foreign nationals that are there. But now, as you would know that uh, Mangawung is fed from different correctional centers within DCS. So in the process of then uh, uh, transferring the offenders and also providing the files, the 100 was not yet analyzed in terms of the, where they are coming from in terms of the province. But now, for the sake of making sure that our statistics balances, we had to specify the, in that row that those when unidentified in terms of the province were 100. Thank you, Chairperson. In terms of the pro, uh, provinces, but now in terms of saying Besta did not have an ID, uh, ID where is he identified the, the number? He didn't have an ID, but it's coming from Gauteng, ne? Gauteng, I don't know where he's coming from anyway because he's all over. He's even now coming from Tanzania. Maybe he was trying to get to where he's coming from. I don't know. I'm just... Because he doesn't have an ID. And uh, yes, the police told us that uh, they identified the relatives, but he doesn't have an ID. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair. It is true, uh, Honorable Members, that uh, most of our inmate population, in actual fact, this is a deliberate act at times. They don't want to produce their IDs or to present them mainly because they are running away from other charges or other criminal activities that they have committed. That's why they keep on changing their names. So in terms of disaggregating this data per province, it was uh, basically an exercise to show where most of our inmates per province are from on that uh, target group. Thank you, Chairperson. Last one, Chair. Uh, it, is, it is about uh, page seven the numbers, Chair, of the sexual inmate offenses on the category, on that category. I see the, Chair, uh, the, on the sexual category, it says 1,900, I meaning it's number two. I think this is the issue that the President at some point mentioned, that it is very serious. But now, I want to know Having uh, this number or these numbers, particularly these offenses has, has been done, has been uh, committed against women. And we have uh, such uh, centers that allow escapes of such people. And uh, I know the category, the, I don't even want to, to talk about, in fact, those people that I'm talking about, the sexual, they also, fall on that category if we have to identify BESTA. So BESTA is one of the most dangerous uh, 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 um, 
inmates. So I want to know, if we keep on getting these escapes, National Commissioner. Please round up. Yes. I'm, I'm there, Chair. If we keep on getting these escapes, are we continually saying these perpetrators must go back and do these things to women? Are you really not worried and come with mechanisms in terms of tightening your, sec your security in order to make us protected, uh, uh, protected as women? Because where we are, Chair, I'm scared myself because I don't know if maybe we'll be able to hold best uh, from all this, the information that we got. Thank you, Chair. Can you comment, uh, National Commissioner? Members, please note, if your time has expired, you won't get a response. Because I warn you five minutes before, I warn you to round up. So if your time expires, you won't get a response. Honorable Pretenbach. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, I'm going to start with uh, the Minister of Justice because I see that he's uh, becoming uncomfortable sitting there for the whole day and I'm scared he falls asleep. So I'm going to uh, make an effort to wake him up a little. So, uh, Minister, you're the Minister of Justice and Correctional Services. It's a big job, very big portfolio. It doesn't matter that you have two deputies, each one helping on a different thing. You're responsible overarchingly for justice and correctional services in this country. Do you agree? Yeah. And it's your job, Minister, to ensure the safety of South African citizens. It's your job in, as the... A Minister of Justice and Correctional Services in conjunction with the rest of the criminal justice cluster to ensure the safety of South African citizens. Make sure that they're safe in their homes every night. Is that correct? Yeah. And then I presume that you'll agree with me that in this particular instance you have failed. Yes, that's why we apologize to the nation. Good. Um, because we, we don't, uh, we take responsibility in terms of the act, the overall responsibility as the custodian of um, prisons in this country is the Department of Correctional Services. Mm. Yes. Well, to your credit then, you uh, take responsibility and it's admirable quality. But you're a lawyer yourself. You're, you, you've been a practicing attorney. You understand about culpability and you understand about culpability of the state. And you understand about your failure to protect both the public at large and more importantly the victims of this particular offender. And when you knew, let's say at the best for you, when you knew in October of 2022 that Bester had escaped or that it was very likely that he'd escaped, what steps did you take, you, to ensure that the victims of, of uh, Bester were informed, adequately supported, adequately protected? What steps did you take? Yeah, uh, Honorable Bradenbach, as I've said, um, after the telephone call with the, with the inspecting judge, I immediately called the National Commissioner to, eh? yeah, yeah, because I was shocked to the core and I did mention it to, to the judge that uh, this is uh, something, yeah, something else, but yeah, I will definitely engage the National Commissioner, which I did to prioritize this matter and to deal with the issues of the investigations as urgently as possible. And that's where he told me that already there is an investigation that is ongoing, which I asked why I was not aware of this thing. He says, no, it's because they do not have enough information to bring. They were still at the preliminary stages of the investigation, the, the investigators. 
So, Minister, forgive me, but that's just not good enough. You phone up the Commissioner, he tells you that there is an investigation. They haven't bothered to inform you uh, because they don't have enough information. The information that they have is that there was a dead body in a cell in Bloemfontein that doesn't belong to Tarver Bester. And Tarver Bester is no longer in that prison. He's a serial rapist, he's a murderer, he's convicted. He has victims out there. My question to you was, what steps did you take, you, to inform his victims, to protect his victims, to support his victims? Yeah, Honorable Brennbach, it's not correct. In terms of the timelines, at the time when I spoke to the National Commission, he told me that the investigation is still at the preliminary stage. And the preliminary stage, when I asked, what do you mean, what is it that you have? I mean, he said, no, we still need to get the various reports that relates to confirming whether indeed this guy has escaped. Because one, um, G4S is still insisting that the body that died there is the one of, or that they found, <laughs> is the one of, uh, of <laughs> yeah, the person who died there is, the, is this Mr. Tabopest. So at that, that at the time, that is what was happening. And secondly, as you will be aware, Honorable uh, Bradenberg, it then becomes the responsibility of the corrections unit in the departments to inform uh, the victims and deal with them because, I mean, it's all over the country. And I did uh, engage the National Commissioner. I think the National Commissioner can take it from there because I, my responsibility deals with oversight and also to check whether what should be done is indeed done. I differ from you, Minister. I think your responsibility uh, entails everything. It's a big job. You've accepted that responsibility, and you can't pass the buck, which is what you're trying to it do. It is not in terms of the Correctional Services Act. Uh, I'm, not the the I'm not talking the, about the I'm not talking about the Act. The, the, the responsibility, and sorry, you will minister. always. Ah, sorry, Minister. Ah. I think let's give each other space uh, to, we, we can't uh, talk oh, past each other. My time. apology. I'm not talking about the act, uh, Minister, and you know it. I'm talking about your responsibility as a lawyer, as a human being, as a Minister of Justice. Don't tell me that that is circumscribed by the act. That, that's, a, that's a poor show, it's an indictment on you. And I honestly thought you were better than that. You have a deputy sitting next to you. Did you phone him up and say, this thing has happened? Do you know about it? What are you doing about it? And will you please sort out the victims, some sort of initiative to protect them, to support them? Did you do that? Honorable Bredenbach, you are the proponent of saying we need to give professionals the independence to do their job. While we follow up, while we look at them, while they give us reports, but you cannot also be the one who also becomes the National Commissioner, the Accounting Authority, and the Accounting Officer. With regards to the Deputy Minister, as I've said, that when I got this thing, the first call I made was to the National uh, Commissioner, for example. And at that time, I did not even inform my staff, for example, um, that I had this discussion with the inspecting judge, and this is his view, uh, that there could be this thing. Because I thought that this is very sensitive. I must limit it as far as possible. And the National Commissioner, when he has got preliminary information and reports, he will be able to inform the Deputy Minister. So, Minister, I would ask you to keep your answers a little shorter than that because you're taking up my 15 minutes. Uh, all I can say to you is that, in my view, you fell short of the mark. My other questions are to uh, DCS. Uh, I can just say to you, Minister, that being shocked seems to sort of run in your, the cabinet circles. The president's always shocked that we don't have electricity. You shocked. You were shocked that the Guptas weren't extradited. Shock seems to be a, a thing. Uh, maybe consult someone about that. I suspect you're also shocked, Honorable President. You know. Unfortunately, this, uh, unfortunately, I'm not. Everyone. No, unfortunately, I'm not. Uh, members, please, please. Uh, my next question is to DCS. Um, 
when you were informed of this occurrence at uh, Mangahum, uh, at what time did the first DCS person arrive at that scene? Thank you, Madam Chairperson. I'm going to ask one of the investigators to answer that question. Uh, thank you, <coughs> Honorable Chairperson. Um, the incident happened around uh, 4 o'clock in the morning, and uh, according to the chief OS officials, they immediately phoned the, uh, the controller, and because controller is not far from uh, Mangaum, it took them uh, around 15 minutes, and they were already there. It was around uh, half past four in the morning. First DCS person arrived at 4.30 in the morning. Who was that person? It was uh, the controller and the deputy controller. And they're not here today? Yes, they are not here, uh, honorable member. Okay. And did they give you a report of what they found there? What was the state of the cell? They did the, give the, the statements to the investigators. What was the state of the cell? The investigator uh, will proceed to give the details. Okay, but please Honorable a concise answer. President Bach, you are left with four minutes. I, I will credit you with one minute, for, then I left with five minutes. Thank you. What was the state of the cell? But please be concise. Thank you, Honorable Chair. When they arrived at the scene, they, they found a lot of smoke in that, in that cell and they found a body lying down in that cell, facing down. That's what they told us uh, on our... Did they take photographs? No, they did, did not. Did anyone take photographs? Uh, only SAPS forensic did take the photographs. When did they take those photographs? on the day of the incident. When on the day of the incident? Early morning, late afternoon, middle of the night? Uh, around s past six, six o'clock when they arrived at the scene. In the morning? In the morning of the incident. And those photographs should be available? That's correct. Have you seen them? We have seen them uh, last, last, last week or now. What was the state of the cell? Was it damaged? Was there extensive fire damage in the cell? At the time, if I recall well, uh, the cell was like repaired, cleaned. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner? I just wanted to assist. Uh, I think the investigator is answering a question about the state of the cell that he was exposed to last week. He's not answering the question on what was the state of the cell when the body was still there in the morning of the, uh, yeah, in the morning of the incident, which is the 3rd of May, 2022. And uh, yeah, he's indicating that he, he only got access to the photos last week. And that is as a result of the takeover we did. This is the information that we could not get access to when they were doing the investigation. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you very much, uh, National Commissioner. Honorable Stuart. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Minister and Commissioner. Uh, Minister Grand, I sent you a very urgent um, response on the request for response on the 17th of March. Um, and obviously, you don't receive all the emails, but on the 17th of March, questions um, relating to the whole incident um, following the exposés and your spokesperson, Chris P responded that he did not see an urgency in responding given that they, asked, they gave a, a three hour deadline, which is very short. But the editor then, Mr. Geffen, 
responded to him explaining the matter was urgent and Piri responded that the report was not yet complete and he could not comment. Are you aware of that email? Was it brought to your attention? That's the 17th of March this year. No, I'm not, but what I'm aware of is that there was a, the spokesperson did inform me that there is a media query on the matter and uh, that uh, they want uh, our response uh, immediately at, uh, at that time. So that's what I'm aware of. But in terms of the content of the email, uh, uh, I understand. You know. um, uh, Minister, but was, was your media department monitoring all the uh, media around this issue that had been building up, starting with November, which was the explosive report from ground up, to building up towards this, and obviously um, it required a response from your office or, or not? Yes, I think they were, because from time to time they will raise the issue with me, and I will always raise it to the National Commissioner to see these questions are perpetually coming. But anyway, remember, the inspecting judge has raised this issue. So we need to take it very serious because it has been raised by the inspecting judge. What, what is happening with the investigations and so forth? So that is it's, it's, it's some of those questions where the National Commissioner ended up telling me of the feedback he got from SAPS that uh, they are at the sensitive stages of the investigation and um, we must not do anything that could jeopardize the investigations and the issues of multiple bodies and various permutations that they are dealing with. Thank you, Minister. So let's, uh, Commissioner, let's then, the responses to media, there's a brief mention about that, but it omits more than it says. And I'd like to take you to the ENCA interview with your spokesperson, um, Mr. Nkhu Mahala, did I get it right? <laughs> but he said, he said, we stand by our statement and I don't understand whether there was a statement, but we stand by a statement of 3 May. Now, that might be incorrect. 3 May, could it be another date? I'm not sure, but we stand by a statement of 3 May 2022. As you are seated now, that is now on the 18th of March. Correctional services doesn't have the outcome of the police report. Now, I understand you might not have that then, but it says it doesn't have the autopsy report. Now that's a blatant lie, because by that stage, according to the JIX, on the 10th of August, JIX says SAPS gave the report to it and the DCS. On the 28th of October, on your own report, now that you've just presented to us, the copy of the post-mortem and the DNA response was received from the police. On the 16th of January, a case is opened of an escape and a, day, a week before this, Jix advises DCS that the inmate Bester is alive, well, and dangerous. Can you explain why your spokesperson would lie on national TV to say that the department does not have the autopsy report on the 18th of March, 2023? Uh, thank you, Honourable Chairperson. The communications um, section of the department receives <laughs> receives um, the final report of the, of the investigations, any investigations that we conduct, and on the basis of that, they then uh, answer to media queries or make statements. Um, the report that the spokesperson was referring to is, a, is an executive report that we received officially as reported through G4S of unnatural death. At that stage, when he was answering uh, that media query, he did not have in his possession a final concluded report of the investigation from the department. Okay, Commissioner, I'll give you that latitude that it's a final report, but the, the point that we've been trying to make, and this is where we as public representatives feel the outrage about the lack of communication with the public, and I've raised this issue 
ad nauseum about the policies of warning the victims. Here we have a person, the evidence is suggesting as way back even from the previous June, uh, way back even from May last year when a police investigator says there's suspicions around this whole incident. And I think that is our concern and that is our outrage and that's the public's concern that at no stage were the public advised, and I appreciate on the one hand, as Minister Chele uh, advised that you don't want to warn him, but I think in this case, the public interest outweighs the interest of trying to trace that person then, to warn the public that here is a dangerous person, a convicted murderer, a convicted rapist, who is out, firstly at least, to warn the victims. Now, Minister, uh, this is not addressed to you, but if I heard you correctly, you said there is a policy or something, and please, I don't want to quote you incorrectly, but Commissioner, how do you warn the rape victims? Do, do you warn rape victims in a situation like this where there is an escape? You do warn them when there's a parole coming up, I understand that, but in a situation like this, is there a policy and was it done? Uh, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. In terms of the, the procedure, when there is an escape, which means that when we have conclusive evidence and information that we have an escape, we do warn members of the public. In this instance, there was a case of unnatural death that was reported, or a, we received a report on, uh, on unnatural death. At that stage, we had not received a final report that would make us conclude that we have an escape. After receiving that report, it didn't take us more than three days to issue out a statement to warn the public, and we were the first uh, uh, government institution to do that, because at that stage, we had received a final report, we had uh, interacted with the investigators, we had checked the, the evidence in the report, and conclusively, at that point, we went out to the public to say, we have an escape. And I must also indicate that actually at that point, it was still risky for the department and the National Commissioner to do that because G4S still maintained that the body that bent on, on, on that, on that uh, uh, morning was the body of Tabo Bester. Sorry, National Commissioner, uh, what date was that that you issued that warning? A roundabout, roundabout, I don't have to have a... Um, we received the report on the, on the 22nd of, of March, okay, 2023. So I understand that. So yes. that is following the massive media coverage of ground up, following your report to the police on the 16th of January of an escape. You reported to the police. So from January at best, and in October already you've got these reports, but from January you your officers report an escape and you wait until March to issue a warning. Now, I find that unacceptable, given the issues around this whole case. But I'll leave it at that. What I do want to ask you is the glaring omission is that on the 24th of March, only on the 24th of March, DCS activates the DCT team to track him down. Why only on the 24th of March? When you have all this evidence, when on the 16th of January, you already had, and go back to the 28th of October when there was huge suspicion and the reports that you then got already, why do you wait until the 24th of March to activate the track and trace team to try to arrest him? And we see it was literally two weeks later and he was arrested, Toof, like that. He was arrested. And thankfully, as Honorable Breitenbach said earlier, Thankfully, he did not commit another offense in this time. Thankfully. But it's to no benefit of the department because you had the information. Commissioner, on the 16th of January, an escape is reported. Why didn't you, on that date, have the activation team to track and trace him on that date? And why did you wait to the 24th of March? Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. We have presented uh, to the committee through the report that we have submitted that, yes, the case was opened on the 16th of January. 
in the same presentation, we are, in, we are indicating that the National Commissioner became aware that the case was opened in the meeting that was convened on the 23rd of March when the final investigation report was discussed with the investigators, the regional management uh, committee and, uh, and uh, colleagues uh, from management in the department. The uh, media statement was issued out as uh, one has indicated on the 25th. The tracking team, the tracking team was appointed in the morning of the 24th of March. We finished the meeting after 12 o'clock, immediately after finishing the meeting, confirming the facts. I then uh, uh, issued out an instruction to put together the tracking and tracing team, which started its work at that time. Thank you very much. But may I suggest with the greatest respect that it's not necessary to wait to a final report before you have the track and trace team. I'm sure that can't be your policy. Surely when you have an escape, you should activate the track and trace team immediately and that you don't have to wait for a final report, even if there is some doubts. Is that not truly your policy? Uh, Chairperson. Five minutes left. Uh, Chairperson. Minister, minister, I think the minister wants to comment, or someone. Yeah, no. I just wanted to come on this point because I also asked the National Commissioner the same question uh, when these suspicions were becoming uh, loud around November or so. That, but why don't you just go and arrest and test this alleged person who is outside? And he said to me, look, there, there, there are a number of issues involved. Uh, one is that we don't know whether it's him or not. The first thing the police are going to ask me is whether do we have a warrant of arrest and so forth. So the first thing that needs to happen is that an escape must be declared uh, uh, first. Then the track and tracing team uh, can 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 come into the into the space. So it's a, it's not like a normal straightforward escape where it is known this prisoner just leaves. Then we declare immediately the track and tracing team. So there were still some complexities, and the national commissioner can answer for himself. So I'm just bringing it this to bear that those were some of the engagements we had, even ourselves behind the scene. But why don't we just Thank go Thank and fetch this one? I I appreciate that, thanks, and I've only got two minutes, but I do want to just make the point that we've got to see this against the background of a lot of media coverage at this stage already, and on the 16th of January, Minister, even the 16th of January, a case of escape is reported on that day. The track and trace team should have been activated because there you report a case, you've got enough evidence, and you report a case. But I'll leave it at that. Uh, the, uh, Commissioner, just the last issue. I raised this and I just want an explanation from someone. On the 17th of March, you, someone in the department issued a statement about so-called leaks from unidentified sources and suggested that information supplied by these unauthorized so sources were putting undue pressure on the department to confirm or deny these reports. Now you were getting continuous comments and from ground up, said please confirm this, please answer this, no response. No response, no response. And then a, a, almost a chilling um, media report is saying, please stop putting pressure on us. In other words, and I appreciate there might be a lot of invalid things that are coming your way, but here is ground up sending you information, sending you requests, and you almost say stop putting pressure on us. Is this not a form of a contempt almost for whistleblowers, or are you not taking them seriously? And should you not consider going forward, taking greater note of what these investigative journalists are saying and the information? I put the same information to SAPS, and they said, yes, we, we, we can make use of that. Um, that will be my last question. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair. No, from, uh, from our side, uh, let me just uh, concede that uh, we do not uh, uh, take that as contempt, number one. Number two. The, the information that uh, that was 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 received by us is information that was also uh, treated by the investigators. Um, the statement that was issued out at that point was to indicate to the public that we should work together, because obviously there were those reports that we were, we were receiving 
that were really uh, uh, misleading. I can give uh, one example, for instance, um, with the, the offenders, uh, honorable chairperson, who would report instances of having information about the, 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 the by that time, the, the escape. Some of them actually, uh, to this uh, uh, date, they are still indicating that they were able to see someone walking up and down um, um, uh, Broadway. But at that time of the escape, offenders were locked up. The, the structure of the cell door is that there is a, there's, that there's a space where you can be able to, 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 to peep through with bars, but there's a flip that seals the cell. And, and, and that flip uh, uh, that seals the cell can only be lifted up from outside, not from inside. If you are to, to lift it from inside, it, it will be difficult for you to even make the person who's walking up and down the corridor. Now, th th this is the type of information that you have to sift through uh, when, you, when you do an investigation or when you get alerts and you follow that up. Uh, where it's useful, you, you utilize it. Where it's not useful, of course, uh, you just focus on the work at hand. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Engelbrecht. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, National Commissioner, uh, I just want to clear something up that came to the fore during uh, this morning's uh, que question and answer session with the inspecting judge um, relating to the regional commissioner. The DCS controllers that is stationed at the G4S Mangaung facility, do they report to the regional commissioner or not? Uh, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. The controllers report to the Director Contract Management at Head Office. So would that then mean that the PPP facilities uh, do not fall under the regional and provincial DCS structures, but di falls directly under National Head Office? Yes, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, then, um, when it comes to the department invoking section 112 about an event that occurred a year ago, I'm, I'm rather concerned. Um, reason being is that um, I hope that you are sure that the state of affairs at that facility prior to you invoking section 112 uh, was of such a nature that the invoking of this section would be uh, upheld by a court of law. Because after our conversations with G4S, I am utterly convinced that they will take the department to court and they will question the invoking of section 112. And I'm not sure if historic events can be used as a reason to evoke 112 now, not knowing if those uh, events were still prevalent just prior to the department invoking section 112. Thank Honourable you, Honourable Chairperson. In the Are they not part of what they've sought legal opinion on? Uh, yeah, no, I don't think you have to answer. I'm, I'm just stating a concern, and I hope yeah. that these things are in order. Then I, think um, I think the concern would be noted. <laughs> Um, then, to end off, and I'm not going to take 15 minutes, um, Mr. Chair, uh, we've heard from everyone involved now, and um, so we can come to a conclusion in our own minds. And mine is the following. 
uh, the inspecting judge shared public information with ground up ground up published the story because of the publication the public's interest uh, became focused on this issue after a while and I'm convinced that because of the public outcry we are sitting here today so I think it can be derived that had the inspecting judge not shared the information with ground up we would have been none the wiser and Bester would in all probability still be roaming around freely from my perspective uh, the inspecting judge shared this information with the journalist because of the numerous attempts by him to get the minister and DCS to act has failed and this is evident in the timeline where we see when things were done the inspecting judge during his questions and answer session was understandably uh, very kind in respect uh, of the minister I mean he has to work with with the minister however despite his kindness he felt compelled to share the information with the journalists with the hope of eliciting a public outcry to get the minister and the department to do their job and I think us sitting here right now is a testament to the inspecting judge being 100% correct in his assumptions so having said that and you can comment on it or you can you don't have to if you don't want to but I want to know from uh, Minister Lamola seeing all of these failures and if we talk about the concept of accountability Mr. La Lamola will you resign as a minister because of this debacle thank you that's all I have yeah no thank you yeah uh, maybe on firstly on the 112 intervention i hope that the honorable ongobrak is not suggesting that with all that is in front of us everything is under control at the mangaung correctional facility secondly on your question whether i will resign or not no i'm not gonna resign because i did what <coughs> i was supposed to do and you will have yet even the the judge that as he informed me he was not also informing me with certainty that mr bester has escaped he said there's a suspicion that is being investigated by the saps by dcs including the inspecting judge which i immediately called the national commissioner to say national commissioner i was on a call with the inspecting judge these are the issues he's saying this thing does sound unbelievable but if it comes from a judge you need to act on it which is what i was supposed to do and i've done it unfortunately i cannot instruct the national commissioner to go and arrest the person neither can i instruct the saps to go and arrest the person because as you may be aware mr engelbrecht is is the jurisdiction of the investigating officer to decide when and how to effect an arrest but i did inform the national commissioner of my discussion with the judge which i told him that the judge did say this thing sounds unbelievable but he is a judge he believes that this suspicion needs to be followed up so let's follow it up and from time to time i will definitely call the national commission even when we receive the questions sometimes from the media and so forth to say how far is the investigations and that is when i answered when uh, honorable swart was uh, asking that at some stage he told me that this thing has become broader than just 
them investigating an escape. Uh, there's multiple bodies. In fact, the, 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 the police believe this could be something bigger than what they see. So we should not do anything that could jeopardize the investigation. Hence, I confined my discussion between myself and the National Commissioner on this issue because of the nature and the sensitivity that was becoming apparent to me. But I understood the agency and the need to put pressure uh, on him. And I do think that when you look at the timelines from when the National Commissioner was doing follow-ups and so forth, it is also after many times I prompted him. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable. Just one thing. Uh, the minister uh, referred to Section 112. I just want to make it clear. I am not saying that the things at Mangahung G4S is by any means wonderful right now. I raised a concern after studying the contract between DCS and, uh, and I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but I have an opinion that according to what I read there, and I might be wrong and I hope I'm wrong, that there might be a financial risk for the department, which is something that we do not want. I just want to make that clear. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think the department will act legally and rationally. Thank you very much, Honorable Hor. Thank you, Chair. Um, maybe I must start off while the minister is on the floor to touch base with the minister on uh, the statement he made uh, around his responsibility in respect of DCS being primarily oversight in nature. It's, of course, different to our, our oversight, Minister. I hope you would agree. Um, and if we for a moment accept that answer, also in light of the fact that you said we have failed and we take responsibility, what then, in hindsight, should you have done differently? Firstly, you will have uh, heard, Honorable One, that uh, I'm clear that we must apologize for the fact that Mr. Best escaped from our facility, which is a facility operated by G4S. And I said, while it is operated by G4S on behalf of the South African government, the ultimate responsibility lies with the South African government. It lies with the Department of Correctional Service. The South African public does not know G4S. Mm -hmm. They know us. So it's us who must apologize to the South African public for this escape. And that is the responsibility I'm taking. Okay, let, let, let's stay with your oversight responsibilities. Uh, we, we only, so now well known, we only have two public-private partnerships in respect of correctional facilities in this country. So as the minister, what have you done to ensure that the oversight, the monitoring, the evaluation in terms of this, the agreement in respect of Mangoon Correctional Center is properly done? Is to request uh, reports during the management, uh, the ministerial management meetings and also to request them to tell us what is the process that DCS has started uh, in anticipation of the takeover of the facility in 2026. And as we speak now, there is a team from DCS working on the process of the takeover. Uh, despite this process that we're dealing with in terms of, um, of the legal opinion that was seeking, in relation to the current situation, whether we should terminate or not, and whether we'll have the capacity to take over or not at this stage. So since my arrival, I've been very clear that we are not going to extend this 25-year contract. So the department must start to prepare the processes of takeover, and there's been many activities of monitoring. I know that the deputy minister has also visited 
uh, these centers, including uh, the Quintama Sintimule and so forth, in that process of monitoring and also enhancing the process of the takeover. Okay, so have you considered the risks um, involved in public-private partnerships in general, long-term uh, public-private partnerships, uh, the risk involved, which is accepted globally, that towards the end of a longer-term contract, evaluation and oversight is, is neglected, and linked to that, your, your announcement, which I'm not saying you were not entitled to make, but your announcement already that come 2026 we're taking over there. Have you, have, what have you done to mitigate those risks? Yeah, as I've said, the Honorable Horn, there are teams, as we speak now, hmm. from DCS dealing with all those issues, the risk, the cost, the number of employees there, how many will we need, how many are retiring, how many are we taking over, what could be the risk, what type of profile and all that. So they are dealing with everything related to that uh, process, including the risks. And what have they found? One is that... Um, the, 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 what you have seen there is a presentation. For example, the, the private-public partnerships, they use a different system in terms of the grading of the offenders. They start with the AEA+, which is a higher kind of privilege, and then they work them down. It's a philosophy that they are running. While DCS is opposite, uh, you start from zero, where you have got nothing, until you gain your points of good behavior and so forth. Which we have agreed that that should be uh, harmonized. It must be in line with the DCS process. Mm -hmm. And also the discrepancies with regard to the salaries that uh, it looks like they are paid more a bit, which the department might not really afford, particularly the, the officials. And it looks like um, there's about 30% or so in mm Mangaung -hmm. that is soon going to, to retirement. So there's a number of things that they did find, which I think will be helpful as we move forward. Okay. So, so talking about those officials, one of the things that of course is now on the table is that come 2026, they have an un uncertain future. Now your agreement with, with Group 4 Security say they may not make use of any custody officials who are not certified and you can even, in some instances, revisit the certification. A lot has been said about the uh, lack of G4S to do lifestyle audits and according to your own report, their own intelligence operations were weak. Have your team considered recertifying the Group 4 security officials there as part of a risk management in the run-up to 2026? I think the, the NSC can answer that one. Oh, the controller and so forth. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Minister. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. The, the, the HR processes with regards to, to take over includes uh, lifestyle audits. We have already indicated that with Mangaung, with the takeover at the moment, that's one of the things that we're going to do. Um, and then uh, we have already identified that there's a different grading system in terms of uh, salaries, as the minister has indicated, and we've also identified that there's a need for, for reskilling or retraining, especially of uh, correctional officials, because the training that uh, the, the Mangaun correctional officials go through in terms of uh, intensity and time is less than the, uh, the training that we take our own correctional officials through. So those are the details that the, the, the task teams have been uh, uh, tasked to, to work on. There's an action plan that we did present to the portfolio committee and uh, we are ready uh, upon uh, uh, being invited to the portfolio committee to give more progress with regards to the details that we have uncovered. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you. Uh, Chair, my next question uh, is, is around the, the periodic reviews which the contract makes provision for. Am I correct to understand that 
it fir at first it was agreed that those would happen quarterly, but of late, that has not happened quarterly. Yeah, yes, you are correct uh, uh, through you, Honorable Chairperson. Yes, you are correct, Honorable Member. Yeah, and, 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 and now with the benefit of hindsight, would you agree that quite possibly a, a keeping up the quarterly reviews could maybe have assisted to prevent what happened? Yes, I agree uh, uh, through you, Honorable Chairperson. Yes, I agree, Honorable Member. Uh, let me indicate that uh, the quarterly reviews um, are done by the supervisory committee, but through the reporting system of the department, uh, we also get the region to include the information from G4S in the quarterly reports that we consider as management of the department on the performance of the correctional system. Hence, when we also meet on a weekly basis to look at the, the performance of correctional facilities through the National Operations Committee. We also include the information and reports from uh, Mangaung Correctional Facility. A actually, um, the latest report that was done on the infrastructure and the operations of the fire system at Mangaung was done in the last six months, which is what uh, we also provided uh, to the contractor. Okay. Um, I, I just want National Commissioner to touch base with you regarding your response to the question by the Honorable Engelbrecht, because I have it that the job, job description of the controller entail a first line of reporting to the Deputy Regional Commissioner in question before the I want to say parallel and separate reporting line to the uh, direct national director contract management. Uh, you answered that the only reporting line is to the contract management director. Um, are you quite sure about your information? Um, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Yes, I am sure. I have just indicated, uh, Honorable Chairperson, that when, with regards to operational information that we aggregate for the correctional system, the region uh, collects that information uh, and submits to management. But when it comes to the performance, the work of the controllers, when it comes to the tasking of the controllers, uh, reporting uh, in terms of their performance contracts and accountability, they are directly accountable to the director contract management. That's why even in terms of the investigation that they instituted uh, after appointing the investigators, that investigation report went from the, uh, the controllers to the director contract management. There, there is no line between that intercepted that, uh, that, uh, that investigation. It is just a, a, a line that provides information. It's not a line that provides management and control. Thank you. Um, then in, in respect of the um, complaints or violation notices, we, we see in the report that you, you report um, for the mo mo most recent period, would you be able to furnish us with a longer period, maybe five years so that we can see the trend of violation notices, the numbers, uh, the type of violation notices, um, I don't, I can't insist on it now or the detail of it now, but would you be able to do that, please? Four minutes. Thank you, Chair. We, we will be able to do that uh, through you, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you. Uh, Chair, then, with your permission, I want to move back to the Minister. Uh, Minister, as part of your oversight functions, um, in respect of the previous uh, national commissioner, uh, what was your, your oversight of his exit activities at the time? So the, the decisions he took uh, uh, during the 
let's say, the, the, the last few weeks or months of his, of his tenure after having, of course, being informed that his contract would not be extended? It was the same as I arrived. So what would that be? The normal oversight reports, what is happening, uh, the quarterly reports that are necessary, the management committee meetings, and uh, everything that is supposed to be, to be done. So wouldn't you agree that in respect of a director general, which in essence the national commissioner is, whenever there is a contract to, to come to an end, uh, there will have to be transitional arrangements in place and that your obligation will be to have a very careful oversight so that there is no last minute decisions that ultimately come back to haunt the department. That's just as a matter of principle in general. Let's forget about the personalities involved. Yeah, I hope, uh, Honorable Hon, you are not suggesting uh, micromanagement because uh, I know you, you, you may not want that. I will definitely from time to time get reports and if there is something, uh, I will also call in to provide certain reports. Uh, there were a number of exchanges for this report and that report. And obviously, I also monitored him and so forth. But also, when he thinks that uh, there is something he may want to report, he will report and, and all that. Okay. And then my, my, my final question, and I don't know whether... I must look towards you because obviously it's not fair to ask the new national commissioner. But are you aware or were you made aware that the visit to the Mangaung Center on the very last day of Mr. Fraser's service was necessitated by complaints from Group 4 security that the, the then controllers were overreaching and issuing too many violation notices and, and that they they really should be moved in order to restore a harmonious relationship. No, I'm not aware of that. And will you be able to find out? Yeah, you can get the report. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you very much. Uh, members, I've realized that uh, aircon is not working properly and there's no water. And when the minister said that uh, when the body was dead, I realized that <laughs> <laughs> it's time to get a <laughs> to get a body break. <laughs> <laughs> so it is, let's have it. Uh, how, ma how many minutes? <laughs> oh, I'm told that dinner is outside. Can we come back at? Huh? Yeah. Can we come back? Huh? Can we take thirty minutes? Five, ten, fifteen. C can we come back at twenty past?
to give to Honorable Nivot Duchan. She will be followed by Honorable Yako. Honorable Yako will be followed by Honorable Ramulube. And then Honorable Koza. The last one will be Honorable Janji in that order. Thank you, Chair. Um, for DCS, I wanted to go to slide six because I wanted to understand the public-private partnership structure and how it works. Slide six, you have um, five entities there, the 20% that each has. Now, I wanted to know where does the department fit into that? Um, do those entities then report to the department? Because if each of the entities, like G4S, you know, those entities, where does the department um, fit in, or and where does, does G4S then fit in in light of what happened? I just wanted to understand that part. Sorry, Honorable Nubu Tuchan, I was distracted a bit. Do you want me to repeat the question, Chair? Please. Don't deduct ask. my minutes. No, no. <laughs> no, you're starting now. Okay, in slide number six, I wanted to understand the public-private partnership, how it's structured and how does it work. So there it shows the five entities, and I'm assuming that the 20% is the shares. So where does DCS fit into all of this? Yeah. <coughs> Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Um, the Department of Correctional Services is contracted to the Bloemfontein um, uh, contract, uh, uh, concession contract, basically meaning that uh, you have a consortium of those uh, uh, um, shareholders that you that are, appear on slide number six. So, in the light of what happened with the fire, it's only G4S who takes responsibility. The rest don't take any responsibility for the fire at all. It is actually the, the consortium. Um, G4S has a role as a contracted operator. That's why when we uh, uh, gave um, G4S the notice of takeover, we actually referred to the, the consortium. Even when we answered to the, the letter of legal contest, we indicated that we can only deal with the consortium. Okay, fine, thank you. And then go to slide 16. There are 50 disputes with G4S, and I'm assuming that these disputes cover, is covered from 2022-23 financial year? Uh, I'm going to request that the uh, acting deputy commissioner in the office of the national commissioner uh, talk to that slide on the disputes through you, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairperson, and thank you, uh, National Commissioner. Uh, the slides on disputes uh, with G4S is actually handled by the acting director, advocate George Matlangu. So with your permission, uh, Chairperson, I'm going to request him to please respond on this one. Thank you. Yeah, no, Honorable Chairperson, uh, through you, let me just uh, respond. The, 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 the National Commission, you're saying I must respond? No, no, <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying through you, uh, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, the, these are disputes that covers the past three years, up to uh, January 2023. Okay, so normally these disputes, when do they get resolved 
um, because the contract is ending in 2026. So when do you expect these disputes to be resolved? And through you, Honorable Chairperson, the disputes are resolved in the sittings of the Supervisory Committee. Um, at the moment, the Supervisory Committee is not sitting because there is a vacant seat of a, an expert, an external expert, who is supposed to be appointed. The process of appointing the external ex, uh, expert is underway. Uh, I think by now the, 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 the closing date has, has passed and uh, ourselves and, uh, and the consortium, the department and the consortium is supposed to sit through a process of appointment of an external uh, expert. Okay, thank you. I would just like to add in support of what Honorable Horn recently asked. I would also like to see um, how many disputes you've had over the past five years and then when these disputes have been resolved. I'd like, um, like Honorable Horn asked and requested that information, I would also like that. And then the temporary management Again, the structure, I would like to know how it works. The temporary management is now in charge of MCC. Now, yesterday, G4S explained the structure of the three directors. Now, where do they fit in with the temporary management, or do these three then fall away? I understand you said that G4S is still there, but these are director positions. So where do they fit in with the temporary management and the temporary direct? Um, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. The temporary manager came in to um, take over from the center director, meaning that in the 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 space that is, uh, the box that is in the middle, in that structure, where it is indicated that the center director of MCC is Mr. Joseph Munyanti. In that space, that's where you have the temporary manager. Okay, so the other two are still there and work together as a team? They are still there and work together as a team, but with regards to the management and the functioning of the center, the temporary manager will then um, take the final decision. Okay. You listed in your slides all of the disputes, all the violations and failures Oh, so what is going to be, be done about those? What guarantee do we as women, especially the women of South Africa have, you know, understanding clearly that there, will be no, there hasn't been any more escapes, um, it wouldn't be as easy as that was, especially with this team still there. So what guarantee can you give that this will not happen again? Um, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. In the presentation, um, there is a slide where we are presenting the action plan that will be followed by the team and the temporary manager. We are already implementing that uh, action plan. That's why at this moment we can say with certainty that all the inmates, all the offenders that are at uh, Mangaung Correctional Center have been accounted for, meaning that we have uh, checked their fingerprints against the records that are there. We have also taken uh, photos of them and checked uh, so the, the photos. So every offender that is in that facility as we speak has been accounted for. So those actions are the actions that we are implementing and uh, monitoring as we, as we go. And as I've indicated, we have control of those uh, um, actions. Um, if I can just give an example, there, there was a, a number of, of uh, offenders that uh, were resisting to be verified, and we insisted on that happening. And because of the, the control we have over the facility, 
all of them ended up being um, verified with the assistance of the EST team from Hotflay and also with the, the employees that are there at uh, MMC. Thank you, Chair. Those are my questions. Thank you very much, Honorable Nivot Strohan. Honorable Yako. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I think uh, for the sake of uh, progress, I'm going to just do uh, maybe a preamble, ask a few questions based on this report, and then pose some questions to the Minister. Um, I think we've, we've been deliberating on this for two days now, and I, we are extremely tired, um, and I don't think we have any tangible answers or any tangible kind of direction as to where we should go, um, and nothing is coming out. If I'm going to say it in this closer, I can't it from what we are doing, and I hope um, at some point we're going to keep picking at it until something comes out and something and remedies are made. Um, there's three elephants here, but the biggest elephant is the white elephant, which is G4S, um, which has hindered progress across. And I think they've had their way for a very long time, and which is why they have made this work so difficult that we are here now where we are. Um, we've gone to uh, uh, correctional service centers, uh, the co commissioner will know. Um, we've seen what they can do with the resources that they have. I'm, taking up, I'm talking about state-owned ones, state-run ones. We've seen how you deal with overcrowding. We've seen how you are able to be self sustainable in some. We've seen how you're able to have animals, breed, uh, make furniture from scratch, rehabilitate. We've seen all those things. Um, also, we've seen how G4S is a cut above the rest. And primarily because of the seven billion that we've spent over the 20 years for G4, G4S. Um, and for me, it begs the question as to how, why did it take so long for correctional services and the ministry to decide on terminating that contract? Because it seemed to me, had this not been a, a factor right now, it would have maybe been renewed in 2024. So um, that concerns me. Um, and then moving to the report, um, I'm just going to ask a few questions. So. On page seven, you've got a graph there. I don't know if you can go to it now. Slide 14. Yes. No, 14. Yeah. So you say there, this is your report as from 2017 to 2023. And you had an incident in 2022 when someone died of unnatural causes, and that is not recorded there. There's a zero. Um, you've got a death, but there's nothing, the death investigation, and you've got zero in 2022. And it should have been recorded that you had an incident that happened in 2022 of Tabo Bester who killed himself, but it's not recorded there. And I'm wondering why that is. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Um, we are not report, reporting it as an unnatural death. We are reporting it as an escape. In, 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 in the, in the uh, financial year 2022, we had two escapes, the one in May and the one in December. We are reporting it as, a, as, a, as an escape. But you had not captured it as an escape at the time of 2022 then. Should you not then reconfigure that in 2023 to say, we had thought it was an unnatural death at the time because that's what you reported. That's what you claimed it was, and G4A's claimed that there was a death of Tabo Besta at the time. And you should have then reconfigured it in 2023 to say no. Now that the evidence has come through, true, we are then listening that to A. Or that should have been an addendum to that graph because then it doesn't make sense. Um. Through you, Honorable Chairperson, I agree with the Honorable Member. This um, report is a report that was prepared for the Portfolio Committee as of this period 
um, after obviously um, the, 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 the financial year 2022. Um, if this report was, and it is after, of course, we have received our final report. And now, if this report, this presentation, this slide was worked on before we received our final report, it would reflect as, a, as an unnatural death. But you do note that it reads as untrue based on the evidence that you had in 2022 and now, without a side note saying that what, what should have happened is this, what was recorded in 2022 is this. That's what I want to flag. Um, secondly, um, National Commission, on page eight, you talk about an integrated security system that's able to detect um, able to detect cell phones in the facilities. And how do you think that Tabo Besta was found with a cell phone in, in his cell? If that integrated security system that you've put here, which I think, had I been you, I would have taken out because that's not what it did. It did not detect that cell phone that came into his cell at the time. Thank you, Norwich Chairperson. I, well, our report shows that um, the officials that were managing the control rooms did not do their work, um, including the fact that even cameras were tampered with. So the system is there. It has these uh, uh, um, functionalities, but we still rely on honest officials that are committed to do their work to do their work. Now, when we find out that they have not done their work, we, we implement consequence management but the systems are there. They are trained and there is on-site support at all times. If something goes wrong with the system, it shows and the technicians on-site are supposed to, to attend to it, but technicians can only attend to it if it is reported. And also if it is reported, then te technicians don't attend to that um, error. Also those technicians obviously will be found wanting through investigation processes and that's what our investigation report is indicating. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you, Chair. Um, on page 11, um, there's a sequence of events that you've outlined here, and maybe the Minister will come in and with you, Commissioner, and, and, and make me understand why you would have a meeting. Um, so it says, SEPs informed G4S that they changed the inquest to a homicide, and G4S informed DCA's controller on the 6th of June. Um, and it seems to me, and then DC, the outcome of this investigation was not provided to DCS until the 31st of March. And you then add a bit of a part there, which I think is, 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 is a way of apologizing for your inaction, which says that the letter from G4S, however, indicates the death of Inmo Tabo Besta was now a homicide, meaning that they still consider the body as that of Tabo Besta. So you, you allowed the narrative of a Tabo Besta who was then murdered but the name Tabo Besta still remains there, even though you knew that that person who died there or the person who was brought dead dead was not the person. Um, why, would, why would you allow DC, I mean G4S to only give you that investigation a year later? Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. We did indicate upfront in the presentation and in the report the difficulties that we faced with getting information from G4S, the evasiveness, and outright refusal. We have the, 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 the evidence in the investigation report. And as DCS, you don't have control over G4S whatsoever. They just allowed to say to you, we're not going to give you what you want. We have uh, taken steps. That's why we continued with our investigation. And uh, the recommendations are pointing to the fact that we need to issue out notices in line with the contract uh, to deal with the this uh, uh, you know, type of, of, of transgressions or non-compliance, but also as we are sitting here uh, this evening, we, are, we have taken control of the facility and it is for that reason. But if we go back to 6 June, at that time, the department had not received, let me put it this way, the investigators had not received the autopsy and DNA reports. Um. On page 13, you say findings of the investigation. Um, the sequence of events outlined in the report substantiates that there were a number of breaches on the contract. 
leading up to the escape of Tabo Besta. Um, and to the minister, what is going to happen with regard to these breaches to this contract? Yeah, thank you, uh, Chairperson. One uh, thing that maybe I must correct, uh, Honorable Yako, when you started, you said maybe we are saying we will not renew the contract because of this incident. We have said it many years ago. Even in this committee, we have also said it that our intention is that when the contract uh, expire in 2026, <coughs> we do not have an intention to extend it or to renew it. We said it in this committee. We have also said it in public. And with regard to the question you're asking now is that it is part of the issue of the legal opinion. What then should be done with all these breaches? Because um, as you are aware, uh, and you, as you will have seen, there are a lot of litigations between the department and MCC. So whatever decisions that we need to take must be informed by, must be based on, must be based on proper legal basis. That's your final answer? Yes. Okay. Unless you want us to litigate in this house. Uh, that's not needed. That comment was really not needed, Minister. Um, what is the obligation of DCS with regards to the body that was found? The body that was not Tabo Besta, that was found on the premises of G4S. The, or the obligation of DCS would be to report the incident to the police, which was duly done. Um, in the instance that, uh, uh, let me go back to the first report that we received, that uh, this was an, an unnatural death. One of the things that we tested through our investigators is to check if G4S did inform the next of kin. And the response that we received from G4S was that they could not find the next of kin because we wanted to get to the point where the body gets to be, uh, you know, uh, given to the uh, to Dr. Maguduma. So our investigators actually called the next of kin that is indicated in the profile of uh, Tabo Bester, who is the uncle. And just with one phone call, we're able to connect with the uncle. So if we have an offender um, that, uh, uh, you know, um, you know, dies through a natural death or any kind of, of or even uh, um, an incident uh, of harm that happens to an offender. We report to the police and we inform the next of kin. Not Apart just, from the, the medical treatment and other treatments sorry, that we then I provide. just want you to backtrack a bit. So you're saying that when you found the body, you were able to get in touch with the uncle? Uh, through you, Honorable Jefferson, yes. Yes, Honorable Member. So why did G4S come here and say to us that they were unable to get a hold of the uncle and then they then handed the body over to the, to Makudum? Five that minutes. I'll be done, Chair. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chairman. That is, the, that is the, the, the basis of the outcome of our report as we were investigating. That's what we are indicating in the report. So what G4S is saying is false, that they were unable to get hold of the uncle <coughs> so that the body would then be handed over to the next person because you were able to get hold of the uncle. Through you, Honorable Chairman, that's exactly what I'm saying. It is in our, in our report and we have records of that uh, uh, interaction. Actually, even the, um, the official of G4S that was charged with this responsibility was interviewed and there is an affidavit that talks to the, to the account of G4S, but we have our own account. So Mr. Khunevold and Mr. Khunevold basically came here and lied to the house to say that they could not get hold of the uncle on the day. Um, thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, just one last thing. How many days have been recorded at MCC that are unnatural? Uh, Honorable Chairperson, I would request that we go back to the table. You recorded zero there.
it, um, we have listed this according to uh, financial years. And we are referring to which financial year? Oh, no, 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 it's, it's, Apologies. it's fine, Commissioner. I'm covered. I, I just <laughs> am covered. I did answer this question you did, before. Yeah, you did. Yes, no, you so did. that's why I'm saying yeah, which year are we referring did. to? No, I'm, I'm yes. covered. Just one second last thing, Chair. Um, looking at the gravity of the matter that we have at hand right now, looking at the fact that you apprehended Tabo Besta and he's now in Hosimaburu, how secure are you that you are going to keep him safe so that whoever orchestrated any of this is unable to get hold of him. Because if they can take a body and put it and plant it in a cell at maximum prison, they're able to do anything to him right now. How are you making sure that he is safe right now in order to account fully until this process is over and we can find out who was involved and how deep this goes? Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. The the, the, the standard that we apply uh, to offenders of high risk um, um, like Tabo Pester is the same. Obviously, we also look at the, the type of crimes that uh, that offender would be uh, uh, saving for or sentenced for. I think can you uh, guarantee his safety or not? He is safe in terms of the security plan that we have put in place. Okay. Um, just lastly, Minister, are you happy with your performance with regards to this? Yeah, I have done what um, I was supposed to do and uh, ensured that um, after I was informed by the inspecting judge, I informed the National Commissioner who told me of the <coughs> investigation that is already underway which um, unfortunately he said he could not share it at the preliminary stages because it was still at infancy. The information was not enough at that time because I asked him, but why didn't you tell me about this? And that's what he said. And um, I emphasized the issue that this matter is important. It must be prioritized. And I followed up. And from time to time, he will tell me that it's a sensitive matter. There's multiple bodies. There is an ongoing investigation that we must not jeopardize. But there is investigation that is underway and is being attended to. Thank you very much. Sorry, I think I have a minute. I'll give it to Fosi. <laughs> OK, Honorable Koza. Chair, yeah, it's me. Oh, okay, okay. So, so you will have 11 minutes, 16, 16 minutes. Yes, Chair. Thank you very much. Honorable Ramulube. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> My voice is a bit quirky. I don't know whether I'm developing flu or uh, throat, or maybe it's because of us being, we have been speaking a lot for the past two days. Uh, Chair, let me welcome the report from the DCS and the minister, um, afternoon again, colleagues, or evening now. Uh, chair, or oh, minister and the, the, the national commissioner, how much would you say the G4S would have to pay if there's, um, there's an escape in the, what would be the amount of the penalty, if there is an escape in the facility, how much is it? I'm not speaking of those monies of litigation, Minister, that you've made of the penalty if there is an escape in the, in the MMC. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. I'm going to ask the acting director, contract management, to respond to the issue, the question. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chairperson. Normally, in cases of uh, escape, uh, the observation fine is just under one million. So that is what should be expected uh, uh, for G for S to pay. What is under one million? Even one rand is under one million. <laughs> I was about to say that. 
precisely um, 900,000. Can we get accuracy of that report, please? Um, and, and, and also have a report of how many escape actually would have transpired in the MCC. Uh, bearing in mind also our oversight visit that we did last year in April, uh, the mention of the escapes that they would have transpired, including the Tabo Bester one, including the one in December um, of the person who escaped in the hospital. Can we, through you, Chair, get that, that detail, detailed report? Commissioner, you, you, you made an indication that you got to be aware of the escape in January. Is that correct? I got to be aware of the escape after receiving the report. The report I received on the 22nd of March. So in January, you were not unaware of a possible escape from someone or anything? In January? Yes, 2023. I was, 2023. I was aware of a draft investigation report that was uh, submitted by the investigators um, through the controller to the director contract management. Yeah, it was a draft report which had uh, information that pointed to the escape uh, with all the information that was supporting that. That is the report that I followed up um, the director contract management on to say that you have received a report. It's, um, we need to finalize this report so we can be able to firstly report the escape to SAPS and we can then put in motion our own processes of tracking and tracing. The response that I received was that uh, at that time, uh, the director was still considering the report and additional information, so it would not be a report that would put me in a position of reliability in terms of uh, uh, concluding that definitely there is an escape. An assurance based on your report says on the 12th of January, the controller would have opened an escape, an escape case, WhatsApps. That is on your, um, on your report. Who is the official that opened a case? The one who's a controller in the MCC, who's based in the MCC? Uh, through your honorable chairperson is Mr. Mahonono. What would have happened since with Mr. Mahonono? three months later after opening that case? What is the current status of that person right now? Mr. Mr. Uh, three Mr. Maonono is uh, contemplated for suspension. We are continuing with the investigations under the unit, uh, departmental investigation unit. He is also uh, currently providing information and statements that we need for us to investigate broader um, the role of G4S in the, in the whole um, incident. Do you suspect any foul, foul play from his side to be equally implicated in this plan to get Bester escape? Uh, thank you, Honorable uh, Chairperson. In answering that question, I would say that as the department, we are at this moment not convinced that he acted with due care with regards to his responsibilities. And we are <coughs> pointing to that in the report. For instance, on the Saturday of that long weekend, uh, Mr. Mo, uh, Mahonono uh, visited the correctional facility. He always does that. And he goes to three places. He goes to the control room, he goes to the kitchen, and he goes to Broadway. But on that night, he did not go to Broadway. These are some of the, 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 the issues that point out to the fact that he did not act with the care and the responsibility that was required of him. And he acted out of his uh, normal routine. But as I've indicated, we have contemplated him, and we are actually getting more information from him and more statements, especially 
about um, inmates or offenders that can assist with more information and the officials of uh, G4S. Is he the only one suspended? He is not the only one. The director uh, contract management is suspended. Um, the deputy controller is contemplated for suspension. Both of them have been removed from Mangaun. Do you, when do you perhaps see you concluding the investigation? Especially around the implicated ones who are suspended currently. Um, Honorable Chairperson, without necessarily giving, you know, um, specific time frames, I would say that it would not take us more than two months from now to finalize that. Uh, because we need to take uh, these officials through disciplinary processes and uh, there the are timelines in terms of the Labor Relations Act and, uh, and the basic conditions of employment. Minister, I want to go back to an exchange between you and Honorable Breitenbeck, um, especially at the time that Justice Cameron was informing us um, regarding the telephone discussion between or vis-a-vis the letter um, regarding the issue of Ma Mangawu. Did Justice Cameron in certainty mention that um, in your discussion or yeah, in your phone call discussion that Bester was out? No. It was still an uncertain thing that there is suspicion and um, but um, that there could be some credence that needs to be investigated. Hence, I immediately called the National Commissioner to say that uh, with this information coming from the judge that there could be some credence. We need to act with the priority on this matter. But it was not with certainty. There was still uncertainty, uncertainty whether it's true, whether it's possible. And it was still unbelievable, but I understood the fact that if it came from him, uh, it's a matter that needs, needs to action. be treated with agency. Yeah. Did he come back when it was certain that it, there is an escape of Tabo Bester in the, in the MCC to certain you now? No. Chair, I want to go to the contractual, the contract between DCS and, the, and Mangawu. I understand the, the, the discussion that says you are seeking legal um, recourse on the matter regarding getting out of the contract and so forth and so on. But I just want to go back. Yesterday, Honorable Kola made mention or raised an issue on the, the fire detectors um, in Broadway. And there was an indication that says they were not there. And there was a follow-up to say, didn't the, uh, the management of the center seat fit that chair? I'm being um, jigs is, and I hope I'm not, my time is not going to be taken by jigs chair. Thank you very much, Judge. Uh, proceed, Honorable Ramulube. Thank you. Chair, I made an indication that Honorable Kola yesterday made, raised an issue of fire detectors, and there was an indication that they're not there in Broadway, and there was a follow-up that says, didn't they see, see fit that fire detectors should be put in place? Um, they raised the issues of the contract between them and TCS, so, which does not um, allow them or permit them to do that. Clause 8 and Clause 9 of the main contract allows for a contractor to propose changes to the contract. In this instance, it means a G4S would be able to, um, uh, what do you call it, install those fire um, detectors. Is this true? Um, can really close eight and close nine speak to that? If indeed, um, are we able to have G4S installing them? 
so that we, we understand whether they wanted to install them um, or they just chose not to do it. Um, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. It is um, true that there is a provision in the concession contract for that, um, uh, Section 8 and 9, and upon uh, application, uh, DCS would uh, consider that, and it is an improvement that is necessary uh, to enhance the security of the institution and will allow that to happen. Did G4S be made aware of that provision? Um, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. I would want to, to believe that they know about that provision. Um, uh, I think the main issue is that uh, they, they should have applied. But I must indicate that there was a, a, a review done of the infrastructure and uh, its uh, limitations, and the issue of uh, fire detectors was raised in that report, and that report was submitted to G4S. It was, it was, um, 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 it was the, the investigation or the review was done by the facilities unit from the Department of Correctional Services with the assistance of Department of Public Works and Infrastructure. You are left with two minutes plus one minute uh, of disturbance, so three minutes. Thanks, Chair. What remedial action should be considered um, by the department, bearing in mind the embarrassment of this incident that it would have cost the country? Um, what remedial action do you propose should happen, um, Minister and um, National Commissioner? Um, we're sitting with a crisis that has put us, has plunged us into a serious embarrassment as, as, a, as a whole country. And two, do we have a roadmap to remedy ourselves in this whole situation? Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Honorable Member. Um, the first uh, remedial action is uh, from our side. Hence, we, we apologize for, for this incident. As the custodians of the, of the Correctional Services Act, we understand that this happened at the MCC G4S uh, operated facility. But we take responsibility because we are the custodian of the Correctional Services Act. That is the first remedial action, is to apologize to the country. And indeed, it was dangerous that this guy was let off the hook by the G4S officials. The second one is the one that we, we prefer not to go too much into it um, because of the legal implications where we are still seeking a legal opinion on the issue of the termination of the contract or not and all that and also assessing our own capability, whether we have the capacity to take over. Because as you will have seen from the presentation, uh, the facility has got about 500 and something. Seven. Yeah, employees. 507 Fi officials. 507 officials. So taking over can't be an overnight thing. So you need to build that capacity. There is infrastructure, there is technology. There's a number of things that needs to be, to be considered. So all are, are the things that we are attending to and they will be able to, when we are ready, within a reasonable space of time, uh, inform the committee of our, our decision, of you. Um, immediately after getting that legal advice, I would propose, Chair, through you, that they do inform the committee so that we equally could have a say on what should, should happen. Because some of us, where we're sitting, we are vying for a total termination of the G4S contract. And sitting here, I understand the implication, Minister. Um, sitting here, I get worried if that should happen in two months' time. We seem not to be ready to take over the institution. Uh, um, it worries me sitting here. Um, because of my next question was going to be, are we ready to take over the institution if in two months' time we are given that opportunity? Because the situation we're facing, it can be correct. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, maybe we... S sorry, Mr. Nessar, before you answer, I just will propose that I, I lost your first part, the first part of the proposal. I'm saying immediately after they seek the legal um, views, 
um, they must bring them to the committee so that we equally can contribute towards towards that, especially on the matter of termination of the G4S contract. Chair. Yeah, Chairperson, I don't want to, to appear disrespecting the honorable member of parliament. Yeah. I thought you were going to give guidance on that day. Request. No, we, will, we will deal with it when we deliberate. Uh, okay. So the, the, the reason I was, say, uh, uh, and I was saying, Minister, is because as I was trying to, in fact, as I was asking her to repeat the response, you're already responding. So I thought because I had interrupted you that I must give back to you. No, no, I'm referring to, okay, that issue. to her request. I okay. suspect you understand. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No, okay. we'll do that. Thank you. No, I'm fine, Chair. My minute, Chair, we can give it to Honorable Janji. No. No, there's nothing, but th there's something, uh, th there's something suspicious about Honorable Janji and Honorable Horn. They disappear, they come late, but when there is the time to speak, one minute before they, w w then they come in. That's what happened yesterday with you. That's why your time was expropriated, half of your time. Now it's Honorable Janji. Yeah, so you are just in for, in the next 16 minutes, it will be your time to, to close. Now it's Honorable Koza, then it will be you. Um, I just need to ask a question to the commissioner or anyone from that uh, side. Is the person arrested in Tanzania the same person that escaped from MMC, MCC on the 3rd of May? If so, how do you know? And through you, Honorable Chairperson, it is the same person. Um, in the earlier session, SAPS did indicate that fingerprints of uh, this person were taken. They were matched with the records that are there in the database of SAPS and our own database as DCS. Um, and that meshed, and it is on the basis on which um, even uh, the authorities from uh, Tanzania allowed the process of deportation to um, to, to take place. But also beyond the, the fingerprints, there is also uh, facial recognition of um, our own uh, officials from correctional services who uh, were charged with the responsibility of uh, watching over Tabo Bester before he was uh, transferred to Mangaou. They were part of the delegation that went to Tanz uh, Tanzania to do the identification. But I would, um, um, yeah, I would emphasize the fingerprint uh, 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 confirmation. Okay, uh, thank you. Who is this person? That's why I said a person. I did not speak about Tabo Pesta because from what, from our earlier uh, action with SAPS, they were not sure if they've got Tabo Pesta. They're saying there's, there's two other table pesters with IDs there, but this particular one does not have a, a South African ID, which makes it very difficult for him to be identified. My next question would be, how do you know that this person is indeed table pester? It could be Vusi Koza, it could be Tabo Mkwen, or anyone else for that matter. Have you checked once, or, or is this a given name that you were given when you were arrested, arrived at your facility, gave you a name, Tabo Pesta. Did you do a different confirmation, either by death of, I mean, uh, um, uh, certificate from church, birth certificate, some letter from school, or even an ID document? What other form of confirmation have you done to say this person is indeed Tabo Pesta, or you just took the name that they gave, that he gave when he arrived at your facility? Um, through you, Honorable Chairperson, the, the, 
verification and the information I'm referring to is supported by the warrant that we received um, when we admitted Tabo Pester in the, in the earlier years of his uh, incarceration. But I've, I must also emphasize that the fingerprints were taken. They were matched with the fingerprints that were existing in the country, in the database of SAPS and our own database. Um, based on that, it was confirmed that the, the person who was in Tanzania at that time is the person who was once in the correctional system of South Africa. Can I interrupt, Chairperson, through you? I am saying the, the person, that's why we say the person, leave that Tanzania story, we've passed that. My question is, have you verified that this person is Tabo Pester before now and, and now? Or you took a name that came with the warrant uh, and you went to the system and it said Tabo Pester. I'm saying, have you independently verified? If I were to be arrested, I'll, I'll have my fingerprints taken or uh, my, my, my ID would be demanded to say, uh, show us your ID or it's you, so we've got you, and this is your name. I'm asking a simple question. How do, did you do a different verification to say this person is a Tabo Pester or it's an imposter, a Vusi Kosa, using the name of Tabo Pester? Simple question like that, uh, Commissar. I mean... Uh, Co co com commissioner should be very simple, right? <laughs> no, no. Uh, uh, through you, uh, Honorable Chairperson, this this is not, in my view, is not a simple question, and I can explain why. I have indicated in my in my answer that uh, um, okay, the first confirmation is that um, there's no ID identification of Tabo Pester, and he's not uh, the first inmate or offender who is in that category. When they arrive, we take fingerprints, we compare with what we have in the warrant, we take uh, pictures, the mark shots, we file, and we allocate them a correctional services number. And we then track them through the system like that. Of course, the same fingerprints will match the fingerprints that will be there in the SAPS database and throughout the criminal justice system. So that is the basis on which we were able to ascertain that the person who is, was outside the system is Tabo Pester, as per the information that we have. Now, with regards to further verification, that is what the South African Police Service is busy um, investigating, um, and with regards to other particulars of, of, of identity, that is what the Department of Home Affairs will also be able to address. But in as far as the correctional system is concerned, the person who is now back in the correctional system is Tabo Pester in terms of the information that is, we have. Is and man known as Tabo Pester. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, thank you, Chair. Yeah, no, I just wanted to say uh, in terms of what the commissioner says, in terms of our systems, that is our identification. But tomorrow in the morning, uh, I know the committee might not have that privilege or the time, but the Minister of Home Affairs will have a press briefing to explain exactly who is this person in terms of the national identification system of the country. Thank you very much, Minister. Th thank you, Chair. I, I think what the Minister has just said helps because the Commissioner was not helping at all. But uh, we shall wait for that uh, press briefing. Uh, we heard of the um, 112 intervention, current litigation, 110 million. For, uh, is that for a 2013 uh, incidents and the report that came up? It is for the 2013 intervention. All right. Uh, some of the information that I gleaned from that is that there was a gross violation of the rights of inmates. People were brutalized, tortured, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What were, 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 were their consequences 
for the officials in that prison after that report. I'm sure that report came up with recommendations. Were there consequences for either G4S or the officials that were involved? There were consequences in line with the concession agreement and we can provide that information as the department. Uh, through you, Chair, were certain people and individuals held accountable? When I say held accountable, Officer A and B and X and Y, Z be reported to the police so that the police can investigate for torture. Uh, did G4S do something about their own officials who were involved in such brutal and inhuman uh, violation of inmates' rights or justify? Uh, through you, Honorable Chairperson, I have indicated that we can provide the details. At the moment, I do not have them with me, but I know that the outcome of that process uh, came up with recommendations and they were implemented based on the outcome. So you will provide that in writing? Yes, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. That suffices. In Tabo Pesta's cell, no, my former cell, cell 35, an unauthorized laptop was found. No, an authorized, we're told it was an authorized laptop was found that was given to him for his use and a contraband cell phone that was illegally in there. G4S went on to say that, uh, uh, yes, uh, they would uh, at some point allow laptops for those who are studying, even if that was disputed to say Tabo Pesta finished studies long time ago. Here's my question. This laptop that Pesta was using, was it issued by the Department of Correctional Services or was it it is his own personal laptop, and how did that laptop get into the facility? I remember yesterday, uh, it was said that it was his personal uh, laptop. Okay, 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 Chair, I was not sure because I was told at some point that inmates are provided with laptops by the department. So I just wanted to check that at what level, but I understand there was a court case uh, ruling there. And then what shocked me, uh, maybe the officials there can assist me, was to say, what do, you, what do you do to make sure that that laptop cannot be used for illegal activities? G4S says, no, we just check if it does not have an external modem. I mean, those are things of 2004 when Tabo Pesta went to jail or before he was arrested. My understanding, well, the, 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 the officials, they will comment. My understanding is that if you have a, a, a laptop that is equipped with uh, Wi-Fi capacity, all Tabo Pesta needed was a cell phone, which was found in there, with, with data. He creates a, a personal hotspots, and he does his trading and his criminal activities from there. Any comment? I agree with the observation, uh, Honorable Chairperson, and that's why uh, we were able to, to deal with the matter in our investigation report, and that's why the, the investigation report is recommending that um, we issue penalties, and uh, that's why at the moment we have taken uh, a temporary management, or we appointed a temporary manager uh, so that we can be able to uh, enhance the security in the in uh, MMC. Uh, can can uh, we then President. agree that uh, okay. okay, Minister wants to come in. Honourable Minister. Yeah, no, thank you, uh, Chairperson. <coughs> Just to add to the response of the National Commissioner is that uh, you will remember that the inspecting judge said that there is a matter in the Supreme Court of Appeal because what provide for the inmates to have this kind of facility was that there is a policy of the department that allows them in the act that says they must study and so forth. But that policy does not say they must have laptops in their cells. It does not allow that. But there is a, co a, a high court judgment that then said they must have access to the laptop 
in their cells if they are studying. So that is what we are now appealing because we don't agree and we agree with the uh, honorable cause that if someone has a, self, a, a laptop in his or her cell and have a, with the development of technology and have a cell phone with a, the high level of smuggling, anything is possible. So that's why there's that appeal in the Supreme Court of Appeal on that judgment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, Cosa. Minister, for agreeing with me that uh, Basta was allowed to carry on his criminal activities right under the nose of, 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 of uh, G4S. It was, uh, he was either deliberately enabled or they were sleeping on the job. That, 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 that is, is obvious. The next question I would want to ask, um, Best, uh, when he committed these heinous crimes against women, he was par on parole for fraud. He's a fraudster, this one. When he comes in here, the first thing that you should say, uh, close the, all the possibilities of fraudulent activities. He gets a cell phone in his cell. He gives a name that cannot be verified. He carries on a trading. I would, expect, I would have expected that an extra care, particularly in the issues of technology, would have been taken to, to, to ensure that uh, Baxter, I mean, Baxter does not carry on with his activities. However, my question is this. I was just commenting. My question is, when he was paroled, can you confirm that his parole was genuine or it was bought? Because for one to be able to pull such a, a, a huge scam right under uh, everybody's nose is either he's extremely connected or he is moneyed. So can we go back to his parole for the initial fraud? Surely his fraud had to do with money. So this boy has always been moneyed from, 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 from the look of things. Can you confirm that his parole was genuine or you're not sure whether it was bought or genuine? Any comment? I can confirm, Honorable Chairperson, through you that his parole was genuine. Based on? Based on parole processes that are independent of influence from the department, based on the a um, sentence plan that would have been uh, implemented um, and of course um, as I've indicated um, based on the, the system itself, the parole system. Um, can we rule out influence of money? You are saying it's independent without influence but can we rule out influence of money in the parole system? Can you stand here firm and say, I am ruling out the possibility of the influence of money in the parole system. Commission. Through you, Honorable Chairperson, if there are instances uh, like those, they are reported and we deal with them. But I would not uh, sit here and, and, and speculate whether there's influence of money or not. What I'm definitely saying is that uh, our parole processes are above board. If there is a, a an allegation of corruption or any type of influence that is driven by financial gain, uh, that can be brought before us. We'll look into that and we'll attend to it. Uh, two minutes left. Uh, Chair, I want to move to quickly to the, trace and, uh, the track and trace team. Uh, who, who, who made up the uh, uh, track and trace team? Were there private security companies involved? Um, through you, Honorable Chairperson, there were no private security companies involved. The track and tracing team was made up of officials of government. The, 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 from the correctional services. Okay, no, that's fine. Um, we'll, we'll check on that. The partners in the consortium each have got 20%. Uh, you said that there are attachments to this report. Uh, is there an attachment to this report that you said will be made available? That state uh, that breaks down each and every party to the consortium in terms of who are the registered directors, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, giving uh, specific details. Is that uh, in your report or not there? 
Uh, that breakdown is not in the report. It's the breakdown that we will provide to the committee through you, Honorable Chairperson. Okay, no, thank you it's, uh, very much. I would love to do that. In closing, uh, uh, this I'm directing to, to the minister. M uh, Mr. Minister, our prisons have a population of uh, 1, uh, 157,135 an overcrowding of 44.42%. It, 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 it means they contain more than double the amount, almost more than double the amount that they're supposed to contain. Is that in line with the best international practices? Maybe I can throw in this one so that you can get a chance to respond because the chair will cut me. Is that in line with the uh, 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 international standards uh, and best, best practices? Maybe let me stop there for now. Thank you, so that you can be able to respond. Thank you, chair. Yeah, no, thank you, uh, Chairperson. As you are aware, the prisons are governed by the national, the, by the Nelson Mandela rules uh, of um, treatment of inmates and so forth. It is not in line, but there is no country in the world that does not have overcrowding. It's just a degree of um, overcrowding. Maybe there could be one or two, but it's a general norm across the globe. Overcrowding is a challenge for all states. And um, with us, it has been proven over time that we may not be able to develop infrastructure at the same pace as the courts are convicting people. Hence, this private-public partnership arrangement was conceptualized at the time to help with the situation of over overcrowding and to build bed space capacity within a very short period of time. And we can say that was achieved because almost 5,000 bed and space within a short period of time was done. Um, we have the benefit of the infrastructure. The issue is whether uh, in terms of the operating contracts, the costs which were struggling to, to sustain. And it is for that reason that we do not want to continue with this model. And we announced earlier because we felt that uh, it's not sustainable on our side. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairperson. Thank you, Minister. On a light note, are you saying that there is overcrowding at Vet Vatican City? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't want to be accused of blasphemy, uh, Chairperson. <laughs> <laughs> One question that arises of, out of what uh, Honorable Koza has said, with all the lapses that happened, especially with the issues of computer and internet, don't you think that those are some of the things that might also contribute or might have contributed in us getting greylisted? If you have security uh, facilities that are so vulnerable, uh, that can also be vulnerable to money laundering and even terrorist planning. Don't you think that that is a potential threat to national security and even how international world sees us? Yeah, uh, Chairperson, uh, you, you will remember that uh, on the issues of grey listing, they did point to the issues that we must attend to, uh, money wiring, fraud, laundering, that as and when it happens, it must be followed up, there must be arrest, it must be nipped as quickly as possible. So, and it is within the context of safety and security that uh, you would have seen from the presentation that we are in engagement with the CSIR to help us to deal with this thing of the cell phones in the, in the facilities. While we have the technology to detect, for example, um, like uh, in, uh, in Mangao, in Hoshimampur, and others of our facilities. But the human element always comes in, where there is this contraband smuggling and so forth. So that's why we're looking at CSIR to help us to develop a system that can enable us to block um, and so forth. And also, while we comply with the laws, uh, ICASA regulations and so forth, because uh, f some of the issues that ar arose is that if you block, you might block the entire place and co communities, because if you remember the correctional facilities, 
There are also families that reside there and so forth. So it might block everyone from communicating. So it affects also the ICASA regulations. So we'll need also to apply with ICASA. But what I can assure the committee is that there is work that we are doing with the CSIR to find a technology solution to this challenge of uh, uh, cell phones or communications with the outside world by the inmates. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Janche. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, that seems uh, dear. It's late in the evening, Chair, and I have a, I'm in a position that I don't like because I have, I have two, two risks I'm starting with that I would have uh, missed um, the question posed and the interaction to, um, to allow my role of pick it up uh, at the end. And, and the second risk is that I might be repeating things. And, and for that, Chair, to apologize, I think I did indicate to you, uh, I had to attend a, an urgent matter that uh, I needed to attend. Um, and, and I would like, I'll, I'll, I'll therefore, as a way of uh, not keeping everybody, perhaps to, to limit uh, the issues, Maybe National Commissioner, if we can walk back before you took over as a, as a National Commissioner uh, in this space, whether it's a BCC or MCC, my understanding is that there was a, there would have been an investigation that was done which involves your human rights uh, people, uh, Commissioner Chris Nissan, and the department, and out of that, there would have been a report that would have been compiled. Um, as part of the handover and what you inherited, are you aware of that report? I am aware of the report, and uh, I must also indicate through you, Honorable Chairperson, that uh, uh, there was no handover. Uh, <laughs> it is the, the, the reports that you would be aware of as you continue to do your work and you try and, and see how you then accommodate the recommendations and what has been done uh, from, the, from what comes out of those reports and you include that in improving the environment as you move on. No, thank you. Fair, I, I accept that, you know, and it's not only in that space. Um, we, in, the, in this room, we're talking about uh, tensions of handover, so it seems to be inherent uh, in, in, in this. Um, but I do know, just to, to go back to, to the handover, uh, even a few days ago, I was reading, I have it at home, I was reading this handover report by the previous national commissioner. It's in a document. So I don't know who, who, who it was given to. Uh, but I was browsing this handover report. But I'm not going to go there, uh, since you indicated that there was no proper handover. But the issue I, I, I'm going back to, to start with, is that report that you are aware would have had recommendations of things that needed to be done. Uh, and, and having taken over, are you able to talk to us about uh, the implementation of those recommendations? Because it's a report that would have spoken, again, I'm staying on my issue chair, the report would have spoken on the systematic deficiencies, uh, including issues of personnel, in the space that we're talking about. Um, whatever it's, imperfections and limitations, uh, but it, it, it had recommendations that needed to be attended to. Um, some would have included um, uh, in 
relation to this contract and this concession, the who the director was part of this supervisory committee and so on, and, and a lot of others. So my question to start is, have those recommendations been implemented? Um, through you, Honorable Chairperson, um, I did indicate in my uh, first answer that uh, I am aware of the reports, including the handover report of the former National Commission. The process is what I alluded to when I was talking about the handover process. Um, and, um, and I indicated also in my previous answer that in uh, uh, assessing whether those recommendations were implemented, one looked at the improvements that were put into the system. Um, and earlier on in the discussion, I can just give an example. One of those was to make it a point that the supervisor committee works. And uh, the, the challenge there was that a member of the supervisor committee who's an external member resigned and uh, when the former national commissioner left, he had started a process of appointment of the external uh, uh, member of the supervisory committee. We went through the process. We couldn't get the correct candidate. We had to re-advertise again. So uh, there are those specifics where one would say that we were able to, to implement the recommendations. Earlier on, I spoke to the fact that through the, that um, uh, and over report, there was a recommendation that in as much as you have got a contractual control and, mm. uh, and management process that is um, in the hands of the director contract management, we need to make it a point that at an operational level, there is a way for the reports on operations to come through to the management of correctional services. Hence, we then opened a line through the region that when they give us statistics and, and reports on, on, on a, a operational matters, they must also include Mangaung. Even on our performance with regards to the annual report, we include Mangaung as part of the region, Free State, Northern Cape. And I did indicate also that on a weekly basis when we review the incidents, Mangaung is also included, MCC is also included. So it is out of those recommendations from uh, the handover report by the former National Commissioner, but also an, a specific investigation report that was uh, uh, um, produced through the work that uh, was done at Mangaung. There was a time that the department spent uh, more than a month at Mangaung through different interventions led by, by, by the former National uh, Commissioner. Um, and that has, that even led to the appointment of a chief deputy commissioner responsible for incarceration, incarceration and corrections as the overall overseer of the, the two uh, triple uh, P contracts. And that is where also the initial idea of looking at a takeover uh, came through. Thank you for that response, uh, NC. Maybe just before we leave there, can you then, in your own way, summarize and say, these were the recommendations, I'm, I'm looking for a scorecard here, that these were recommendations that uh, you, you inherited and compared to what we have today and what we're dealing with in relation to this particular issue. Are you in a position to say, there's one or two areas where we would have done better in relation to those recommendations. Or are, are you uh, of the view that uh, you have gone beyond that and you have actually uh, become even better innovative? So that we leave that point. I, I, I want to be satisfied uh, in, 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 in that. Um. Through you, Honorable Chairperson, uh, one of the areas uh, of weakness, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an area that uh, we have to attend to, is the annual reviews. Because as the supervisory committee meets to, to, to deal with the, um, the penalties um, that would have been imposed, every year um, 
there has to be an annual review of the contract. And that is what has, has, has not been done. And that is what we, we need to do. Chair, as I leave that point, just as a small commentary. Uh, thank you, uh, National Commissioner. This point is important because even across departments, uh, every year you've got uh, action list and recommendations of the Auditor General. And, 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 and there gets to be no attention to these issues and we go back to the next process and deal with the same problems. Uh, so it, it is important that uh, when you deal with this issue, the w looking back and walking back is important so that we are, we are able to close those gaps. But uh, I'm satisfied with the response. The, the next point perhaps to, to invite the minister here. Um, what has been demonstrated in the last two days and, and I just want your comment, uh, Minister. What has been demonstrated in the last two days is a, is a silo approach between the different role players in this security setup. Um, it's, not, it's not even a silo. It's littered with tensions and everything else um, at the expense of work uh, being done. Um, demonstrated in, in, in feet dragging, blame game. We have listened to the reports here that those themes run through. And, 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 and so the issue for me to, to get to the minister perhaps commenting on this, um, because in this space, all of these role players needed to be coordinated uh, by a particular uh, center. Uh, are, are you happy that uh, we are going to be closing these two days, having received these reports, and uh, we are seeing uh, these gaps of uh, almost lack of cooperation on, 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 on this administration of justice in, in, in these corrections and, and some of the essential issues that, that we have seen? Yeah, it, it is for that reason, uh, uh, Honorable uh, Janji, that you will have heard me saying, for example, tomorrow Home Affairs will be giving a briefing on the issue of the national identification. It's, it's because when we realize that the, there is no proper coordination, um, we then coordinated that. And uh, since that coordination started uh, uh, in um, late March, there has been a lot of um, uh, improvement uh, between the various uh, security cluster departments. And I think the experience we are gaining from this, we will obviously have to enhance it in the cluster coordination uh, overall. Thank, thanks, Minister. Maybe to go back to the NC, there are a lot of loopholes in the system that has been demonstrated here by various reports. Um, in particular, because the core mandate of this department is rehabilitation. That's the core, because that's why it's, it's correctional centers and not prisons. Um, but the biggest budget item of this is incarceration. Uh, if you have a budget of 25 billion, about 15 billion, it was 15.1 billion this year. That just goes on to one program, incarceration, uh, less than what it was in the previous year. And yet what we have been dealing with here in the last two days it's about problems in that program, which, was, which makes me to argue that the problem is not money. The biggest source of money is thrown into this program, but we remain with problems. How to fix that? Um, um, through you, um, Honorable Chairperson. I agree that we are investing um, the 
a quite a sizable or biggest chunk of the budget of the department on incarceration um, because we have to create conditions that are you know humane and safe for, for offenders um, but we are doing that at the backdrop of uh, uh, the issue that was discussed before the issue of overcrowding and its impact uh, the issue of the the state of our correctional facilities, almost uh, all of them cannot even carry the numbers that they are carrying uh, because they are outrightly you know, dilapidated. We are, we are talking at the backdrop of uh, a ratio of uh, uh, correctional uh, security officials that is way lower than it's supposed to be against the ratio of uh, the offenders that we're dealing with. We're talking about applying that budget on a profile of offenders that has changed over years. Actually, the number of uh, offenders that are, are saving life has, dra has dramatically increased. Now, um, and hence we are not getting the value for money that we're supposed to be getting. The system itself, I would say, suffocates the, um, the interventions that we are implementing in the incarceration space. Now, um, if we were to move more of the funds into rehabilitation would uh, actually be weakening the impact of rehabilitation and mm -hmm. I, can, I can give an example to that if we are to take offenders to the 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 farm to go and uh, you know uh, you know practice their skills on agriculture um, you need to have security officers there and agricultural technicians mm -hmm. now we just had an escape uh, last week in Branford, where two offenders escaped uh, when they were at the farm. They were looked after by two officials, and those offenders were around 37. And, and that's, those are the types of ratios that I'm talking about, and that's why every time we make this submission to National Treasury that the more you have the success of the criminal justice system, giving us more offenders to look after, with this mandate that we need to incarcerate them under humane and safe conditions and at the same time rehabilitate them. Please be aware of the fact that when we increase the numbers on the side of the police, when we increase the numbers on the side of prosecutors, you also need to look at the, 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 the budgetary needs of the Department of Correctional Services, and that's a reality. Now, you have a situation where the, the whole value chain succeeds up to a point where uh, we have these offenders in our facilities, but I'm talking about those that are inside the facilities. We have a, a, another big problem, is, which is, of, which is uh, the offenders that are now in the parole system that would need to be monitored on a regular basis. And when you look at the numbers that are monitoring these uh, this, uh, this offenders, and again we go back to the profile, uh, and these this, this matters are not reported uh, too widely in, in any case in the media. We have our, our officials getting shot at by, by parolees because those uh, offenders that would have been paroled, uh, having served their sentences, end up you know, uh, with a community that presents them with challenges and they ended up going up back to the, to the crime rings and all. So it's a, it's a, it's a really involved and deep-seated problem that we will not be able to, to, to deal with as the correctional system alone. I like what I'm hearing, but uh, I'm going to stop it. I like what I'm hearing, and, 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 and hopefully you are going to chair, we are going to interact, because as I, as I, as I end, um, the chairperson is, is, a, is a champion, and we are in the, in the same space of, an, of this issue of saying to treasure and everybody else, they must stop these budget cuts in the security cluster. Because before you grow it, you've got to stop first the budget cuts. So you, you spoke to, you're speaking to the converted. Uh, but I've not heard that, what you're saying today, in terms of how we deal with that. But the question that comes when you put that on the table, and I'll demonstrate with what comes out of your report, is an argument that says... You have one minute? Yes. You can't deal and manage even what you have. Here you have presented to us 18 breaches of a contract, one eight. 18 breaches, you've listed all of them. Um, besides you seeking legal opinion, 
I have not heard you being, you don't seem shocked um, by the 18 breaches. I mean, in any standard, any way, in a contractual relationship, that we have these 18 breaches, it's supposed to mean that there's, there's a non-existence of this relationship. What is your take about this? You've listed them to us, unless you wanted us to just know. What does this mean in relation to, as we live here today, these 18 breaches still exist tonight in, at MCC in the manner that you have listed them? What are you saying to this committee? And, and that's where I'm landing, Chair. Thank you, National Commissioner. Yeah, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Um, the current state of affairs at MMC, or yeah, Mangaung Correctional Center, is that the director who was responsible for managing that center has been removed and we've installed a temporary manager. Now we installed a temporary manager after less than 10 days of receiving this report of these bridges. Um, we received the report on the 22nd and we installed the temporary manager on the 30th of March. And we, we presented to the uh, portfolio committee a, a plan that we are implementing on how we are addressing those security bridges, including look, uh, re looking at the issue of the fact that some of the cameras do not cover uh, uh, the extent at which they are supposed to cover, including ensuring that we improve the technology there so that you don't have uh, any person uh, having the ability to switch on, switch off, or change the direction of cameras. Those are the issues that we, are, we will address. Um, and uh, I would say that we acted with the, the required speed. And uh, um, G4S uh, is saying that uh, we are not supposed to be there. They have taken us on a, on a, legal, uh, uh, on a legal route, and we've responded to that because we are convinced that what we are doing is correct. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chairperson. No, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. Um, I would not say that we have come to the conclusion of our meeting. Uh, we are just going to adjourn or take a pause, as Honorable Janji always say. Um, one, we have been we have received some documents um, from G4S that we need to go through. Uh, Mr. Ramano here was very fascinated by this document. Uh, he has been taking quite a lot of things um, that he thinks that they need to be looked at so we would need time to look at this document. And in addition to that, I think there were other additional, in fact, there's other additional information that members requested today. We will need to get that information also. Um, then as a committee, we will sit, and after we have gone through the relevant information, um, to say what is our next course of action. Do we invite um, G4S or anybody who is here for further information uh, in the form of a meeting? Are we going to be satisfied with the information that we would have read uh, in the documentation that we would have received? Uh, there was also a request that I think that was made by Honorable Breitenbach, uh, and it, I think there was no objection to that request, uh, that uh, we need to hear from the technicians from Intergron, uh, not the people who were here. Um, we will still have to discuss how do we process that which means that uh, we will have to find time uh, in our program, parliamentary program, um, outside of constituency period. Um, 
so and then outside of the budget process because we have a seriously congested budget uh, process um, things as they are now we will be debating the office of the chief justice what is the date on the 9th which means we should have already had budget hearings of the office of the chief justice we need to meet with the chief justice on the 5th uh, we've got 10 other entities to meet um, we've got pressing legislation including jigs one that we need to take a position as to um, whether we would allow all the cabinet processes or we would uh, have to take a part a different uh, a route so we we'll take all of those things into consideration and read the information before us um, after that we can have proper deliberations because uh, the report out of this process would need to go to the house for uh, for uh, a report and debate so we would need to have um, clear recommendations to the house so we can't go to the house with half-baked information so we, ne we will need to be uh, to be sure that the information we have to the best of our knowledge uh, is the information that we are satisfied that uh, we can advise the house uh, properly but I would like to take this opportunity to thank everybody, to thank the ministers, deputy ministers, the judge, all the senior officials that are here from all the departments, uh, members for <laughs> good behavior. Uh, generally yes there were those exceptions uh, there were those exceptions would would improve on those exceptions uh, but thank you very much this is an, a process that was necessary it's a process in fact what happened goes to the heart of the challenges that faces our country as Parliament we had to pass three GPV bills within a short space of time because women of our country are being killed. They are being, uh, I mean, there's, all, there's a lot of violence emotionally and otherwise, uh, but more importantly, there is physical violence on, on, on women of our country. So the country is under threat. So when this thing happened, all of us felt threatened. Not only women of our country, but they are part of us. When they get raped, it's part of who we are. These are our mothers, these are our sisters, these are our wives, these are our girlfriends. So this, they are part of who we are. So for spending all this time trying to 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 go to the root of the problem was not a time wasted but also i would like to thank you for the spirit with which you have uh, you have uh, participated in this meeting uh, sometimes it was a little bit hot um, but there was also a lot of humor uh, the minister was very humorous uh, with <laughs> I won't repeat it. <laughs> Others, uh, there's another one that is trending on the social media. Uh, what is it? Not the, not the other one. Yeah, the other ones that I'm a South African by a criminal record. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
So it's a, a 